Ready? Hold on. Hold, please. Let me live stream. Go live. All right. And we are live. Excellent. Take it away, Steve. Okay, wonderful. Here we are. Uh, welcome everyone. We're just getting set up, so we'll let everyone trickle in and make sure that uh, we've reached quorum, and then we'll uh, we'll get rolling in a, in a minute or so. We're live on YouTube for those of you that are looking in that uh, domain, and otherwise, there's still lots of room in the Zoom. So it looks like we'll have most people in the in the Zoom session. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, let's get rolling then. So welcome to our inaugural first ever uh, Robotics Institute Autonomous Vehicle Workshop. I'm Stephen Wasslander. I'll be uh, the MC for most of the sessions, but we'll have some, uh, some handoffs here and there. Uh, so I'm an associate professor at the University of uh, Toronto's Institute for Aerospace Studies, um, and of course a proud member of the University of Toronto Robotics Institute, which is hosting this workshop. Um, for those of you that don't know, RI was uh, founded in 2019, and we have this mission of bringing all robotics research together under one umbrella uh, at the University of Toronto, and we've got tons of great research going on, tons of facilities that are shared, uh, communication and outreach activities and huge numbers of collaborations that are uh, multiplying um, uh, every year. So it's been a really exciting uh, uh, initiative here within the university. And so from all of us at RI, a hearty welcome to this event. Um, so this event is one of three. So it's part of a series of robotics workshops. So we just had our first, the Hero Healthcare Robotics Workshop back in February, which was a lot of fun. Um, so some of you may have attended that as well. Um, and watch out for the next one. The next one is our Retail and Manufacturing Robotics Workshop, and that one's coming up on August 26th and 27th. Um, and all of these workshops are essentially uh, of the same format, right? For now, we're all virtual, but we're essentially we're trying to bring, bring together all the researchers uh, and students that are uh, actively pursuing these areas of robotics at the University of Toronto and uh, connect them and interact with our partners in industry, as well as uh, the general public and other interested colleagues from outside the Robotics Institute. Um, so this workshop has a couple of really exciting uh, uh, keynotes. So I wanted to highlight those first. We have today Raquel Urtison, uh, who just announced she's launching a new startup called Wabi uh, with a research office right here in Toronto. So students start applying. Um, and so she'll hopefully be sharing some of her grand vision for the self-driving car revolution. Uh, later today. Um, and then tomorrow we have Drago Angueloff, the uh, head of AV research at Waymo. Uh, and so he'll be our keynote tomorrow and hopefully he'll show us a lot of the great things going on at Waymo as well. Um, in addition, uh, we have some really wonderful partners that have been helping us to organize and support this great uh, event. Um, and so I'd like to call them out now. We've got Ride Safely from Waterloo. We have Bosch uh, worldwide. So Germany, uh, uh, San Francisco and uh, their wholly owned Canadian subsidiary eScript, who you'll hear from later today. Uh, and we have a Planix and their parent company, uh, Trimble Navigation, uh, Planix here in Markham, uh, longtime collaborators with the university. Um, so the two events uh, being uh, uh, developed and, and organized by our partners will have the Ride Safely student pitch competition tomorrow. Um, so this should be a really fun event, lots of prizes, glory for the student teams. Uh, they'll be doing five minute pitches on the future directions for research in safe AI for autonomous driving. And then tonight, and I encourage you all to come, this is the uh, Bosch and eScript uh, social event. Um, so we'll be having a spatial chat where uh, there'll be lots of opportunities for interaction and connecting with all of the different participants at this workshop. Um, and uh, uh, seeing as how uh, one of the primary uh, opportunities or uh, sorry, one of the primary purposes for this workshop is to have you all interacting. I'm really hoping that as many of po as possible will take the opportunity to attend tonight. Um, so that's from seven to nine and the link should be available within Eventbrite information. 
Um, and so uh, on top of, uh, you know, enjoying the, the talks and, and asking lots of questions, um, you basically have uh, two tasks, participate where you can, uh, reach out to people uh, after their talks, um, and then come to the social gathering and make sure you introduce yourself to somebody you haven't seen before. Um, so with that, I think uh, that's all I wanted to say to get things rolling. Um, and so I'll now pass it over to our first event, which is uh, going to be hosted by my colleague, John Kelly. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Great, super excited to be here. This looks fantastic. So I'm lucky I get to host the uh, panel discussion and introduce the first three professors who are speakers this, uh, this afternoon for uh, three uh, exciting short talks. And I will begin with uh, the introduction to Professor Angela Scholig who is an associate professor at uh, the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. Uh, her office is uh, next to mine, which is fantastic. Um, she heads the Dynamic Systems Lab at Utahis, and she's also an academic advisor to the uh, wildly successful uh, Toronto self-driving car team, which you'll find out more about later today if you don't already know all about them. Um, Angela received her PhD from ETH Zurich under Professor Raf D'Andrea, and also holds an MAS, or pardon me, MSc in Engineering uh, Science and Mechanics from Georgia Tech, where she was with uh, Professor Magnus Eggerstad and a master's degree in Engineering Cybernetics from the University of Stuttgart, Germany with Professor Frank uh, Algor. Uh, all right, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Angela to tell us about motion planning and control with data whenever you're ready. Okay, great, thank you, Jonathan and, and um, Steve Aslander for organizing this amazing event. So good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to, to be the one kicking off this uh, first ever autonomous vehicle workshop organized by the Robotics Institute. I'm an associate professor at the Institute for Aerospace Studies and part of the Robotics Institute and also a faculty member of the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Today, I'm going to talk about motion planning and control with data, but I want to start with a short video just to get you give you an impression what research in my lab looks like. So if you come to our lab, you see real robots moving. Our focus is on optimizing the full closed loop performance of a robot. Um, we work on the full perception action loop and designing controllers for, for example, interacting um, robots, as you see here, teams of robots. Uh, and we also take those robots out of our lab into the field. And so here you see them operating in a um, mock-up nuclear power plant. We fly outdoors with vision in the loop and have flown at, at speed up to 55 kilometers per hour and winds up to 28 kilometers per hour. And so here you see the vehicles in a mine and we have worked with off-road driving as well as on-road driving. And this is part of our student-led competition team that is competing in the auto drive challenge. So since I'm the first one, I want to start with, you know, why, why are we as researchers interested in self-driving? Right? Um, and you know, for me, it really has key features that we will envision robots to have in the future. And that ranges from robots at your home, service robots, or robots in hospitals. And what are those? So robots have to deal with increasingly complex and cluttered environments. As you see here, this is at our year two competition at M-City, and it looks pretty complex. Um, we have partially unknown and changing conditions. So here, the team tests in winter conditions in Toronto, but then has to compete in, you know, in the desert in Arizona. And we have interacting agents, which makes it very interesting. And agents can be other humans on the road, pedestrians, other self-driving cars, but it can also be you know, unexpected <laughs> um, encounters. And I think another very interesting feature of self-driving is that we have prior knowledge available. You know, the roads have been designed by us. We have maps, we design the traffic signs. So a lot of information is known. So I think those make real, reflect really key features of any modern robotic system. And so what I'm interested in is 
How can we make decisions under uncertainty and achieve safe and high performance behavior of these robots? And today I'm focusing on one aspect, which is you know, partially unknown and changing conditions and how we can incorporate prior knowledge. But I wanna really give a shout out to amazing students' presentations that are coming up. Keenan Burnett, a PhD student, co-advised by me and Tim Barford is talking about our radar-based navigation. And Zepair is talking about interacting agents and how we can make robots more human-like. And then towards the end of the day, our competition team is giving an overview of their full working self-driving car. And you should all celebrate them today and tonight at the social event because they just um, won the year four competition um, against eight other teams. And they were the winning team of the last four years. So year one to year four of the auto drive competition. So you can learn a lot. Um, of what they, what they needed to make a, a robust, reliable car working in road condition, real world road conditions. So let me focus on kind of how can we make decisions in uncertain conditions. So really the challenge is how do we design control laws, the decision laws that ensure the system safety under uncertainties. And you can really represent this as an optimization problem. We have a mission objective, for example, you know, reaching point A on the map. And that is subject to our current initial condition where we are at the current moment. Um, our knowledge about the system, how the system performs and um, state constraints and input constraints. We only can, you know, have some maximum acceleration and deceleration, for example. Where does uncertainty come in in this problem? It could come in everywhere, right? Um, we may not be able to um, specify our mission in, in an equation. Um, we may not have a perfect knowledge about what the car is doing right now to plan for its future motion. We may not well understand its actual system performance or system dynamics and how to predict the motion into the future. And you know, our state constraints may be uncertain. So state constraints mean the path bounds, but maybe there are construction sites in the way and our path bounds or state constraints um, are partially unknown or uncertain. So any of those could be uncertain. Today, I focus on uncertain dynamics only, um, even so all the other conditions are important. And, um, Relay, rely partially on perception data. So if you talk about system dynamics, you know, it could be different terrain surface um, that affects the system dynamics and we don't have a full understanding, perfect knowledge about how the car behaves. Um, we have large payloads or other vehicle modifications that make it difficult to predict the performance and the be dynamic behavior of the car. And to give you an example here, we have an off-road vehicle and with a simple model, you know, we cannot perfectly predict the motion and we actually hit the pylons. How do we address this problem? We decompose it into the dynamics into an a priori model that we can derive from first principle physics. We don't want to throw away any knowledge that we have about the system. And then we combine it with the component G that we are learning. And so that component G for now, we assume this is unknown, but deterministic. And so how we treat this component is as an uncertainty. So initially we may not have a good knowledge about this uncertain behavior. And so this function could lie anywhere in this blue shaded area. But as we, um, as we collect more data, we make it more certain about the behavior and this uncertainty envelope shrinks. And so we model this with the Gaussian process and the Gaussian process is a distribution over functions. And so initially, you know, any of the colored lines could be a probable behavior of the robot. Um, as we gather data, we understand, we get a better understanding of what the behavior is like. So red are the data points and the uncertainty envelope in light blue shrinks and the functions that are still pos 
can possibly explain the behavior of the robot, um, the set of those functions rings as well. And so Gaussian process have a really nice property um, that allows us to derive theoretic bounds. And so under you know, certain assumptions, of course, um, the theorem that we can informally state is that the true function is contained in the scaled Gaussian process confidence intervals with probability at least one minus delta, where delta is small for all input values. So basically we know the true function lies within that blue uncertainty bound with very high probability. And so these uncertainty bounds are meaningful, again, under given assumptions. And so um, these are flexible models, but uh, and not black box models because we have a kernel to choose, which uh, um, explains how different data or um, how data points and function values are related. And so that even in that learning model, there is a trade-off between prior assumptions that we make and data efficiency. So the more general the kernel is, so the more, the larger the set of initial functions, um, the more data we need to, to shrink the uncertainty set. And there are certain tuning parameters, for example, how quickly does my function change, which is represented by length scales. There are prior, the prior variance, which reflects how large do I expect the function values to be in general, and there's a noise variance, how noisy are my measurements, and those have to be tuned. But overall, a Gaussian process can provide an increasingly tighter high probability bound for an unknown function, and we leverage that. And so we leverage this in a framework that is called stochastic model predictive control. And so that framework aims at encouraging safe behavior by you know, taking into account that probabilistic model of the robot dynamics. And so how that looks is if I have a robot and I have the simple task of following a path, like following a lane, um, then based on my dynamics model that I explained, I, I can predict forward how my robot behaves given a sequence of inputs. And because my model is a probabilistic model, I can predict the mean and the variance. So this blue line and the blue shaded area. I don't perfectly know how the robot behaves in the future. Um, and so I try, my goal is to follow that path and keep that blue envelope within the path bounds. And so this is a constraint optimization problem, similar to what I showed you before. I want to optimize a performance function. For example, I want to optimize speed along the path. I want to drive as quickly as possible. Um, I have a probabilistic model right, that includes my prior model and my Gaussian process. And I have constraints. I want to stay within the lane with high probability. I also um, know that I have that my actuation is limited and I don't want to violate those limitations. So these are what we mean by safety. And then um, we can convert these probability constraints into deterministic constraints um, using the um, uncertainty of the Gaussian process. But this depends on the model of the robot dynamics, which is you know, a stochastic model because we don't have perfect knowledge about um, the robot's behavior. And so we incorporate this together in a framework, right, where we have a vision-based um, localizer, and then we have in real time a Gaussian process update and then a controller update. So whenever we get new data, we learn more about the performance and the uh, and behavior of the robot, and we update our decision-making strategy. And so how that looks like in practice is that initially before learning, we have a large uncertainty. And then to make sure that over a prediction horizon, for example, we predict ahead the behavior of the robot like 10 seconds ahead, we wanna make sure that this uncertainty envelope stays within the path bounds. Then as we gather more data, right? Um, these uncertain envelopes shrinks and we can try faster over the same prediction horizon. So you see, you know, the, the envelope on the right is 
it's much longer and st still stays within the path beyond because our uncertainty is low and we can try faster over the same prediction horizon. So let's look at this in video. So here you see the same um, situation that you saw the robot failing before. And now it tries very slowly the first time because the uncertainty is high, but it doesn't hit the pylons. Once we try it the third time, it can already drive significantly faster. And then we also tested this off-road, which is quite challenging. And you see that um, on the right, it's the third trial, the uncertainty envelope is much smaller and the speed is significantly higher, especially on the straight path, uh, pieces of the path. And so it finishes this segment of the path much faster um, the third time around. There are challenges with this approach, and it was just the first or first approach to incorporate uncertainty in the decision making. But these Gaussian processes are inefficient when having large amounts of data, and they may become overconfident as more data is collected and the hyperparameters are not fit, uh, are kept fixed. And so the next goal for this thread of research was coming up with realistic uncertainty bounds for long-term operation in changing conditions, being able to recognize new operating conditions. For example, if you suddenly have ice or, or, um, or mud, mud instead of dry conditions, and how we can really leverage large amounts of data in real time. And so ultimately this is really going towards, you know, dealing with changing conditions. And there is another student presentation at 3 p.m. today by Chris McKinnon, who recently defended his PhD thesis in my group, who is talking about these extensions. So ultimately, to conclude, um, one thing we learned from this work is that estimating model uncertainties is just as important as estimating the mean to guarantee safety, that we can combine prior knowledge with um, learned models and the prior model knowledge enables us to use simpler learning models, which are more data efficient. And um, something that you will see in Chris's talk is that we can combine fast adaptation and long-term learning to really improve performance over a long horizon. And also point you to a video um, of a talk of mine where I give a lot more details, but I want to leave you with one more thought. Um, that you may you know, um, keep in mind as you hear the talks of all the other amazing faculty members today. So really, you know, I, I think what is really interesting in robotic is the problem of machine learning in the closed loop. We all know and cannot envision anymore a, a self-driving car that doesn't use neural networks for perception. And then there are other ways to include learning models in the estimation and other place and in the decision-making as I showed you in my talk. But really what we end up with is a lot of different interacting learning models that operate in this closed loop fashion. And so there are really fundamental questions um, in this domain. How to, do we guarantee a safe closed loop performance despite these interacting learning systems? What does distribution shift even mean? We train these models in open loop, but then operate them in closed loop and they will definitely see different kind of type of images and um, different data than if they would be operated in open loop. Can we control away certain uncertainties? Maybe we can guarantee safety better for a closed loop system than when we analyze these open loop modules on their own. So I think there's a lot of really interesting um, research um, that we, are all very excited about in, in my group, but also in general at the Robotics Institute. And so I hope you take those questions and this picture of machine learning in the closed loop as an inspiration um, to think more broadly about um, robotics. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Scholig. Uh, wonderful. So I would just ask uh, folks to uh, keep your questions and we'll, uh, we'll have a 
Q&A session at the end of the three talks where you can uh, post questions in the chat. You're invited to do so, and I will try and uh, moderate those and uh, bring them up uh, to the panel, which will consist of the three professors right after the, the next two short talks. So uh, just hold your questions till then, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll um, make sure to have a chance to, to uh, give you an opportunity to ask. So without uh, further ado, we'll introduce our second speaker, which is uh, uh, incoming professor Igor Gilchensky. Um, Igor is currently a uh, visiting uh, research scientist at the Toyota Research Institute, and uh, he's going to be an assistant professor starting at uh, University of Toronto, uh, Mississauga in computer science in August of this year. So we're, we're excited to welcome him to, to join. Um, he came to TRI from MIT, where he was a postdoc, uh, working in the computer science and artificial intelligence lab um, with uh, uh, Sertash uh, Kamaran and Daniel LaRousse. Um, who you probably know. And uh, prior to that, he was working uh, in the Autonomous Systems Lab at ETH Zurich with Roland Siegwart on robotic perception and in particular localization and mapping, which is the topic of his talk today. Uh, he obtained his PhD degree in uh, computer science working on nonlinear estimation uh, at the Intelligent Sensor Actuator Lab uh, at the uh, Karlsruhe Institute, Institute of Technology, I can't speak today, um, supervised by Uwe Hannebeck and Simon Julie, who is the co-supervisor. Okay, so uh, Igor is gonna tell us about dieting, which is something I need to find out about. So please, <laughs> Igor, take it away when you're ready. Yeah, thanks so much. I hope you, you all can hear me well. Um, thanks so much for, for having me in the, in the workshop. I'm very excited to come to Toronto. I have not been in Toronto before. So for me, it's, uh, uh, it's also like a first. A first. Um, I want to speak today about a topic that I have worked on uh, for a while during my time at ETH and at MIT. And the topic is how can we enable um, robots? And today I will focus particularly on autonomous vehicle to localize well, to know where they are and how much of localization do we actually need? So in localization, our main inspiration as robotics researchers is the human. The human uses basically two sensors for the, for the localization task. The main sensor that the human uses is the eye. And the second sensor that the human uses is an inner ear organ um, the, that provides, uh, provides inertial information. And what we as roboticists try to do is to mimic these two sensing modalities and to mimic the unique abilities of the human to know where they are. And yeah, for us, this comes so natural. We learned it so early in our development that this seems almost as a very boring topic, but mimicking these capabilities is very hard. I have used a variety of sensors in my work. One example that I will be talking about is uh, the combination of visual and inertial sensors. So the visual sensors in this, uh, on this sensor board that has been developed at ETH are a stereo camera. And the inertial sensor that all of you uh, have also in your smartphone that measures rotational velocities, accelerations, um, uh, is in this example synchronized. It is basically the counterpart to what our inner ear organ is doing. Let me say, uh, First of all, that this is not the only way we localize on vehicles. Um, I will use it as an example to just discuss with you how such a pipeline typically looks like and what the problems are with current pipelines in certain settings. So one thing when you use these sensors and when you combine, combine sensors is of course sensor fusion. We have to think about things like calibra calibration and so on. And I will leave it out for today and briefly talk about how the actual localization process works. For visual, uh, for visual navigation, this process is somewhat complex. We start off with receiving images in our cameras. And the first step that we do on these images is we detect particularly distinctive points. And usually there are much more than you see on uh, here. Uh, basically every corner is a particularly uh, distinctive point. And what we do with these points is we track them over time, which allows us building a 3D model of the environment. And uh, because we, by using one single camera image, we cannot know whether we move very fast uh, in a small 
small ver sorry in a in a big world or or slow in a small world we need some additional information and this additional information comes either from a second camera or an inertial sensor or the combination of both and this is used to create maps and uh, this creating maps is uh, another complicated process because we not all, we want to have distinctive information so we try to obtain a description of each of these points that we detected in the image store to this description and their 3D location in a map. And then once we have this storage in a map, we try to do the opposite. We basically, try, once we want to localize and we, we are driving in the environment, we try to uh, record an image, again, detect all these interesting points and basically query our map storage uh, where this image might have been recorded. And there is a big variety of ways uh, to do this. But if you, you can imagine it as a big retrieval task, you basically will see the type of problem that we're trying to solve. So we have a lot of these, these, thing, this, uh, these points and we try to retrieve their locations and to recognize, uh, to recognize where, where they were in the, uh, in the 3D model. So we need to do checks for geometric consistency and so on. So one of the typical problems that we have to solve in this type of, uh, of approaches is to actually decide which of these points uh, are useful. The way, the way we, we did this in, uh, uh, in one of our earlier works is to simply train a classifier. And this classic classifier was just a CNN that operated on image patches. And we, obtained, we trained it by, in a self-supervised way uh, back when, when self-supervised learning was not as popular as it is today. But we basically were able to obtain information about which points appear frequent and are stable and are always at the same place, uh, such as structural parts of the environment. This was indoors in this case. So ceilings uh, contain very st stable features. And which points are unstable, such as clutter on desks. Uh, outdoors, this would be points coming from people walking around and so on. And this allowed us to compute something like a feature stability score and decide which are stable features and which are. Another challenge is working once you have, we obtained this type of maps is basically to decide how good are they? So can we, can we actually do something meaningful with these maps once we have them? Or do we need, uh, do we need some sort of uh, improvement in certain areas? So one big chunk of research went into questions such as uh, what is map quality? Can we simulate? Uh, can we simulate the, quali the quality of a map if it is used from a certain viewpoint and so on? So map quality evaluation becomes, becomes a, another big challenge. And uh, we were one of many groups that worked, uh, worked on this challenge. And finally, once we have a map for the retrieval task, uh, we, uh, we want to know which parts of the map are particularly useful. And there are a big variety of different uh, approaches. Um, some people, uh, use uh, approaches where they basically store a different map for different weather conditions. In our case, everything was stored in the same map, but we needed to decide which of the elements of the map are, will actually be useful to localize and which, which of the elements won't be useful to localize. So a lot of work uh, goes into the question how to provide the agent, in this case, the autonomous vehicle with localization uh, information that is particularly useful for it. And all these examples of challenges are only the challenges related to vision. As mentioned earlier, and uh, some of it you will hear um, in the talks throughout this workshop is there are many other sensing modalities that we use in driving. We typically also use LIDAR. Um, I will show some examples with LIDAR. And we typically also use a radar. Radar has been way less, less popular in research. It's also harder to get to the hardware of a car radar, but uh, I, I'm glad, glad it's gaining traction. And we will see today a spin on this radar story. So how can we reduce this entire burden of maintaining maps? One idea that we, that we are following at MIT, together with a brilliant grad student, Teddy Ort, it deserves particular credit because the two works I've been sure I, I'll be focusing on in what follows were both led by him. Um, 
was to one of the idea that uh, on which he led the projects was to use topological maps. Let me quickly motivate this a little bit further. Additionally to just maintaining maps being expensive and very complicated, there is another problem with the way we do mapping and localization these days. If you look at this environment and this picture, this is an environment for which, in which it is very simple to drive uh, for a human. But for autonomous vehicles that are intrinsically assuming centimeter level localization and centimeter level precision, this environment is particularly challenging. One reason for that is that the appearance changes massively between day and night. This also is happening in inner city environments. Another reason is that between seasons, this not only the appearance changes, but there are also a lot of structural changes. The snow is gone, leaves appear. And the third reason is this looks, all the images here look very similar. So in this environment, it's very hard to navigate for a classical map pipeline. So the idea that we had is to be inspired by how humans navigate. And humans don't use centimeter level localization whenever they drive. What humans do instead is they roughly know where they are and they know how to stay on the road. And our idea in this MapLite work was to try and mimic a little bit of, uh, human, of this human ability and simply use something like a topological map, like open street maps um, or Google maps, or as you know, simply from the street atlas uh, to use a map like this for localization. In our driving stack, which looks very much uh, like a typical driving stack, we had to replace a few components. So we had some sort of standard localization module from, in this case, a LiDAR map. And we replaced it by, uh, by a module that does road segmentation for the mapping task, and then integrates the knowledge of the road roughly in the map where we are. It, this is perfectly fine and completely sufficient. We only need to be precise about this once we, uh, once we reach intersections. If we are off by a few meters even between intersections, this is no problem as long as we roughly know where the road is. We don't care whether we are precisely uh, localized otherwise. We just need to stay on the road. So in summary, the map that we use here is a map that comes from OpenStreetMap. It's much less detailed but it is actually better. It has much lower costs to create. It doesn't get uh, out of date as fast as classical maps do because maybe buildings are built or even, uh, or even seasonal changes make trees look uh, completely different. And thus it has a longer lifetime and it has a smaller storage size. So uh, it comes with a lot of advantages. And the price that we pay is that we don't have always that centimeter level precision. So as mentioned earlier, we, we detect in, our uh, in the street, basically in the environment where the road is. Uh, we use a SVM classifier based on a variety of, uh, in this work, handcrafted features. And then we combine these two pieces of information together. So we basically impose the position of our vehicle into that map. And as we have, have approach the intersection, this intersections and um, any other of lane merges, this information becomes more and more precise. And ultimately what we obtain uh, is uh, a, a topological map that we can use or a topometric map we, we actually obtain ultimately. And we need to slightly modify the planner because now we have to replan much more uh, frequent as we approach the intersection. We don't know in advance to a centimeter level, maybe there's an intersection. So we need to do a little bit faster replanning. And here you can see the system in operation. Um, this is Teddy driving in our uh, testing ground. And uh, as, mentioned, uh, as mentioned earlier, all these, all these driving maneuvers are now done without using any sort of pre-recorded 3D map. So we, we just validate our system by using publicly available OpenStreetMap data. A second idea that allows us to, to break uh, even other boundaries with, with regard to driving is to look under the ground. Uh, typically we would say, why would uh, someone want to look under the ground? Uh, everything humans need to know for driving is uh, around them. But for 
autonomous vehicle sensors, there are situations where the information around them is not particularly good. It's actually very hard to localize in this environment. Um, but what is fascinating about humans is that humans are still capable to drive here. Admittedly, we would have to drive slower to avoid obstacles nearby and to avoid sliding, but we could still drive. And I would argue even an object detection system for a, for a car would be able to detect objects that are nearby, but driving would become, at least based on the classical localization paradigm, much more difficult. So our idea is to use the unique structure that most environments have underground by looking underground. And the way we do this is using radar for localization, but instead of looking in our environment, we now use the radar to look underground. We use a so-called ground penetrating radar. Um, here you can see the prototype mounted on our vehicle. Um, it basically has an 11 element radar array and the type of the, the way this data looks from this radar is somewhat like this. So we basically get intensity responses based on the depth. And ultimately using this type of radar allows us to navigate autonomously in uh, most severe weather conditions. Again, here you see Teddy navigating autonomously on a map uh, that has been recorded with a ground penetrating radar. Um, by the way, the map has been recorded under different weather conditions. And here we can safely nav navigate under snowy weather conditions. And because this map just looks underground and the features there are much more stable, we don't care what weather we see uh, we have outside in order to navigate safely. This sensor is very new and we are very excited about, uh, about working on it but it's still very early stage and uh, not many people have it. So we want to democratize the work on this sensor. And if you're interested in joining in on this line of work, uh, we would happy to, to invite you to join us. Therefore, we will be releasing a data set uh, from our sensor prototype at this RSS. So you can join in and try ground penetrating radar yourself. So in summary, the two messages that I wanted to bring today is first that classical maps come with a lot of challenges that are worth, uh, worth addressing, but still not use, uh, still make it challenging to use this type of maps for all environments, which is why second, we propose to use um, different type of maps and different types of sensor modalities in order to localize better. And if you're excited about uh, different types of maps and different sensor modalities. I will be happy to discuss with you more during the Q&A. Thanks so much for the attention. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Igor, that was great. Uh, if anybody's interested in LGPR and uh, other mapping techniques, please uh, direct your questions to Igor. Okay, so um, to close uh, the talk portion of this segment, we will have our final uh, faculty talk, and that is from uh, Professor Florian Chikurti from uh, the Department of Computer Science at University of Toronto, uh, based in Mississauga. Uh, Florian is an assistant professor uh, in the CS department, and he's also an Amazon Research Award winner this past year. Congratulations. And also a uh, winner of the RSS Self-Supervised Learning Workshop, uh, Workshop Best Paper Award. He received his PhD from McGill under Professor Greg Dedeck and is currently an active member of uh, the NSERC Canadian Robotics Network as a distal fellow. So he's going to tell us about uh, autonomous robots in the wild and safety. So whenever you're ready, Florian, please, uh, please go ahead. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And it's great to be uh, part of the Robotics Institute, first of all. Uh, and second, it's great to be in a panel where people are talking about uh, safety because it's one of the, uh, in my opinion and in many other people's opinions, it's one of the main uh, requirements for getting these vehicles to operate, uh, operate autonomously in the field uh, and in real world scenarios. Uh, so I'm going to talk about safety during the learning process and after the learning process uh, and how they, how they differ and what, what, can, what we can do about them. Uh, so first off, um, I want to talk a bit about my research uh, agenda that I'm pursuing in my lab with my uh, students and collaborators. So the first, um, so we pursue three uh, broad directions. Um, the first one is about 
uh, doing scientific data collection with autonomous robots. And the main question is that of visual attention and where should robots look, where should they sense? Uh, the second is about developing uh, fundamental machine learning and uh, machine learning method for uh, in the service of planning and control uh, that are tailored to robotics uh, applications. Uh, and the third direction, which is going, what I'm going to be focusing on today, is how to provide safety guarantees uh, during the exploration process and do, using better simulators. So what are, the, um, what are the things we want out of a great simulator in, in robotics and how can they help us with safety? So the plan for today is to talk about two papers. One of them um, uh, discusses um, safety during reinforcement learning. Uh, and the other one discusses safety after learning by uh, automatically generating uh, and discovering uh, adversarial uh, scenarios in simulation. So let's focus on part one. So people are starting to um, essentially apply reinforcement learning algorithms in robotics at increasing frequency in multiple domains from locomotion to flying, even in domains where arguably it's a uh, it's ill-advised to do so, like uh, driving. Uh, and so far, they've only uh, applied this in uh, for, lay for lane following. Uh, but um, the, the idea remains that if we want to apply reinforcement learning to robotics scenarios, which uh, carry some amount of uh, risk to people and uh, other, uh, other entities in the world, we need to provide some guarantees that the algorithms we use will not visit unsafe states very often during the learning process. Um, and you know, there are two ways to look at this problem. One is the same way that the control theory community is uh, currently looking at it uh, most of the time, which is that unsafe states uh, are fully known. So you have essentially a classifier that uh, is perfect and tells you which configuration is safe and which is unsafe. And the other way, uh, which is a bit harder and a bit more dangerous, uh, is that um, is the way that re the reinforcement learning community is looking at this problem, which is uh, that you have to learn this classifier as you go. You have to learn what safe, what states are safe and what states are unsafe. So we're going to try to take the uh, the second approach, and we're going to uh, try to ensure that our proposed method. Um, leads to you know safety during each learning update, not just when uh, the policy or the optimization has converged. So how do we do this? Uh, so our solution is called constrained safety critics uh, and it uses a simple idea. It sort of decouples the performance of the policy pi theta on a on a task. So we try to maximize, uh, the, the, the value function on a particular task, while at the same, uh, while at the same time trying to um, limit, to put a threshold on the probability of, uh, of an accident during the learning uh, process. So that probability should be upper bounded. Now, the problem is that uh, in general, we are pretty bad at estimating uh, value functions. So, when we try to, estim to estimate the probability of an accident uh, from experience, uh, we, we can definitely be uh, falsely overconfident. So we can, we can, be, uh, we can sort of under, end up underestimating this probability and think that we satisfied while actually not doing it. So the fix that we have here is that we have a, a way to provably overestimate uh, the value function. So provably overestimate the probability of an accident so that when you put a threshold, you're actually putting it on the upper bound and therefore you end up uh, satisfying the, the constraint. So the problem that we end up uh, satisfying uh, or try, trying to solve is this problem with uh, a learned upper bound. Uh, and the learned upper bound comes from this uh, idea from uh, we, which is called conservative uh, Q-learning from uh, Averal Kumar and Sergey Levin. Uh, and uh, we extended that work in collaboration with them to try to uh, make it work on this particular safety scenario. So when we compare this paper uh, with this method in, in this paper with uh, existing state-of-the-art methods in uh, safe reinforcement learning, 
we actually do uh, better in terms of uh, safety. Uh, and we show that we do, and in particular with methods such as constraint policy optimization, which was the state of the art uh, method until, uh, until this paper. And we show in uh, a number of uh, constrained environments that uh, essentially the trade-off, there's no significant trade-off between uh, task performance and safety, at least in these particular uh, environments. So that's one way to, to look at um, uh, to look at safety. So through this sort of constrained MDP uh, model, um, and uh, it's worth asking what are what are other ways to look at uh, safety in addition to this learning under constraints. So another way is to look at uh, adversarial attacks and how to create ad adversarial simulation scenarios so that you can expose the weaknesses of a policy or an entire or an entire driving software pipeline from perception to uh, to control. And it's worth asking why we need simulation in the first place. Um, and I like to uh, cite this, um, this paper from Rand, which uh, essentially is asking the question, uh, how many miles of driving would it take to demonstrate statistical reliability of uh, autonomous vehicles? And they conclude that uh, if we have the same numbers of autonomous vehicles driving on the roads as we do now, um, it might take, you know, uh, tens or sometimes hundreds of years to drive the required number of miles to get statistical reliability. So right, right now we're uh, simply uh, focusing on, uh, you know, the number of uh, human interventions per, uh, uh, per mile. Uh, and we're using that as a metric for uh, assessing uh, the safety of uh, autonomous uh, pipelines. So we need, we need simulation in the mix. Um, and conditioned on that uh, statement, uh, we, we need to ask how do we generate uh, accidents or adversarial scenarios in simulation? And it's worth noting that uh, we need to go beyond what the machine learning community is considering as, a, uh, as an adversarial scenario or example. We need to go beyond uh, you know, adding just uh, imperceptible noise to, to an image uh, in order to confuse the classifier, which means we need to go beyond just attacking the, the perception part of the system. We need to jointly, uh, we need to jointly uh, essentially attack both uh, perception and, uh, and control. So in this type of system, we would like uh, the system to generate, automatically generate a simulation scenario such as this one, where the blue vehicle just entered the opposite lane. Uh, and your car was not trained to deal with a uh, with a system like like that, so it crashes. Uh, so we would like this to be detected automatically. And in this paper, we have done so using uh, Bayesian optimization, which is an inefficient search method. So um, if we ask a human operator for how to avoid this scenario, the human operator might, might give us an example that sort of does this sort of maneuver and takes us on the sidewalk if it's safe. Uh, and we can incorporate this on the training set for this car and sort of patch up that weakness with this extra uh, demonstration. And then the vehicle sort of avoids the accident, even in this uh, dangerous case. So how do we do this automatically? Um, so current approaches for generating uh, simulation scenarios include some mix of procedural scenario generation and real data collected from uh, vehicles. And uh, they try to uh, mix the, uh, the current uh, set of objects that are in the, uh, in, in the scenario. But I'm arguing that procedural scenario generation is, is an inefficient way to search for adversarial, uh, adversarial scenarios because it's, it's not tailored to the, to the driving policy. Um, so even if it is tailored, it's procedural generation is a derivative free way of optimizing for accidents. So it's essentially assuming a black box uh, simulator. So let's re-examine what the, or let's examine what a simulator is, first of all. So it has a physics engine, uh, so it does integration. Uh, it has a rendering model, which is the observation model. And uh, it also has scene properties and map geometry. 
and all of this uh, all of these components together they generate a uh, a set of observations such as rgb images and lidar point clouds these are fed into a self driving controller uh, which interacts with the physics part of the system and other uh, pedestrians and vehicles in the scene and then you have a loss function that says how badly you are driving <clears throat> so we would like to be able to um, we would like to be able to take derivatives of this loss function with respect to the map geometry so meshes of buildings scene properties and pedestrians and other cars so that we can actually automatically discover automatically and efficiently discover accidents so we need to have differentiable uh, simulators so what are some examples of these simulators that attack both uh, control physics and perception um, so at the, until uh, the last uh, until the last few months, these physics engines, these differentiable simulators, focused on differentiable physics simulation uh, or differentiable rendering, but not both. So we considered them jointly in this paper with uh, many collaborators and, and at Nvidia and uh, Mila, and uh, we developed GradSim, which is essentially um, a differentiable physics and rendering engine. Which, which takes as an input masses, friction, so physics parameters of the objects involved or the simulation involved. It has a differentiable physics engine uh, and a differentiable renderer, which generates a video based on uh, all of these inputs. And you can show it a ground truth video uh, and take the loss function while being able to differentiate through and uh, identify the um, the physics properties that generated that video. For example, you can do system identification and figure out the mass of rigid bodies from a target video. Um, you can figure out, uh, you know, the uh, the optimized trajectory for a finite element, uh, so for a mesh, for a deformable mesh, given a single image. Uh, and you can also figure out, uh, you know, the properties of cloth that uh, if, if you control them, they will give you a target image at the end. So you can propagate derivatives from uh, the observation to the properties uh, of the objects that generated them. There's also a Cambrian explosion in terms of uh, neural rendering methods. So this is, these are the variants of uh, NERF. Uh, so neural radiance fields, uh, which given a set of input images, you can render new views of those of that scene with uh, extreme uh, accuracy, at least locally. Uh, so you can locally move objects and move the lighting of the, excuse me, of the scene as well. And you can essentially generate new configurations of the scene. So if we, uh, so in my lab, we're trying to extend this so that it is not local, but you can do these operations globally. And in fact, you can insert new objects in the scene. So this has led us to uh, do things such as getting the Carla simulator, uh, getting the RGB images and the depth from it, and training a network that essentially predicts the same. So here is here are the predictions from the model. Uh, and we can also, if you can see here, you can also insert you know, objects that weren't uh, necessarily in the scene uh, before that. We can train the network to insert new objects in the scene by querying the simulator. So now we can uh, essentially, we have a way to neurally render this, uh, the outputs of the simulator and feed them to an existing driving policy. So we have an end-to-end -end differentiable simulator where we can uh, do gradient optimization to figure out uh, where to insert these out of distribution objects so that we can confuse the policy and uh, uh, attack it. So this is current, uh, this is what we're currently trying to do. So it's ongoing work. So where are we heading towards with this type of project? We want physically realizable adversarial attacks. So we want to find an accident in simulation and show it will happen in, in the real world. We want to be able to simulate based on real data from self-driving data sets, which will involve in-painting and novel view synthesis. 
So I think Raquel will uh, uh, describe uh, some of these, uh, the potential for some of these systems. And we also need to need and want to handle non-differentiable parts of the self-driving pipeline uh, because not we don't assume we don't want to assume that essentially there is a neural network end-to-end uh, -end deciding uh, on steering commands from images. Uh, so that's my talk, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, my students and collaborators for um, for doing the heavy lifting on many of these uh, projects. So. Happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Florian. That was fantastic. And we're also exactly on time, which is also fantastic. Amazing. Great. I think I recognize some of those people in that uh, last slide you had there. They seem to be familiar faces. I think I've seen them around uh, various parts of the world. Anyway, okay. So we now have about uh, 20 minutes to... Um, to engage in a panel discussion. So I'll invite the three speakers to flick on their video. Uh, I think just Igor needs to turn on his uh, video. And then um, I'll take some questions from the chat. I also have a few broader questions uh, for the panel, uh, the three professors to, to deal with. But um, I'll start by just going back to the chat and asking a few questions that have already come in. Um, the first one is for Professor Scholig, I believe. Um, and it is a question from uh, Brolin in the chat. And it is the following. Uh, when you mention a learning process, is that learning uh, process online? or are you using pre-trained data sets that you collect in advance to predict the robot's motion? And then when you rerun the robot in the same place, is it online learning or prediction or prediction from past data, I should say? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So the particular example I showed, um, it can use data as the robot goes, so online. This is the more challenging task because you know, online execution speed matters. So um, you need very efficient learning models. I think in, in my research overall, we do both. Um, we, we use data offline um, and then append it with online data and refine it with online data um, or just learn offline. So I think the, the but what we will need for real world robotics is both. Um, you know, we want to leverage all the data that we have ever collected, um, but we also still may experience situations that we have never seen. So we need very fast adaptation in real time. Yeah, very good question. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So use both. As, I mean, that you always, use all the data you have, I think is one of the yeah. keys. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, great, great. Okay, uh, all right. So I'm going to uh, I'm, I'll I'll save a question for uh, Igor from Florian <laughs> coming up. <laughs> uh, but first, I'll ask uh, a couple of questions also from the chat for for Igor as well. This is a great one uh, from Amir uh, that came in on YouTube. Um, how do you decide if you're doing sensor fusion? How do you decide to how do you decide what weights to apply to each sensor measurement or data? Um, and how do you decide when one sensor should kick in over another sensor? So there are actually two questions. First of all, how to, uh, how, how to weigh, weight each sensor individually. And if we do our homework right, like sometimes in research we have hacky solutions, but if we do our homework right, we really read the sensor data sheet and we look at literally the noise specifications of the sensor or for the camera. Uh, we, we look at potential resolution of the camera and we really have to model this correctly if we want to, to get all out of the sensor. So uh, the, the weighting is not a design decision by us uh, if we do it right. And then the, next, the associated with it is then the sensor fusion algorithm. Um, and typically in our case, but I, I believe also in most of the industry, people either use a variant of the Kalman filter or um, uh, some sort of smoothing based approach or even uh, larger optimization based approaches. Um, but I think like in one of the works that, that I have shown in the, in the beginning for this map generation process, the, the map at the very beginning uh, on my title slide uh, was a map of the inner city of Zurich was generated initially with a Kalman type filter and then uh, further optimized in a big batch optimization. The second is how to decide when, when to use which maps. And this, I believe, is a design decision 
of someone deploying vehicles. Um, in research, we make the decision based on what paper we are going to write next. Um, I think in uh, the practical the practical decision is more like um, in highly dense environments, people tend to use um, HD maps because there you, you just benefit a lot from it. Whereas in unpopulated areas where everything looks self-similar, uh, one would probably go with this map light or uh, mapless approach um, and uh, not, you, not create a detailed 3D map. Okay, excellent, excellent. I would, I would object to Igor's characterization of research. We, we never use hacks, yeah. that's impossible. And we never, uh, only, we, we target our papers based on the pure joy of the theory. We never aim for specific <laughs> targets. That's, this is all crazy. Stuff. Anyway, no, <laughs> very, very well put. Very, and also, you know, truthful. Uh, if the truth is, if the truth is, uh, dirty laundry is aired, it's, it's true. Okay, so one more for uh, Igor as well. And then we'll, I have one for Florian as well too. Um, oh, I just lost. Him. Okay, yes. Yeah, so from Majed uh, on YouTube, um, what do you do, uh, Igor, when you go off-road? So if you don't have a, if you don't have a prior map, or if you say maybe can't use LGPR, do you have some suggestions for what you might do in that scenario? Yeah, so in my personal work, we, we focus on the road driving case. Um, from So far from what I've seen in off-road scenario, I think you don't get around to do at least some sort of terrain estimation. Um, and uh, in, in my experience, it helps to not rely just on vision. Uh, within autonomous driving, there is some debate whether we should rely on more than just vision because there is one com company prom prominently advocating to use vision only as a, or vision as the main sensing modality. But for going off-road, I think you need terrain estimation. You should definitely also use LiDAR as the sensing modality. Well said, yes. I, I, that company is an interesting, interesting firm. I think I've, yeah. <laughs> we won't name that uh, that company, but yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Igor. A uh, question for Florian. This is a great one as well. This is from Adam uh, in the chat. Um, so given a non-differentiable physics engine, uh, which is the typical type of physics engine that we have that we can you know, download open source, um, how challenging is it or was it to make it uh, fully differentiable? Do you require uh, fundamental changes to the architecture or is there just something you can do at a higher level to, to to tweak the system to actually make it differentiable? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I guess we need to separate the question about uh, on whether we're talking about physics only or physics and rendering. And I'll start with physics only. Um, so the main issue there is sort of um, non-differentiable points uh, introduced by contacts, for example. So the presence or absence of a contact induces a, uh, a discontinuity that sort of you know, breaks uh, typical, um, you know, it breaks typical uh, assumptions of uh, differentiability. So what do you do if you want to, uh, if you want to incorporate that in your system? You have two choices. You can either assume soft contacts, uh, which are a bit unrealistic. So which means that even if you're approaching an object, you're, you, you will be, uh, you know, repelling or attracting to it uh, to some particular degree. Uh, or you can assume that you have hard contacts and you, you need to respect them. Uh, so people essentially formulate this as something called the linear complementarity problem, which is, uh, uh, which is essentially uh, a linear programming formulation that uh, sort of allows you to say that you, you, have, to, you have to bounce, forces have to bounce. Um, and from machine learning in the last few years, we have seen that we can differentiate through linear programming solvers uh, and pass derivatives throughout the optimal, through the optimal solutions of these solvers. So that's how people usually uh, go about it. Uh, and I think your current options for doing that uh, are, uh, are two or three, at least. So one of them is differentiable DART from Karen Liu's group at Stanford. The other one is uh, what is soon or hopefully soon going to be uh, an NVIDIA uh, a tool called Deflex, uh, which is differentiable, uh, differentiable physics tool, which is part of the uh, system uh, that I presented. So the differenti differentiable physics and rendering engine. Uh, and there's also uh, other, uh, other types of uh, solvers out there from, um, uh, 
from, from CMU, from Zico Coulter's group and others. So that's for physics. For rendering, the, the problem becomes a bit nastier. Uh, imagine, for example, having a LiDAR sensor and you want the derivatives of this LiDAR uh, with respect uh, to uh, the derivatives of the observations of the LiDAR measurement with respect to the position of the LiDAR. So you have to, so the question is how does uh, the measurement change as you tweak the base of the LiDAR? So that, that is possible. And as, uh, as soon as one of the rays sort of uh, stops hitting an object, you have a discontinuity there as well. So it goes from hitting an object to not hitting an object and going to infinity. So you need to be able to handle these types of discontinuities, quite a few of them, as well as occlusions. Uh, and the other problem is when you try to talk about uh, how to move an object uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, the fixed lighter position. So that, that also introduces a discontinuity due to the same reasons. So people are trying to develop um, you know, smooth versions of these, uh, of these problems so that you can indeed pass derivatives throughout. OK. Thank you. Excellent. So I think what I'm hearing is more than two hours are required to fix the simulator or the, the simulation. Okay. More greater than two hours. Students are looking for something. This will take more than two hours to fix. It is not something you can do in an afternoon on a Saturday. Uh, that's good. Which is why you write papers about it. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to go back to one more question for Angela and I'm going to ask the panel uh, as a, as a group. Uh, one question. So the question, uh, two actually two short questions for Angela. One is uh, just a clarification um, from YouTube. A question about what closed loop means in the context of I think learning here. What is what is closed loop uh, in that case? And also the other one was um, uh, the MPC model that you mentioned in your talk uh, uh, was given um, um, uh, in the context of a lane following problem. If you had a much more densely packed space like traffic, um, how would the model be used in that in that context? So yeah, very good question. <laughs> I start with a closed loop question. I think this is really important to emphasize. Um, a lot of the work that has been done, for example, on the perception side of autonomous driving is done in an open loop fashion and evaluated in an open loop fashion. So I have input images and I have the segmented images. So I, for example, you know, distinguish pedestrians from road surface, from traffic light. Um, and I have this labeled data, do supervised learning and I, and I evaluate the, in the performance of this open loop system, which basically gets an image in and I get out a segmented image. Um, so I do image understanding. And I evaluate how well can I do this on non data that was not used in the training process. Ultimately, the robot works in closed loop, which means this information is then used to plan the motion of the robot and, especially, and, and execute it. And as I execute a new action, for example, I decide to change the lane, I see, you know, I have a different view of the scene. And um, I use that new image to again, um, you know, do image understanding. And so this closed loop happens at a high rate, like uh, you do that 50 times per second, maybe. And, um, and as you do that, you, there's all other types of dynamics come into play, right? If you make a mistake in your perception, that may lead to an action that maybe still okay, but that leads to worse perception, which eventually leads, leads to an unsafe action. So this closed loop behavior, I think is, is really, you know, it's very unique to robotics and very interesting to study. Um, in, in addition to the single modules of a robotic system, which, you know, include perception, mapping, planning and control. Then the second question was related to what do you do if the robot has to navigate in a much more complex um, scenario where you have other cars around, more obstacles, um, dense traffic? Um, there are two aspects I guess I want to highlight. One is the state constraints become more difficult to incorporate in such a model predictive framework, um, meaning that this optimization problem is more difficult to solve. And the other is 
that if it's really dense, you don't want to treat these other cars over the prediction horizon as static obstacles, um, but you want to model their behavior as well. And we know from driving, you know, we can in some way predict their behavior, um, but really our behavior influences their behavior as well. So that's quite complicated. And that's, that's very interesting. And I think, you know, a very open area for research. That is, that's fantastic. That's perfect because it leads into my next, it says a perfect segue into my question for the panel, um, which is the following. Uh, maybe each person can chime in in sequence. Uh, we'll start with Angela, then Igor, then Florian. Um, okay, so what, and this is kind of a loaded question, apologies in advance, but what aspects of autonomous driving, specifically planning and control, let's limit ourselves to that for now, um, are still very difficult to solve. And if you were an incoming PhD student now, and you wanted to have an impact on the field, where might you choose to carry out your research work? <laughs> I mean, I can jump in and basically anyone can chime repeat, in. Or, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. repeat what I said, that I think the prediction of the other agents in the scene um, and incorporating that into my own action plan is very interesting and a very open question. Okay, excellent, Igor. I think when, when working in autonomous driving, you see only problems. I, I almost don't know where, where to start. And all these <laughs> our fields are, are very interesting. Um, both related to prediction and to perception, I think one of the most interesting challenges is to deal with the ed with edge cases and doing research on edge cases in, in general, from basic research to machine learning to applied research in perception, prediction, and planning. Uh, this is, I, I guess, the limit, one of the main limits uh, and has a huge variety of problems. Okay, excellent. So we have closed loop. Um, the whole the whole enchilada closed loop. We have uh, edge cases, which are even hard to just even discover, let alone, yeah, solve. Um, and then, okay, uh, Florian, anything to add? Yeah, I would say, um, in addition to the answers that Angela and Igor uh, mentioned, um, I would also say the unified treatment of uh, perception planning and control, so that you can make it easier to discover edge cases, and so that you can make it easier to reason about propagating uncertainty. Um, and so that you can make it easier to improve all the systems at, uh, you know, together and uh, make them adapt to each other. Um, so this sort of reasoning under uncertainty in a unified way and allowing discovery of edge cases in a unified way, I think, um, yeah, I, that's the sort of, that's the type of future I want to see with uh, self-driving cars. Can I add one more? Absolutely, we're gonna yeah. actually, yeah, sure, go ahead, Angela, yeah. I just wanna kind of, uh, you know, poke everyone's mind a bit on the call because I think we have probably brilliant students here on the call. I think, you know, the goal for self-driving has always been this car should drive better than a human in any condition. I think a very interesting question is to do the opposite. I have a system, um, how can I, can I, um, can I define all the environmental conditions it works safely in and make sure it stays there? Um, you know, I, I think that that's very interesting because if you think about just um, very specific, um, uh, for example, you know, if very specific routes, um, public transportation, a bus only tries a certain route, how can we guarantee on that route everything is such that it, it stays safe? Yeah, this is a, a fantastic. I think it's an open question. So maybe just to close the, the session um, uh, for now, just maybe a quick, uh, this is a, it could be a long question, but uh, a quick answers to this question. Uh, since the systems are becoming more and more complex and they involve learning, I think Florian already alluded to the, some of the answers to this. Um, if you have to try and guarantee safety or ensure safety, how do you, how do, you do that? What would you, what would you say as a recommendation? We can go from Florian to Igor and uh, back to Angela quickly. Right. So, so sorry, Igor, are you going first? No, you are, I think. 
Okay, so I think uh, the I think there's the first step of trying to define what we mean by uh, edge cases uh, and realizable edge cases or plausible edge cases. So things that sound uh, contradictory in terms of uh, usage of terms, uh, actually. But we have to generate edge cases uh, in simulation. So the question is, how diverse do we want them to be? How close to reality we want them to be? So what's the prior we're going to put on edge cases? Um, and I think that's a good starting point. Uh, then we have other layers of safety in terms of uh, formal methods and trying to have controllers that probably have some behavior under some distribution of conditions. Uh, that's another layer of safety. Um, and then I think in the most ill-defined in terms of it being practical, uh, we have we want to have systems that provably generalize in a particular distribution of environments. Uh, and I think that's, uh, we have theoretical tools for how to do that. I think how good those bounds we have from those tools uh, about the behavior of the system uh, in, the, uh, in the general case, uh, how loose are those bounds, that's still under discussion. But there are multiple layers to think about safety. And I think as you go uh, up the hierarchy, the unfortunately, the less practical it becomes. Great. OK, Igor. And I think one part of the answer is something that we have heard already and we'll hear probably from Raquel Moore is uh, building much better simulators that, uh, to, to allow actually simulate the environments that we want to operate in, and then building upon what Angela's that is we should should not define safety in terms of overall safety, but more like safety in terms of environment specific safety. And then this this will allow us to at least deploy autonomous vehicles in the real world without worrying whether we are at level five yet. Okay, and Angela. Last. Um, I just emphasize Ego's last point. I absolutely agree. Yep. And I'm looking forward to the next talk now. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. That's great. Those are great answers. So I think we saw the, I mean, it's a layer cake of, uh, of uh, both complexity and solutions to that complexity. And this leads very nicely uh, into our next talk. So I'll thank the panel and just say quickly, if your question wasn't answered, I apologize. There were a number of questions I didn't get to. Um, I think some, some of them are from great students. So if you have a question, you want to reach out. Uh, please, you know, contact the individual professors that, that spoke today because they'd be uh, interested in hearing your ideas for solutions. With that, I'll hand it back over to Steve to introduce our keynote for today. Thank Wonderful. you. Yes. Thanks, thanks to the panel. A big, to, a big thanks to John Kelly as well for hosting this uh, first panel session with our uh, esteemed faculty. Uh, we have another session just like that uh, tomorrow um, where John and myself and Tim Barfoot will be speaking. So hopefully you can all join us. Um, and so now we'll roll right into uh, our first keynote for this uh, AV workshop. And it gives me, of course, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Raquel Urtison, uh, who's going to be our keynote speaker today. Uh, we timed this workshop impeccably. In fact, I wish I had known that there would be such an exciting announcement last week. Um, but we now know that Raquel is going to be starting an amazing new venture called Wabi with over $83 million in funding and some really exciting investors like Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Abiel, who obviously uh, think what she's doing is fascinating, as do we. Um, and Raquel, of course, wears two hats. I'm gonna go ahead and do a full-on introduction, even though she almost needs no introduction in this uh, crowd. Um, but she is also a, depart a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, a Canada Research Chair in Machine Learning and Computer Vision, and co-founder of the Vector Institute for AI. Uh, she was, of course, prior to, um, her current endeavor, the chief scientist at Uber ATG uh, and the head of Uber ATG R&D, where she led an enormous team and dominated the CVPR landscape for many years, um, uh, leading to uh, two best paper nominees and even two uh, contenders this year as well. Um, so she received her PhD from computer science at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and did postdocs at MIT and UC Berkeley. Um, I have an enormous list of awards that we all uh, uh, know about, and I'm just going to mention a few here. Uh, recipient of the uh, NSERC EWR Specie Award, uh, the NVIDIA Pioneers of AI Award, 
uh, Ministry of Education and Innovation Early Researcher Award, three Google Faculty Awards, one wasn't enough, um, and an Amazon Faculty Research Award, uh, and the list goes on. Um, so without further ado, I want to hand it over to Raquel, and thanks again for coming, Raquel, and look forward to your talk. Thanks, Steve, for the uh, very kind introduction. And indeed, we couldn't time it uh, better because maybe Tuesday will, last week will have been an even better time. Um, but I'm very, very excited to be here today, uh, you know, be talking about you know, some of the latest research that we've been doing in the, in the last uh, two years or so. Um, and, you know, and of course, I'm going to be talking about self driving, right? And, you know, how the, the future is going to look like if you fast forward a couple of years from today, uh, where self driving will be basically everywhere. Um, and as Steve, uh, I guess, uh, already mentioned, right, what happened uh, in the last week uh, is that I actually launched a new company with my amazing team, including, you know, 20 of my uh, PhD students. Um, and um, so we announced, I guess, the, um, you know, we came out of the stealth as well as we announced a very, very large uh, financing round um, around a little bit over $100 million Canadian. Um, and very, very excited into really developing the next generation of self driving technology. We've seen a lot of, you know, uh, methodologies and what I call the traditional approach that is very reminiscent to what the DARPA challenge, uh, you know, stacks look like. And I think it's time to you know, step up a little bit and then look at the problem from a 2021 lens and an AI first approach uh, while it's still being interpretable and verifiable. Okay, so if you are, you know, interested, we are absolutely hiring. Um, we have more than 30 open positions uh, for full time. I haven't yet put the internships uh, out there, but uh, they will be available soon. So if you want to apply for that as well. And always looking forward to you know work with the students, no matter how young you are, no matter how little experience you are. Uh, we love to form uh, to form people and really share our passion for self driving with everybody because this is going to transform the way uh, that we live. And you know there is no reason for you not to participate in this transformational technology. Um, so please, uh, there is a link there for our, our web page and uh, go to the careers side of the of the site and and please apply. Um, but uh, today I'm not going to you know, be talking about what we per se, but I'm going to be talking about uh, two different, you know, or the two main open problems in self driving. Uh, we also are going to be sort of a little bit of a hint into what we are doing uh, in the new company. Uh, but in particular, if you look at, you know, what are the major research questions or technological change uh, questions that uh, you will see, uh, there is like two different domains of, or aspects. One is the, you know, really creating technology that is able to solve all the long tail of events and things that might happen as you drive. Um, so what is that new generation of uh, autonomous systems? Um, and the second piece that is also an open, big open question is, how do you verify the systems? How do you train the systems as, as it becomes, they become more and more AI centric? Um, so we'll be also talking about uh, closed loop simulation where uh, we including, you know, sensor simulation on the loop uh, in real time. Cool, so let's get uh, deep into it. And I have a lot of material, so hopefully I can actually uh, show you everything. I will not go uh, deep into details, but instead I, I'm just gonna tell you, you know, broad perspective about these this sort of domains. Uh, cool. So let's just start, I guess, with autonomy, and then we will take probably 45 minutes on autonomy and 15 minutes on simulation. Okay, so very with me. All right. So I guess the first thing to think about is how does a you know self driving uh, work? Uh, so if you look at the you know the industry out, out there and what they call the traditional approach, um, so which is you know you know 95 percent, 99 percent of the uh, technology that you see. Um, uh, the way it works is the following, so it's very intuitive. Um, so first you have the vehicle that senses the environment. Uh, so I'm showing you this here with a uh, leader point cloud seen from the top. And then basically uh, what teams do is that they localize the vehicle with precision of a few centimeters. Right, so super, super high precision localization. And the reason why is that, um, you know, uh, typically the industry has these beautiful high definition maps that gives you a lot of information about the static part of the environment before you even go around and see what is out there, right? So this is, you know, great information also in order to see beyond the sensors and, you know, plan maneuvers, uh, long-term maneuvers. 
Um, so once you localize, then basically your perception system uh, is uh, going to look at uh, around the, the vehicle and basically perceive all the, all the things around you. And I'm somehow missing a slide. Here we are. Um, and then you're going to predict what the different actors uh, are going to do in the next few seconds. Uh, that's called motion forecasting or prediction. And then basically uh, you plan a safe maneuver and uh, given you know what is uh, basically around you what the past was what the present is as well as what you think the future is going to look like okay and you do something like model predictive control where um, you basically replan uh, every fraction of a second okay so that's basically in a nutshell how a self-driving vehicle uh, works now if you look at this traditional approach right it has some some key advantages but also some disadvantages that really prevent this technology from scaling so in terms of advantages is the fact that, you know, you get these intermediate representations where there are bounding boxes, trajectories of actors, et cetera, um, which are, you know, great for things like um, validation, interpretability, be able to explain why the system did something in case that actually did the wrong action. Um, it's also quite easy to incorporate prior knowledge. Um, and this is typically what, you know, engineering teams actually do uh, in practice. Um, now, if you look at uh, you know the disadvantage, there is there is a few uh, key things. For example, um, you know if you look at a cell driving a stack uh, in industry, you typically will have you know a thousand people working on it, right? So that's a massive project. And if you look at every single component, so you typically have teams that actually work in silos, only dedicated to try to do their their little component. So if you have this myopic view of Yes, independent, you know, little modules, and then somehow you need to combine them. It's very hard to come up with something that is robust, safety, um, uh, you know, safety proof, as well as, uh, you know, really that's complex reason. Um, and, you know, furthermore, there is like very little interfaces uh, or very small interfaces between these models, meaning that there is almost, you know, no information passed. So once you make, you know, say the decisions during perception, uh, and you made a mistake, it's going to be impossible for you to correct for that. So, so you get you get these cascading errors uh, that is actually quite problematic. And furthermore, every time that you actually make a change in one of these models, where typically, you know, there is you know, hundreds of these models here, um, then you need to retune the entire system. And this retuning is done by hand. So you can imagine that it, it takes months to actually make you know, small changes within this software stack. So that doesn't scale, right? That's actually too complex. So the alternative that we've seen, particularly in academia, is to say, well, I'm going to yes, use a single neural net and it's going to do everything for me, right? So advantages of this is that it's very simple and it's going to be trained for the end task, right? So the better your metrics get, the better you're going to actually be, be doing the task. Now, there is a few key disadvantages that make this uh, not a good uh, solution. Um, so you have no interpretability, right? It's actually really difficult to verify the system. Um, so as a consequence, and you have no explainability. So if the system does something wrong, right, it's very hard to understand why and to fix it somehow. Um, it also requires too many examples, meaning that uh, in order to handle like safety critical cases or rare events, you actually need to observe them in your data. And that's actually you know, really difficult and you need to drive a lot in order to be able to observe everything in the world. And on top of this, uh, it's really hard to incorporate prior knowledge. So you know, it's, it's actually not easy uh, to make progress uh, if you are trying to have such an approach. So, so what is the, uh, you know, uh, the alternative that we've been advocating for the past, I don't know how many years now, and refining more and more, and you know, that is sort of like wavy speech, right? Is that uh, you want to do something that has the advantages of these two approaches without inheriting the disadvantages. So there's a third family of models where the idea is that you're going to have modularity, you're going to be able to have interpretability, but at the same time, you should be able to do end-to-end -end training of the entire software stack, not just yes, a particular model, right? So, so if you can do this, well, you can do things such as you can use sensor data all over your process so that you don't need, uh, you don't have this cascading of errors. You can have much more complex functions so that your motion planning can deal with very you know, sophisticated situations. And you can really propagate uncertainty much better. And on top of this, because you share computation, you can end up actually with solutions that computationally are more efficient than a traditional approach, which is to some uh, surprise. Right, so let's look at uh, how we can build you know, generations of this. Um, so you know, the first thing that we actually uh, uh, started doing, and this was now 
maybe three and a half years ago, uh, maybe actually four years ago, is to say that we're not going to start with the entire server stack, but instead we're going to look at the problem of perception and motion forecasting or perception and prediction, right? And then we're going to uh, try to come up with a single algorithm, a single neural network that is able to do this task. So our first generation uh, was actually a pretty simple idea. Um, and the idea was the following is that, you know, you can use your favorite sensor uh, or set of sensors. In this case, say uh, we use Versailles view representation of the LiDAR. Uh, you can use a neural net to basically detect, you know, where the actors are in the scene, as well as to regress in terms of the trajectories of where those actors are going to be in the next few seconds. Okay, so it's a very natural way to actually do detection as well as, uh, or perception as well as prediction in a single network. And it turns out that doing such a thing, not only is very, very simple, it worked much better than the traditional way at the time, uh, you know, the literature in how you could do perception and prediction as a two-step process. Uh, so let me show you the, uh, I guess, the video. Uh, so we call this Fast and Furious. Um, and so what you observe here is, uh, you know, the difficulties uh, in terms of, you know, uh, when you do self-driving, there is a lot of this happening. Uh, so you need to, you know, put bounding boxes, right? These detections in terms of the actors of interest. Um, we also track automatically, right? So same color means it's the same actor. And then these, these dots that emanate for every bounding box is basically the prediction into how every actor is going to be moving in the future. Okay? And in this case, the, our first generation used um, a, the most likely prediction as just the output. Okay? And it was a short-term prediction, yes, a single cycle. Right, so this was actually a, a breakthrough in terms of uh, you know, simplifying the software stack from something, you know, tons of models and things to something extremely uh, streamlined that can run in you know, 20 to 30 milliseconds at the time. Um, so so I, I would say a big step uh, forward in terms of this simplification. Cool, hopefully this works. Okay. Um, and then we build many, many generations of, uh, of this technology. So let me tell you, yes, a couple, uh, yes, so that you get some insights of uh, our thinking. Um, so one of the things that uh, we did first uh, was to, well, if you think about the problem of perception as well as predicting how the different actors are going to be moving in the future, one of the things that is important to use is if you have high definition maps, you should actually use them. Uh, such that you can predict uh, better what the act actors are going to be doing because it really depends on where the lanes are and whether there's certain traffic rules uh, in those, uh, for example, intersections. Um, so we extended the you know, very simple model to reason about uh, the map as well. Uh, first version was a rasterized version. Then we had more sophisticated graph uh, representations. Uh, but anyways, so we use a rasterized representation and then on top of doing uh, perception and prediction into the future, we also predict the intention of the different actors. And this is important if you want to do uh, accurate motion planning. Okay, so let's look at how this uh, the system works. So I want, I want you to focus on the bottom. Uh, the top is a little bit of a you know, similar representation as before. Um, so here, what we're going to see is uh, on you know, color coded and also with arrows are the intentions of the different uh, vehicles that we detect and predict. So the more red it is, the higher the probability of arriving to stop, the more yellow it is, the higher the probability of continue driving, and the more purple it is, the higher the probability of being parked. And this is quite interesting, right? As you see all this park versus stop, um, the, there is a difference between being parked and being stopped in terms of how, as a self-driving car, which maneuvers you will do uh, to react to these actors. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why, although it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, to make the distinction between the two, it's important that you reason about it. And then with the different arrows, you see probability of lane change, keeping lane, um, and as well as just making a turn. Right, so this was one step into bringing things closer to motion planning. Now, uh, I'm going to skip many generations, and I'm going to go to one of the, la the la latest things that we've done. And uh, first, I want to motivate into, if you look at the problem of motion forecasting, right? one of the things to think about is, OK, what are the difficulties of this task? Well, one of the difficulties comes from the fact that the future is really multimodal, meaning that if you see a vehicle, for example, here, you know, driving towards an intersection, it's actually impossible to know uh, oftentimes what the maneuver that this vehicle is going to do. Right, it could continue straight or it could actually make a turn, right? And you can argue, oh, well, if it has turn signal, then it's going to make a turn. But 
you know, people don't necessarily always signal, and sometimes they signal wrongly, right? So, so in general, there is a lot of uncertainty, and uh, you know, there's a multimodal distribution that really you need to uh, think about or model when you do uh, motion forecasting. The other thing that is actually quite difficult with motion forecasting is the fact that, you know, although you might have an intention of doing something, for example, you know, uh, crossing the intersection, there is um, there is going to be interactions between the different actors that are going to condition basically into the actions of everybody, right? So, if, for example, this actor is going to enter the intersection, I'm probably going to yield to this actor, right? However, if he doesn't, I'm probably going to just do my unprotected lap. Right? So if you think about this, uh, and the same for the self-driving vehicle, right? the interactions of you with the rest of the world as well. Um, so you need to somehow model uh, this um, as you do this real-time inference in the, in the vehicle. And that's actually pretty hard. And the third thing that is uh, also to take into account is the latency, your reaction time. You need to make decisions super, super fast. And it's important that basically you have super fast, uh, you know, inference uh, and very accurate inference. And this always creates, creates you know, a critical um, sort of uh, contradiction in terms of, you know, sophistication of the model versus can you actually do very, very, very fast inference. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of multimodality, there has been a lot of work in the literature into coming up with output representations that will represent, you know, the set of possible actions. Uh, whether it is with mixtures of Gaussians, right? This is something that the Waymo team, for example, likes to do. Uh, whether it is through flattened representations like occupancy grids, this is something that we actually uh, really love, particularly for pedestrians, because it's inherently it's very easy to do multimodality, and these models are much easier to, to train. We also uh, like a lot to do it with a non-parametric distribution, so of all the possibilities that every actor can do, and then you score them, right? That's one way to get a very nice multimodal distribution. And some folks also like to do uh, things like autoregressive models that give you multimodality as you enroll the different samples. Um, but in the bottom line, what, what's happening with all, you know, all, this, um, uh, all these different approaches to uh, model this, uh, multimodal distributions is that they actually model the uncertainty of every actor independent meaning that they are always interested in capturing the marginal distribution of every actor. And then this marginal distribution is what is fast motion planning. And this is actually pretty problematic. So let me illustrate why this is the case. So, you know, if I capture the marginal distribution, right, for every actor, I have a set of possibilities of how they might behave. But, uh, and then given all the set of possibilities, I, the self-driving vehicle, needs to decide what to do. However, if you think about uh, this, uh, what really might arise in practice is not that the cross product of all these, the, you know, uh, of all the actors' possibilities is actually likely. Instead, there is a few explanations of the scene that are very, very likely, right? And, and this is basically when you really take into account these interactions between the actors. For example, right, if this actor is going to uh, give right, then uh, it could be that this actor is yielding, this actor is yielding, and then for me, it's a good idea to just pass, right? Or it could be that they actually decide to cross the intersection, and then for me, I should stop, right? But it's not all the possibilities that potentially I can sample from just the independent distributions. Now, even in the works that you see out there that talk about interactions, it's still they model as the output, the marginal distribution. And as I said, this is very problematic. So instead, uh, what is important is to reason about the joint distribution of all actors and have a motion planner that can actually take that as input. Okay? And the, obviously the difficulty in there is how you can do this super, super fast and super, super accurately. Um, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about one of the latest models we developed that actually is able to do this. Um, and the idea is that, again, we're gonna do end-to-end -end perception and prediction. So we're gonna start with our LADAR, we're going to uh, have our maps, we're going to compute some feature representation uh, given our favorite neural nets with some fusion between the different streams. And here you can fuse also different uh, input modalities with cameras, radar, etc. Okay, I just didn't have enough space to put all the different sensor modalities, so you can do that. And then basically we're going to do what is called a two-stage detector, which is still end-to-end -end trainable, but basically we're going to detect what the different actors are and then now we're going to do more sophisticated detection by extracting 
um, the relevant information of across every actor by using this rotated region of interest. Okay, and we're gonna further process it to have some representation uh, for every one of the actors in the scene. Okay, so we have this distributed representation uh, for every actor. Now, the question is, how do we exploit this representation to predict uh, the joint distribution of what everybody's gonna be doing? Okay, um, so for this, one thing that we can do is uh, we can exploit uh, leading variable models, which are actually really amenable to this task. And in particular, you can think of what we are doing here as a sophisticated conditional VAE for those of you that like uh, you know, this kind of leading variable model, where the encoder and the decoder are graph neural networks. And these graph neural networks, basically what they do is that they capture all the relationships and, and uh, between all the different actors so that you actually model their interaction, okay? And what is kind of interesting about this model is that we have a distributed latent representation instead of having just a single latent variable here. Uh, and the reason to do this is that uh, we want to handle an arbitrary number of actors uh, 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 you know, as you go through the scene uh, in the different scenes because you obviously have different actors as you're driving around the world. Um, so the way that you do inference is very simple. You basically compute the feed forward, you compute the representation, uh, you compute the, the distribution, your prior, you sample from the prior, and then you have a deterministic decoder that basically gives you the representation for all actors in the scene at once. So every sample, uh, one sample generates all actors uh, in particular realization for all actors. Okay, and then you can sample multiple times and you will have different realizations for all these different actors. Okay, so this is the way that very efficiently we can actually do the sampling in real time. Um, so what you can do is also uh, look at the um, uh, two samples from the model. Uh, so this is two points in the latent space and we're gonna interpolate in the latent space and then we're gonna decode. And this is what you see, observe here, the two extremes of the two samples, right? And then you see that as you move in the latent space, you're actually moving the distribution of what all the different actors are actually doing, okay? So this is you know, just showing that you're really capturing the joint distribution across everybody. Um, and basically you can train this model end to end and without going into too many details, basically uh, you train it for detection, it's important so your intermediate representations have meaning. You also train it as a CVAE with your KL divergence and then you also train it with the reconstruction loss so that you fit the data that you have captured by, human, uh, by humans, okay? Um, so this kind of model actually works uh, uh, really, really well. So this is showing uh, this is the social compliance. Uh, this is for your predictions, how many they actually uh, sample from them, how many they, uh, the percentage of them that they will collide. Uh, and these are metrics uh, with relate to how well you do with respect to predicting what the humans actually did in practice. Um, so you see that, you know, compared to basically you see here, you know, all the, the different baselines out there or different papers published. So it works much better in terms of, um, you know, mimicking you know, the, the likelihood of the humans, but more importantly, it's much more socially compliant. You actually predict explanations of the scene that actually make sense and don't rely on, uh, uh, you know, don't have a lot of uh, collisions. This is, for example, multipath. This is the Waymo paper that maybe Drago will, will talk about uh, uh, whenever his keynote is. Um, so, so this model actually works really well in practice, as I said, and this is just showing, uh, you know, how it predicts um, as you drive around. And you can see that typically uses multimodality only when there is uncertainty, otherwise it predicts more the multimodality in the speed profiles as you would expect. Um, important to note as well, and we see very little of this in the literature is that even if you are a perception you know, developer and you care about perception, you always should look at your system level metrics, both in open loop as well as closed loop. Um, so you should look at, you know, given, you know, my model for say perception of prediction, how well I'm going to do at the task of plan, uh, the task of motion planning, if I use, you know, whatever motion planner uh, is uh, currently my software stack. Okay, so it turns out that this kind of model that I was showing uh, before is not only better or much better in terms of perception and prediction metrics, it's actually much better in terms of motion planning metrics as well. Uh, is um, has a much more comfortable is much safer and, you know, without the sacrificing the, the progress uh, as you will, you will see in other planners. 
All right, so, so that's sort of like, if you think about the perception and prediction system that you can build, and this is, you know, one of the latest, uh, you know, sort of like in time, you know, how we develop uh, several, several of, these, uh, of these models, and hopefully I give you a little bit of the intuitions of the questions that we were trying to answer. But if you think about the problem that you're trying to solve, at the end of the day, you can only be as good as your sensor data gives you the information for, right? So one of the things to think about is, is there a way to be safer? And if you fast forward now into say several years into the future, what's gonna happen is that these self-driving vehicles are gonna be everywhere, right? So one thing that you can start thinking about is, can I use vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication such that I can actually enhance my perception about the world around me, right? And so let me just illustrate why this is actually important. So let's look at you know, bird's eye view of the LiDAR scene from the top. Right, so if you look at things that are nearby, you actually have um, a lot of evidence. Uh, that, so it's very easy to detect and predict maybe what this vehicle is gonna do, right? However, for things that are far away, it's actually pretty difficult. You only see a little bit of evidence, right? So that's gonna be hard. And on top of this, you have these massive occlusions, right? And imagine that it's actually a child maybe running here that is about to cross the road. So that's pretty dangerous, right? Because you don't see but somehow you need to be able to react very quickly to it, right? So, but if you think about it, right, and if you have multiple vehicles in the scene, they might have uh, access with, themselves, with their sensors about the information that is behind your occlusions, right? And you can also have better maybe understanding of things that are far away if you have a vehicle that's nearby, that, you know, that's a self-driving vehicle, right? So the idea here is that can we leverage vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication in order to basically see much better around us? Okay. Um, so this is just showing, um, I'm gonna utilize for this uh, our closed loop simulator. Okay, so there's a simulation results, but you see here multiple self-driving vehicles driving around, and there is also like regular vehicles that are just driven by humans, right? And here we see what is the representation of the sensor data that every one of these vehicles receives or will see with respect to the scene. Okay, so we're not controlling which ones are self-driving versus not, here is just, some percentage of vehicles are actually self-driving and we can exploit their information. All right. Now, if we wanna do this, the question to start thinking about is, well, what information should I transmit such that I actually don't need a super high bandwidth network, right? And at the same time, I actually transmit all the information that is required to do better perception. Um, so probably the first thing that comes to mind to everybody is like, well, let's transmit the sensor information, in this case, the later. Um, advantage is that you don't, uh, you basically don't lose any information, right? But uh, you require a gigantic network, right, uh, bandwidth in order to do this. And on top of this, if you're the, you're the receiving cell driving vehicle, now you need to process all the sensor data from all the vehicles around. So there is no way that you can do this in real time, right? So that's another solution. On the other extreme, what we can do is maybe we can do perception and prediction and send the outputs of our system uh, to the other vehicles. What is the advantage of this is that you require very little bandwidth, so that's great. The problem is that you basically have lost almost all information by that point. You don't have almost anything about the context, it's just about your inference, right? And if you actually made mistakes, maybe you start corrupting also what every other vehicle actually sees. So there is, a, there is a, something in between that is actually a much better solution. This is uh, what we proposed a couple of months ago, which is to say that we can actually learn some intermediate representations such that they are highly compressible so that we only need very little bandwidth in the network. And at the same time, they maintain all the useful information for all other vehicles in the scene to actually do better perception and prediction. Okay, this is something again that you can train into an uh, uh, through a system. So if we look more in detail, so in particular, the way that this, this will look is that this is our cell driving vehicle. These are all the cell driving vehicles in the scene. Uh, everybody's gonna capture the environment with their sensors. It's gonna process some information to get these intermediate representations. We're gonna compress it and we're gonna send it, you know, through the airwaves. And then uh, every, uh, every vehicle is gonna receive information from the vehicles that are nearby. And it's going to decompress this information. And we're going to use a graph neural network, which is you know, one of our favorite tools, uh, which is a especially aware, especially aware graph neural network to decode the information. 
to decode this information and basically uh, utilize the information from all the different uh, vehicles to make better perception and prediction, right? So we are enhancing our sensor data through compressed representations in a way that there is very little overhead in terms of computation because everybody is acting as a distributed compute system. Okay, so this is the way that you can actually get the best compromise. And one of the things that is very, very interesting here is that if you look at uh, uh, performance as a function of the you know, number of vehicles that you see in the scene, uh, it almost uh, grows linearly for both perception as well as prediction metrics. Meaning that as the world is gonna have more and more self-driving vehicles, we're gonna perform safer and safer uh, self-driving. And this is actually really, really interesting to see uh, how nicely this actually does not saturate and grow. So the, you know, the same that you, we use this technique for vehicle to vehicle communication, you can think of utilizing as well this for V2X, where the vehicle can communicate with uh, other parts of the environment, can be static cameras and intersections, et cetera. So same, uh, same idea can actually uh, work. Cool, so let's go. Uh, so now we have you know, perception and prediction. We look at you know, very sophisticated uh, join models. We look at how we can use V2V within these join models. And let's, let's get a little bit into planning, okay? And I'm gonna show you very quickly uh, one or two ways to actually do this. Um, so the first iteration of this now is end-to-end -end the entire autonomy system, okay? And the first iteration that we built was actually pretty simple, uh, but also worked pretty, you know, remarkably well, I have to say, uh, surprisingly well, was the following, is that, uh, again, we're gonna get our uh, later point clouds, our maps, we're gonna do detection uh, to get your uh, to get your bounding boxes, regressing to the future of the trajectories, and then the way that we treat this is gonna be as a multitask problem. Where on top of this prediction, we're gonna predict an additional branch, uh, which basically give us the planning cost volume. So what is this planning cost volume? Is a cost for the self-driving vehicle to be at every point in space, which is these two dimensions, and time, which is this additional dimension here. Okay, so it's a three-dimensional cost volume um, that basically we will utilize in order to cost trajectories and decide what is the best trajectory that our self-driving car should do. So this is actually really easy to do and really easy to learn as well. Uh, and that was the reason for our choice. Um, and the way that inference works is that basically you do the forward pass uh, to compute uh, your detections, your, your predictions, as well as the cost volume. And then we have a trajectory sample sampler that samples for the self-driving vehicle, all the possible trajectories that might, we might wanna do. And then basically we're gonna <clears throat> cost uh, every single trajectory. And the way that we cost these trajectories is just by indexing in this cost volume. So it's very, very efficient. And then we basically select the trajectory that has the minimum cost. Okay, so a very, very easy way to, uh, to do motion planning in a way that this is non-parametric. Okay. And you can train this end-to-end -end by having a loss function for detection, for regression, and using max margin loss uh, for the planning because you don't have the optimal cost volume since you're trying to learn, learn it in the first place. Okay, so let me show you a video of this. Um, so as I said, this actually worked pretty, pretty nicely. So you're gonna see detections, predictions into the future, as well as the cost volume. And the way I'm gonna show you this three-dimensional cost volume is by projecting the cost volume, which is three-dimensional into 2D. So different colors at different timestamps. And I'm only gonna show you the part of the cost volume with minimum cost that has very low cost. Okay, yeah, so that you understand what the vehicle is thinking without being too overwhelming. So you see that it's you know, very multimodal, right? Very natural in terms of you know, how many modes there are. Um, that can do complex maneuvers like you know, turn, continue, queuing, change lanes, slow down because somebody is cutting in front of us, right? And all this stuff is learn, you know, even things like super notches like this one that is actually pretty difficult to do. And all this is simply learned from, you know, um, a few bounding boxes and a few, uh, uh, you know, minutes of driving. So it's generalized is really, really well. Now, this was a, you know, a great first attempt, but there is also a lot of uh, things to still uh, be done much better. Um, uh, one of the things is that, uh, you know, this is a, um, you know, we only were using the most likely prediction, 
not looking at all the uh, multimodality in prediction systems, right? Um, which is, you know, problematic, right? If you most likely prediction is the wrong one, then you're not going to take into account, you know, something that uh, is going to maybe end up in, uh, you know, the wrong maneuver. Also, planning is not a specific condition on prediction. Instead, it's a multitask uh, problem, right? So that given the features, is independent, and that's not uh, that's not great, right? And this system with this non-parametric cost volume, you know, if you are a, a you know a fan of neural networks, it's great, right? Because you don't need to incorporate prior knowledge. If you're thinking of the safety thing, right? Safety um, safety case more, then this is not great because apart from the task loss. In, in learning, the system really doesn't really have much prior knowledge, right? It, doesn't, it needs to learn from scratch to don't collide, follow the traffic rules, et cetera. So this is not ideal. All right, so, so the next generation I'm going to show you in a second is going to try to address these three things. So it's going to use prior knowledge. It's going to be multimodal consistent. And at the same time, it's going to be uh, perception. So the prediction is going to be, um, is, sorry, draft planning is going to be explicitly conditional on prediction. Okay, so let's see how uh, how we can build this. Uh, so same idea, right? As every one of these uh, this models I've been showing, and then what we're going to do next is that we're going to have a detection model that is going to detect the different actors of interest, and we're going to have a prediction model. Now this is looking more at like the traditional stack, but not that the prediction model is going to use features from uh, you know can even go all the way to the reference of data. Okay, so this is what I was you know, mentioning before at the beginning of the talk is that we can have very, very complex decision making by and not, have, not having cascading errors by accessing very, very early stages of the pipeline uh, in terms of the feature computation. Um, and the idea here is that this prediction model is gonna be you know, a very sophisticated Markov random field uh, or deep structure model in this case, uh, where for every actor, we're gonna predict a multimodal distribution of what they're gonna be doing. Okay, so we do this with a, in a non-parametric way. So we have a set of trajectories for every actor and we're gonna learn to score them into the most likely ones. We will do this for every actor and then we will take into account via the MRF, their interactions such that, you know, some of these uh, trajectories are actually not likely because they will result in collision. Okay, this is sort of like the reasoning about interactions gives you. Okay, and then we will use this as an input to the planning module and the planning node that has access to all the raw sensor data as well, right? So you can have very, very sophisticated costing functions beyond what you typically see in, in plan. Cool. So this, this is able to do uh, predict much more multimodal distribution for the actors. Uh, you only use multimodality when you need, right? Otherwise, if it's very obvious, you don't. And then basically results in, you know, very, very accurate, um, you know, predictions in this case. Uh, it's much more socially compliant in terms of the predictions and results in much better planning. Okay. And this, again, you can train end-to-end uh, -end the entire system from the raw sensor data all the way uh, to the, more, the output of the motion planner. Cool. So, um, uh, so I gave you two generations of, uh, I guess, the entire software start with a single end-to-end um, -end system. There is uh, two more generations that we have done since. I, you know, I don't have time to, to talk about them today, but they're actually really, really interesting. Uh, and in particular, they look at this representation of the scene in terms of uh, occupancies, uh, which are great in terms of not being, you know, not needed thresholding for safety. And um, in particular, one uses maps, and the second one is how to do end-to-end, -end, including obtaining high-definition maps on, on the fly. And this is MP3, which is one of the, I guess, final, finalists for the Best Paper Award this year for CVPR. Um, and I, I definitely encourage you to look at this, uh, these two papers, uh, which are, uh, I would say, pretty exciting as well. Cool, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna um, instead uh, go towards uh, showing you or telling you a little bit more about simulation. and what is really the type of simulator that the industry needs and what are the characteristics or things that you need to build uh, in order for this to really be testing the entire software stack. All right, so, so first let's look at, um, you know, in the industry, how typically we actually test uh, software. 
so there is a combination of three different things uh, that we typically exploit. Uh, we use uh, structured testing. So that what this means is basically that every software release will be tested through a set of scenarios in the test track that are actually uh, done with you know, the dummies as well as you know, real vehicles driving around. And then you test these very, very specific uh, behaviors. Okay? And, you, and this is very repeatable um, and it gives you, you know, quite a bit of signal. But the problem is that um, you can only do maximum typically like a hundred of, of these tests, right? Which is very, very small if you think about you know, the, the variety of things that uh, of what can happen in the real world, right? But it's great because it's reactive, right? You're actually testing the real software stuff driving around the, the world, even though it's in, in the test track. So it's not scalable. Uh, also, you can't really test safety critical because you're not gonna crash all your self-driving vehicles right in the test track. Um, so, so it has you know, some limitations. Um, another form of testing that is also very uh, employed in the industry is uh, what is called real world replay, log replay. Uh, sometimes when people talk, I do simulation, they mostly uh, refer to this. Okay. Um, and the idea is that you replay the logs that you capture in the real world. And then you look at how your new generation of software stack, your new release perform or will have performed if you were to observe those scenarios. Um, so if you have driven a lot of miles in the real world, so you have, you know, a lot of uh, stored data. So that's actually, you know, uh, uh, quite good, right? But the problem is that it's not reactive, meaning that if your new software stack changes behavior, right, it's faster, uh, slower, changes lanes, you don't have the sensor data associated with it. So you're going to be passing as the input to perception system something that is not the true of what a system will have observed if it was on that scenario. So there is divergence. So there is, you know, it doesn't really give you that much information uh, beyond, uh, you know, catching big bugs and whatnot. So that's also not great either. The third piece is uh, what uh, sometimes is, is referred to virtual simulation, right? And the idea is that you will you want to test your entire software, uh, you want to test your software stack uh, in a simulated fake world. And so this is great in the sense that you, because you know it's not, there is no safety issue, right? You can actually test as many safety uh, critical cases as you want. Um, the problem is that typical uh, systems are not scalable and they are not high fidelity. Um, and this basically hinders the use of real simulation uh, in cell driving in the industry. Okay, so there, what I'm going to tell you now is how we can build, you know, a simulator that is closed loop, is real time, and is much more uh, um, high fidelity compared to anything that out there. Now, one thing to note as well is that, um, you know, oftentimes you, you see, you know, some of the companies in the industry saying that they drive, you know, millions of miles of simulation. I think it's important to note that to really understand typically what they mean, what they, they, they do this at the scale. So what they mean is basically that they start with trajectories and bounding boxes, and they only test the motion plan. Okay, so they are not doing the full simulation and testing the entire software stack. They are only testing a small piece of the software stack. And this is problematic in the sense that um, it doesn't give you information about how the entire system behaves. Um, and also for the motion planner, it's also not super realistic because the inputs here typically are nearly optimal trajectories, are not, don't have the noise characteristics and the issues that the true perception and prediction system has. Okay, so you, you know, your tests are also not very realistic, either, right? So we need something else. All right, so let's look at how we can actually employ sensor simulation in order to um, basically test the entire server stack, right? And the idea is that you need to uh, reconstruct somehow the wall, and you need to simulate how the sensors will have observed the scene, and then basically have a reactive system inside that virtual simulation. Okay, so so let's see what what pieces do we need in order to do so. Um, so there is like four main components that you need to build. You need to be able to generate these virtual worlds. You need to be able to generate the scenarios that you want to test to simulate the behaviors of the different actors in a way that is super realistic, and includes of the long tails or the distributions of how humans drive. And then you need to simulate the sensors, right? And if you have all this technology at scale, super high fidelity in real time, 
then basically you have a winner. Okay, so let's let's have a look at uh, how we can use AI to actually create you know best in class in all these different things. So let's start with the uh, generating the virtual worlds. So what is typically used in the industry is they use artists to generate the assets. Uh, this is an image from Carla, for example, right? But um, you will see very similar things in, in the industry uh, where humans generate these CAD models and there is very simple automation that combines this in, you know, this uh, pieces of the world to generate, you know, compositions uh, to create a bigger world. Um, so this is not realistic. It doesn't scale because humans are pretty expensive. Right, and you don't have the level of fidelity and you know all the different things that might happen in the real world. So our approach to this is actually uh, pretty different. And instead, what we do is we don't use humans, we use AI. So we just drive around the world, capture raw data, no annotations. And then from there, we actually build um, walls uh, about the static part of the environment the, and all the dynamic objects. Okay, so let's see how we can do this. Uh, so for the static part of the environment, it's a matter of being able to have slummy things at the scale that are very, very accurate and be able to filter all the dynamic objects and things that you don't want as part of your background representation. Right? Uh, in terms of the uh, creating the 3D assets, like the rigid uh, objects, uh, we exploit uh, self-supervised techniques so that we don't even uh, require a single training data. And these are uh, you know, some of our reconstructions of uh, you know, the vehicles. So basically, we can reconstruct every vehicle as we just drive uh, you know, around the world. We can also reconstruct humans. Uh, and what you're seeing here is, um, in this case, we can reconstruct uh, from a single laser sweep as well as a single image, um, the shape, the skeleton, the skin in weight, so that we can automatically reanimate this one human that we observe once with our satellite vehicle. Okay, we can do this at the scale automatically. So this is a game changer, right? Suddenly everything you observe now below uh, are the assets that you will use for your simulation. Um, so that's the, in terms of creating the virtual world, let's generate the scenarios, okay? And the idea is the following is that given a map and where the satellite car is, you wanna generate the traffic scenario in a way that is realistic. Um, so you can do this also with, you know, in this case, it's an autoregressive model um, that basically is generating one, one actor at a time, and it generates uh, their position, class, velocity, etc., in a way that creates these very realistic traffic scenarios, as you can observe here. Okay, so this is the way that we can generate, you know, millions, billions, trillions, whatever of a scenarios automatically in a way that reflects the distribution of uh, the real world. Then we need to simulate the behaviors of the different actors, right? So we need to unroll the simulations. Um, so for this, we use again, uh, sophisticated multi-agent uh, AI system uh, based on uh, you know, some of the prediction systems that I actually were showing you before. And you can see here simulations by our traffic simulator that is, as you see, is very, very realistic. And I'm gonna, in a second, show you that can also generate uh, more rare events of things in a way that it looks very realistic with respect to how a human would have done the, this maneuver. Um, so I'm gonna show you four things. Uh, here is a notch. So again, it's very, very human-like, right? You're gonna see a U-turn. So the system is, uh, in this case, it's gonna orchestrate so that you wait for this actor to pass. And there is no rule or nothing, right? This is simply, a graph neural network and roll. In this case, a lane change, again, very, very uh, realistic behavior. And the unprotected left, uh, which is one of the most difficult things to simulate, uh, will be next. But again, uh, very realistic. Cool. And the last thing we need to do is simulate the sensors. So let me show you how we can simulate uh, later and, and then cameras. I'll show you two videos and then I will conclude. Um, so in terms of the, uh, simulating the data, so we use a combination of physics and AI um, uh, for the simulator as well. Uh, on the left-hand side is the later simulator, on the right-hand side is the real data. So they look very similar, but what is more important is that for the perception system, which the output is in green, it behaves the same in the simulator and in the real world. And this perception system was actually trained on the real world, so it has never seen simulation before. So this is, you know, with this level of correlation between the two, 
is how you, you know, and this level of fidelity is how you can really test in simulation your entire uh, system, right? So now we can create the safety critical systems, right? By putting all this together, and this will be the sensor simulation of this particular scenario that we're testing. And you see here how our software stack is able to react and a slowdown of somebody coming out of occlusion, right? And then you can do this at the scale uh, in all these different scenarios, et cetera. Okay, very, very realistically. Cool. So as I said, last video, I'm gonna show you how to do this with images. Um, and in particular, uh, for images, we need to do it in a way that is consistent in 3D so that we can do later simulation and image simulation. Um, and I'm gonna show you how we do actor inje injection. So the idea is that you're gonna have raw logs and we're gonna use these reconstructed assets that we had from before to incorporate new actors in these raw videos that we have. Okay, uh, so in this case, this actor is gonna be inserted and we're gonna do it in a way that is 3D, traffic aware and aware of occlusions. So let's look at this. Um, I'm gonna show you every video twice. And what you need to do here is identify which objects uh, here are actually fake. There is typically like between four or five uh, fake objects, fake, fake vehicles here. So in this case, this one is fake. You can see a little bit by maybe the illumination. Right, this one is also fake. It wasn't there in the first place. This is a bit more tricky. So I'll let you guess. Meaning that the system actually works really, really well. So this guy is fake. Hopefully this place, this guy is fake. This guy is fake, for example. Very, very hard to say. Right, so this simulation is super, super realistic. And again, you can do it at the scale, right? And this is the, you know, how we can actually test the software stack. Um, and, and one of the things that is very interesting is that we can actually simulate multiple cameras at once in a way that is, uh, uh, again, consistent in 3D. So this, the vehicle will, uh, you know, the fake vehicles will actually be uh, in the right place for all the cameras. Cool, so, uh, so just to conclude, to, today I'll show you a little bit about perception and prediction, a little bit of this new motion planners, vehicle to vehicle communication, simulation. I didn't have time to go into things like adversarial simulations and things like this, where it's one of the areas that, that we do a lot of things, also robustness and safety in AI. And there is many, many other areas that uh, you know we are focusing, but hopefully give you a glimpse of at least the most difficult most difficult things that uh, you know to handle the still in self driving, and if you decide to do research here, what will be you know potential areas uh, of interest? And with that, um, uh, this concludes my talk. Thank you for having me here today. Absolutely amazing. Thank you, Raquel. That was a wonderful talk. Very interesting. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of great questions uh, that I've got coming in from the chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and start to read them uh, from the top down. Uh, we'll start with Professor Angela Schulich, who wanted to know a couple of things that also struck me. So the first one was, um, the, for a task as complex as self-driving, is it really possible to summarize everything in a single loss? And many of your losses had multiple components. So how do you build a learning system that can actually balance these losses and satisfy them all? Uh, how, does, how does this work? Yeah, fantastic, fantastic question, right? Uh, whether it's a loss for supervised learning or whether it's a reward when we do a lot of the close, close loop RL stuff. Um, is, it's a very difficult question and it's also related to the question of, uh, or a very, very difficult task, and it's related to the question of what is the right metric, right? Which I think is the fundamental, you know, first question to answer. And uh, so there is many, many things to measure, right? Uh, safety related things like collision, there is things like um, comfort, you know, how uh, comfortable if somebody is in the self-driving vehicle, you know, the, the, the ride will be, um, how much progress you are doing versus just being like, you know, not making progress and just being in your park where the other losses will be great, right? Um, and fundamentally, it's a combination of these things and it's not necessarily a linear combination, right? Where as a human, if you think about how we value uh, you know, these this different things. Now it's important that you, you know, safety comes always first and that, you know, you guarantee safety before you go to confirm things like this. Um, so same idea for loss functions as uh, for metrics, right? Um, 
you know, we, we try to come up with the, you know, best combination of this. You can do things like curriculum learning so that the combination changes over time so that the system starts learning simple things and then goes to more and more and more complex. Uh, but it's definitely, a, you know, uh, an open question. Uh, how to measure progress and how to optimize for, uh, you know, having, having that progress. So something to look into more deeply, definitely. Yeah. Um, and a follow-up question from, from Angela before I move on. Uh, also very curious about, um, so, so many of the methods you're presenting were supervised. Um, and obviously the performance depends on, uh, you know, high quality data and, and uh, high quality mm -hmm. data at scale. And especially as you start talking about the more rare events, um, it seems like it's really difficult to get all the way there. So are you doing anything special at Wabi to collect more data or better data? How, how does that uh, how does Yeah, that work? yeah. Um, let's see how much I can say about what we do. About oh, right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I, I, can, I can give you some hints. Um, so yeah, the, for the neural motion planners, what you see here is, uh, is open loop training. Right, and okay. supervised in terms of the maneuver that the human did and a couple of bounding boxes and whatnot. Now we have, you know, the next uh, obvious step, right, is to do training in closed loop. And the simulator I show you, right, or similar simulators, I guess next generation that we are building, you can use to train the entire system. Now you can generate at scale red events, all sorts of things, and you don't need that supervision. Um, so that's that sort of you know, some of the things that you will see from from Wabi when when we may made them public. Yes, I see, I see. So so essentially building from the data you have to make such a realistic simulator that the gap is small enough that you can learn directly in the simulation. That's right. You can test, you can learn, you can generate everything. You can do adversarial stuff, and everything is real time. So you can do so many things, uh, given that fact. Uh, um, so that's yeah, sort of you know the. Um, I guess, at the core of, of what it Wonderful. And thank you for stepping around your NDAs. Much appreciated. Um, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, I have a neat question from Frank Imason. Um, so how can this approach tackle the problem of predicting accidents? It seems like this would be a hard thing to capture in, in say, training data. Um, yeah, great question. So um, I guess, um, as any supervised uh, learning approach, right? When, uh, you know, some of the stuff I show you today was supervised, right? So it's as good as the data that you're showing. Mm -hmm. And it can capture typically the assumption of machine learning is that the training and test distribution are similar. Now, um, if you don't have accidents or things like this in your training data, um, um, you know, the system generalizes somewhat in terms of the predictions, right? Um, however, um, if you you need to do you need to go one notch more than that, right? right? And and again, having a simulator enables you to generate all sorts of data of any of the situations that might arise. And and there is actually quite some interesting data out there of uh, the um, in terms of you know typical accidents etc. That you can use for your simulation, for example. Right, so you don't need to, you know, hallucinate everything from from the scratch. You can actually take particular intersections, and there, you know, police reports and things that uh, actually give you, you know, what was the behavior, what was the thing that actually happened in practice. Um, so that's that's sort of how you can see that you can become more robust. You can really train to deal with many more things that if it's just supervised learning. Right, instead of you know driving millions and millions and millions of miles in the real world. Yeah. We don't want to do that. We actually want to be much more targeted with the simulator. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, makes it challenging. Um, okay, so we have some fun questions. One from uh, v on the V2V section, and that was the first time I'd seen the V2V work, so very interesting. Thanks for that. Um, so one question was related to um, how the vehicles share their information. Are we assuming that all these self-driving cars would have synchronized clocks and be able to somehow uh, connect these, these different perspectives uh, on the fly over a wireless communication channel? Yeah, fantastic question. Uh, no, the assumption is, so it's asynchronous, uh, meaning that the data can arrive in any time. Now you can timestamp it so that you know when it was captured. 
And also, you we don't assume that it's perfect localization of the different vehicles because you're gonna have errors. So you're gonna send some information saying I'm in this position, but it's not exactly where you are, which is important for the spatially aware uh, gravimetric network. So we have ways to handle, uh, you know, robust, uh, robustly uh, time delays, and there is some experiments in the paper and a follow-up uh, call paper of uh, that we had last year, um, as well as we are looking um, into. The fact that you can communicate also gives you more vulnerabilities, right? Now someone yeah. can actually hack uh, messages or some of these vehicles. Um, so we also, um, I, guess, I think it was in January, we put up uh, an archive into how to be, uh, how to you know, study the vulnerabilities of such uh, B2B systems and how to build more robust uh, solutions. Yeah, fantastic yeah. question. So no way, in the real no. world, you, everything has to be, you have to deal with noise and it's everywhere. Absolutely, yeah, and that's just another example of one of those core root causes of the difficulty. Um, so Connor asks a similar question, so I thought I'd just follow on quickly. Um, did you explore central hubs for the V2V work, or is, is the V2V a, a requirement somehow of being able to deploy these systems? Yeah, um, yeah no, so V2V is not a requirement and it should never be. And mm -hmm. the reason why is that, um, you know, self-driving vehicle is a safety critical system. So it has to work all the time, regardless of whether your connection works, right? So by definition, B2B just enhances. And actually the system that I show you, when there is no other vehicle in the environment communicating, basically it's exactly the same as the original single vehicle system. So that's also important. Uh, Central Hub, no, so this was a distributed system. Every vehicle communicates to the medium. If there is someone around listening, good. If there is no one around, well, nobody will actually receive the data. Um, and the assumption for the experiments you show here is that we, um, I think we only send information for the 50 to 80 meters. Uh, I don't remember exactly, so, something like that. Um, now these are assumptions that you can, you can change. You can do peer to peer and you can do more sophisticated stuff if you do peer to peer, uh, but then you will need more bandwidth. Excellent. Okay, the questions continue to roll in. We are running a little over time, so I'll try to pick a few more and then we'll wrap up. Um, so apologies to those whose questions I can't ask, but uh, from Brandon Wagstaff, we have uh, in the simulation environment, is it possible to adversarially perturb the simulation in order to better account for edge cases that may arise in the real world? Yeah, fantastic question. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, so there's a CBPR paper we are presenting, I guess, next week, uh, precisely how to do that, uh, where we look at physically realizable perturbations of the scenarios. Uh, such that um, you basically have high probability of failure for any software stack. Uh, so there's some nice experiments also into attacking many different software stacks and how um, you can actually see that uh, inform you can actually utilize this to have more robust solutions if you retrain with the adversarial scenarios and how you can create adversarial scenarios for a particular software stack and it helps other software stacks that are very different. Uh, so there's a lot of you know, quite some interesting findings. So I, we call it adversarial sim. Uh, so I strongly recommend uh, having a look at that, uh, that paper. Excellent. All right. So there's a direct response there. Go read the paper. Um, wonderful. Um, so another one. Uh, so how do you simulate the RGBD, uh, sorry, RGB cameras if the planners uh, gives you a different path with respect to the recorded data? So do you completely generate the new views or are you inserting objects and trying to blend them with the scene? Yeah, yeah, fantastic question. So in, in the videos I show you uh, was uh, what we call actor injection, which is uh, we actually add objects to raw video. Now you need to modify more than the actor because there's shadows and other things, right? Um, but you don't really necessarily modify everything in the scene. Uh, there is some other work we've done, uh, which we haven't made public, and I don't think it will unfortunately ever be uh, be able, I will be able to show it uh, given some things that happen in between. <laughs> but uh, we can actually uh, generate uh, arbitrary views and things like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is, there is some work we have done in this, uh, in this domain and uh, you know, I will show next generation Wabi uh, when ready to be shown public. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, and one last question from uh, Animesh Garg. Um, so this is a more broad question and maybe one that impacts a lot of us researchers. So how does the uh, ongoing research play with the commercial enterprise? 
uh, in a capital intensive business like self-driving, uh, would you say that Wabi will be actively involved in continuing to publish all of its research as you did in the past? hundred percent, yes. Uh, wow. Oh, well, that's great. Yes. Uh, I mean, at, at ATG was already the case that a lot of the technology we show was a production technology that, that we put into production. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I believe is very important is transparency and accountability showing what works, what doesn't, what this technology is, et cetera. So I intend to, you know, for Wabi to lead in the industry. So we, we will continue to showcase uh, all the, most of the stuff, you know, all of the stuff that we do. So absolutely, yes. Wonderful. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna close the questions. Thank you so much, Raquel, that was absolutely wonderful. Anyone who wants to feel free to unmute and we'll give a quick round of applause to Raquel for an absolutely wonderful keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next session. We're um, uh, just, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Ken Schultz. Uh, so he's the general manager of uh, eScript, which is uh, a Canadian uh, company and subsidiary of Bosch. Uh, they're a leading supplier of uh, IT security solutions and services in uh, the automotive security and automotive manufacturing uh, space. And they specialize in connected and autonomous vehicles with a focus on V2X. Um, security products. So this might be a, a wonderful segue uh, to talk. He's going to introduce uh, the company a little bit and then uh, talk a little bit further afterwards. So we'll start with the video and then Ken will take over from there. Unfortunately, I don't hear any sound. Do we want to try that again? Hi, uh, Kimberly, is that you? Do you want to just pause the video for a second? And maybe we can restart with sound. We're not hearing your sound. You have to turn on the computer audio. Uh-oh. We still don't hear it. First technical difficulty. We made it already two and a half hours without any. That's pretty good so far. Um, so just, yeah, you'll have to stop and reshare and then share. There's a button that displays uh, uh, um, uh, computer audio or something when you're doing the screen share. Apologies, everyone. We'll just take a second. Nope, we still can't hear on the Zoom controls. All right. Uh, nope, we still don't hear it. Okay. Yeah, thanks everyone who's helping with the, the comments. So Kimberly, we'll just get you to stop sharing and then we'll step through the process again to turn the sound on. Awesome. So when you uh, do the screen share, there should be a button in the bottom left that says turn on computer audio or we use computer audio. Yep, yeah, that'll be in Zoom when you do the screen share in Zoom. Okay. Should be an option in more. Share sound in the toolbar. Okay, let's try that.
All right. There we go. Thank you. To make the dream of connected automated mobility come true, IT security needs a new dimension. As vehicles become increasingly connected, the risk of cyber attacks grows, threatening the safety of all road users. New high-performance vehicle architectures need innovative protection, and international regulations make automotive cybersecurity a prerequisite for type approval. Escript is leading the way, creating solutions today for the challenges of tomorrow. With more than 400 associates at 19 locations worldwide, Escript develops and markets pioneering products and services in IT security. In the automotive sector and beyond, millions of Escript solutions are currently in use around the globe. True cybersecurity runs through a technology's every fiber. It takes humans into account and is effective over the long term. Everything Escript does is guided by one central idea, the holistic protection of vehicles throughout their entire life cycle. Escript's IT security solutions address every aspect of a multi-layer vehicle security concept. From hardware-based IT security functions on ECU microcontrollers, to securing the vehicle's internal network and onboard communication, to security for V2X communication, we secure the connected world. Awesome. Okay. Well, this is part of the fun of having a uh, workshop is getting to find out about all these great companies in Canada that are working on autonomous driving. So with that, I'll pass it over to Ken, who wanted to say a few more words about Escript. Uh, script sorry. That's great. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, and uh, thank you, Kimberly, for your support and for everybody for bearing with us uh, through that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk briefly about Escript. Uh, as Steve already mentioned, I'm the general manager of Escript Canada. Uh, we're located in Waterloo, just steps away from the University of Waterloo campus. We were founded in 2016, and we currently have 32 employees. Here in Waterloo, we are Escript's global center for uh, V2X product, and that includes uh, functions uh, of product management, product engineering, and consulting. On the product engineering side, we have software development both for embedded and for backend or the public key infrastructure functionality. Uh, we also have a second full engineering team with expertise in vehicular embedded hardware security modules, and we're committed to workforce diversity. Next slide, please. So I'd like to invite everyone tonight uh, to attend tonight's uh, networking event on spatial chat. Um, I'm going to be there with a couple of my colleagues from Escript and we'll be hanging around in our room to uh, answer any questions that you might have and provide greater detail about what we do. I talk to you about career opportunities at Escript and uh, answer questions that you may have about what it's like to work here. Uh, but on, not only that, I'll be accompanied by uh, a colleagues from a couple of other teams uh, at our parent company, Bosch and that is within the Automated Driving Group and Bosch Canada. So we'll all be there, uh, happy to talk to you about career opportunities and give you greater detail about we do, what uh, we do, and uh, very much looking forward to having you join us this evening. Thanks again for the opportunity. Wonderful, thanks, Ken. Um, and yes, I wanna echo that call. Please do come to the spatial chat. We'll have a lot of fun there. There'll be lots of different people to talk to, including Escript and Bosch. Um, so we're going to take a short break here. It's our first one, uh, high time, um, and we're now just a little bit behind schedule. Uh, thanks, I think, to all those great questions we had on Raquel's talk, which is uh, uh, the reason we're here. Um, so let's, um, let's reconvene in about five minutes. So we'll start the student presentations at 2.45 and we'll end up likely going a little bit over on the overall day, but not too bad. Okay, so we'll see you back here in about five minutes uh, at 2.45.
Okay, I guess uh, we're on schedule. So welcome back. Uh, it's 2.45. Um, so now we get to start uh, our first of two student panels um, and uh, presentation sessions. And we'll do them very much in the same way that we did the uh, faculty. Um, and so uh, really excited. This We, we used this at uh, the Computer and Robot Vision Conference um, uh, this year, and it was really successful with this sort of group question asking. It feels like a lot more interactive, works well in the virtual uh, setting. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we'll launch into our first three talks uh, and very excited to introduce Sefer Samavi, who's uh, um, done some fascinating work uh, from English Julix Lab. Um, so he'll be talking today about um, accounting for unpredictability in autonomous driving, a rather fitting talk to follow the great work we've seen so far. Um, so with that, take it away, Sefer. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Sefer Samavi. And uh, so let's just get right to it. Um, so autonomous vehicles face difficulty interacting with other drivers. For example, in this video, you can see Waymo's robo-taxi indicating its intent to change lanes, but having difficulty negotiating a lane change with adjacent cars. As AVs start to be deployed on roads with human-driven cars, generating human-like behavior is required for seamless interactions. In fact, Unhuman-like behavior, even when conservative, can sacrifice safety. It was reported that in 2018 in California, humans rear-ended AVs on 28 occasions. Here's a high-level overview of the typical modular AV autonomy stack. So let's say our AV here uses um, localization and object detection information to perceive the environment and uh, eventually to predict how the environment is going to evolve in the near future. Based on these predictions, the motion planner plans a safe trajectory for the AV to follow. Finally, some low-level controllers provide actuation inputs for the AV to carry out the plan. The focus of this project is to incorporate a measure of performance of the prediction model, which we call unpredictability, into motion planning to achieve human-like driving. Concretely, we hypothesize that human drivers take into account unpredictable or erratic behavior by surrounding vehicles and react accordingly. Therefore, we argue that unpredictability should be taken into account by the motion planner in an autonomous vehicle to achieve human-like driving. We use human lane change trajectory data to learn two trajectory generation models using inverse reinforcement learning or IRL. The first model is a baseline for generating lane change trajectories. And the second model is augmented with an unpredictability measure based on a prediction model. If the trajectories generated by model two are more similar to the human data, then accounting for unpredictability results in human-like behavior. Our key intuition here is that as time progresses, the future becomes the past. Thus, for our prediction model, we gain access to a ground truth for evaluating model performance, which we can then incorporate into motion planning. So what is inverse reinforcement learning? We're given trajectories of states and actions that demonstrate some task, and we assume we know the dynamics. We also assume that these trajectories were obtained by approximately following an optimal policy. Our goal is to recover the reward function. Let's say the reward function takes this particular form of a linear combination of a set of features phi, where each phi is a nonlinear equation of the states and actions and specifies a different subcomponent of the task, and it's known a priori. We use theta as relative weights of these features to parametrize our reward function. We use a maximum entropy approach to cast IRL into a probabilistic framework and obtain a maximum likelihood estimate of the vector theta based on some demonstration data. In the case of known deterministic dynamics, the distribution simplifies to this Boltzmann type. And since we know the dynamics, the states x can be recovered by the inputs u. We can get rid of x from our equation. The denominator is a sum of the exponential of the rewards over all dynamically feasible trajectories. And it's also known as the partition function. And it's intractable to calculate. So following Levine and Colton's formulation, we conduct a second order Taylor approximation of the reward function around each demonstration trajectory. We end up with a Gaussian integral that we can solve to get an approximation of the probability distribution. 
Then we take the logarithm to end up with a log likelihood function. And we can take the gradient with respect to the parameters theta to be able to use any gradient-based optimizer to recover our vector of parameters, and thus our reward function. So here are the features that make up the baseline reward function for lane changes. Remember the structure of the reward function where we design phi and learn theta. The first feature accounts for lateral deviation from the target lane. The maximum reward is achieved when the ego vehicle is in the center of the target lane. The second feature is the deviation from the speed of surrounding traffic, VD. Maximum reward is achieved when going the same speed. We also introduce a cost for high angular velocities with the vehicle being encouraged to go straight. The final baseline feature deals with Euclidean distance from adjacent vehicles. For this feature, the maximum reward can be attained when the vehicle is a desired distance ddes away from each adjacent vehicle. We base ddes on some minimum distance from uh, the other cars and a headway time based on the velocity of the ego vehicle. Now to the additional unpredictability feature that we'll incorporate into the second model only. We first define an unpredictability metric. We use an off-the-shelf uh, vehicle trajectory prediction model called convolutional social pooling by Deo et al. that predicts uh, trajectories in the future based on history on uh, highways. We track the prediction quality through time. So the metric is as shown in the diagram on the right. We're looking at one car here, car I. K is the current time step, and you can see the location of the car at time K over here. Um, Tn is some amount of time we look to the past, and you can see the location of the car at time k minus tn over here. The dotted lines are the predictions made at time k minus tn, and the ghost car is where we thought the car would be based on the prediction. Then, the unpredictability measure that we define is the average Euclidean error between the prediction at time k minus tn and what ha actually happened until current time k. We incorporate this measure into an unpredictability weighted distance to adjacent vehicles feature. This feature is nearly identical to the distance to adjacent vehicles baseline feature, but the minimum distance dmin is scaled exponentially as the unpredictability of the adjacent vehicle increases. The intuition behind this design is that you should stay away from unpredictable cars. With that reward function structure, here's what we need for the demonstration trajectory data. We extracted lane changes from the two highways of the NGSIM dataset. You can see the lane change animated on the right, uh, where the ego vehicle, which is the thick blue line, is going from the black dashed line initial lane to the red dashed line target lane. We used the kinematic unicycle model for the dynamics of the ego vehicle, and we extracted four adjacent vehicles you can see the adjacent vehicles as the thinner moving lines in the animation, um, along with their predictions, which are the colorful dots, and the actual features, which are the crosses. A delayed difference between the dots and the crosses is what defines our unpredictability metric. So here's a block diagram of the experiment we're going to run. First, using the same trajectory data, we conduct IRL, both with the model that uses just the baseline features um, in gray in the block diagram, and with the model that incorporates addition, the additional unpredictability feature, um, which is the white block. We recover two sets of parameters. Then we independently conduct forward optimal control with the learned uh, weights to obtain a set of optimal trajectories under each of the two models. Finally, we compare the optimal trajectories from each model with the expert trajectories using mean Euclidean error, or MEE. Then we calculate any improvement in the mean Euclidean error for the model that incorporates unpredictability. You can see quantitative results on the training on training data sets that were sorted based on highway geometry around the lane change and traffic congestion level at the time of the lane change. In the table, we can find the average MEE between the trajectories of the baseline model and the model that incorporates unpredictability. On average, we show improvements by incorporating unpredictability across the board, meaning that we have more human-like driving. 
We also conducted the experiment on all the trajectories from the two highways together, as well as um, the, the two highways separately, so IAD and USA 101, as well as both of them combined. We present the results on the training data set in the top table and on a held out test data set in the bottom table. For the held out test data set, we only conducted optimal control. Um, so these trajectories were not included in the training of the prediction model or in the IRL training. For the USA 101 data set, we can see a roughly 5% improvement on the training data set and a roughly 10% improvement in the held out test data set. We note that the improvement on the test data set is higher. And I think this is because the prediction model wasn't trained on the trajectories in the test data set. And so its predictions show more variance and end up providing more information about the unpredictable behavior of the adjacent cars, resulting in more human-like driving. Here we animate the behavior of one of the examples, and we can see the model that incorporates unpredictability, which is in green, uh, seems to be behaving more cautiously and is slower to change lanes. Um, and in case it's hard to pick up over Zoom in the video, um, we also plot the uh, velocity. And, and you can see that the green, which is the model that incorporates unpredictability, is much closer to the expert, which is in blue. Um, and future work on this topic includes investigating the effect of unpredictability on other trajectory data sets, such as HiD and interaction. Um, and we could also use feature construction approaches to learn new features that incorporate unpredictability rather than designing them a priori. Um, and we could use deep learning to do that. Um, with that, thanks for listening. And I'd be happy to take some questions in the question time. Awesome. Thanks, Ever. That was wonderful. OK, we'll keep moving right along. So our next speaker is uh, Keenan Burnett, who's uh, being supervised by professors Tim Barfoot and Angela Schulich. Uh, Keenan is, uh, of course, the former AU Toronto team lead uh, for the first two years, um, and he's uh, stayed around for a PhD. Um, so I uh, look forward to hearing about his work on radar-based navigation. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Right, yes, so uh, my name is Keenan. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto, co-supervised by Angla Schulig and Tim Barfoot. In this talk, I'm going to cover some of the recent work we've been doing in radar-based navigation. Over the last few years, I've had the opportunity to be a part of Toronto, our student-led self-driving car team. And while we've made some progress in getting our autonomous vehicle to drive in ideal conditions, such as the sunny weather in Yuma, Arizona, we have had some difficulties when testing our vehicle in inclement weather conditions, such as rain and snow. There are several different approaches to tackling adverse weather. However, the approach that we're most interested in is how to apply radar sensors to allow self-driving vehicles to operate in conditions where cameras and LIDAR might struggle. Towards this end, we have built a new data-taking platform named Boreas, which includes state-of-the-art LIDAR and radar sensors. The left-hand side of the slide shows a picture of Boreas on a snowy day, and the picture on the right shows what the radar data looks like from a bird's eye view perspective. In this video, you can see what Boreas' sensor data looks like during a snowstorm. On the left-hand side, we have the camera data, on the top right, we have the radar data, and below that, we have the LiDAR data with the car in the middle. Notice that the LiDAR plunk cloud becomes littered with detections associate, associated with snowflakes. However, the radar data appears unperturbed. Now notice what the LiDAR data looks like in the absence of snow here. It's much cleaner. However, the radar data looks almost the same. The NAVTEC sensor is a spinning mechanical radar which makes use of frequency modulated continuous wave radar technology. The sensor spins at a rate of 4 hertz and provides 400 measurements per rotation, resulting in an angular resolution of 0.9 degrees. The sensor could be configured to have a range between 150 and 500 meters, with a corresponding range resolution between 4.4 and 17.5 centimeters. Each measurement consists of a power range spectrum, corresponding to the intensity of the received signal at each range bin. These measurements together form a polar radar image, as seen on the top right. For many of our algorithms, we prefer to work with a bird's eye view representation, which can be created by warping the polar image. So far, existing works have made significant progress in applying odometry, in applying radar to odometry and place recognition. However, these works have so far ignored the impact of motion distortion and Doppler effects on radar-based navigation. The radar sensor that we have rotates in order to provide 360 degree coverage around the vehicle. Figure A shows what this looks like when the vehicle is stationary. So when the vehicle is moving, the range measurements become distorted in a spiral fashion, as seen in figure B. 
Radar sensors of this type calculate range by measuring the difference in frequency between the received and transmitted signals. However, when the vehicle is moving, the relative velocity between the sensor and its surrounding environment causes the received frequency to be altered according to the Doppler effect. An increase in the received frequency causes the apparent range of targets to decrease. Our approach, which we recently presented at ICRA, is to use a motion compensated estimator to calculate the linear and angular velocity of the sensor directly. We can then remove the motion distortion and Doppler effects from the radar scans. In this video, we demonstrate the performance of our handcrafted radar odometry pipeline on data taken using our own platform. On the top, we have our camera data as a reference, and on the bottom left, we have the inliers of our estimator, with red and green being the colors for subsequent scans. On the bottom right, we are plotting our estimator's path in blue against the ground truth shown in black. In this case, we're using a handcrafted feature detector, and we use the timestamp of each measurement to do motion compensation. The main thing to note here is that we are able to estimate the ego motion with a relatively high degree of fidelity using only the radar data. So this estimate that you're seeing of the vehicle's motion is not using any GPS or IMU information. More recently, we have been working on an unsupervised radar odometry pipeline that is based on the exactly sparse Gaussian variational inference framework by Barfoot et al. Now, before we proceed, it's good to take a step back and ask ourselves a couple of questions. The first is, why do we need deep learning here, and why can't we just use the handcrafted algorithms, since they seem to be working fairly well? Now, our answer here is that radar is actually a fairly challenging sensor to work with. It's quite noisy. So our hypothesis here is that there are going to be some corner cases where learning-based methods are going to be able to outperform handcrafted ones. Second, we would like to be able to automatically learn key point detectors that can at least match the performance of handcrafted ones, since this would save us a lot of engineering time and effort. Our second question is, why are we doing this unsupervised? A lot of deep learning algorithms today are heavily reliant on large, carefully created datasets. These datasets are time consuming and expensive to generate. Our motivation here is that we want to reduce or completely eliminate our reliance on ground truth. In this diagram on the right, we have our pose graph illustrating the architecture of our algorithm known as HERO. In this diagram, X is the state, which encodes the position and velocity of the vehicle, Z is the data, which in this case are the radar measurements, and theta are the parameters of the deep neural network. So radar is first fed into a DNN, and the output is a list of key point locations along with the associated descriptors and covariances. These are represented by the stars in the diagram. During the forward pass of the network, we hold the DNN parameters fixed and extract these key points from the radar data. We then match them in a differentiable fashion to create measurement factors, which are shown as phi m in the diagram. We can then estimate the most likely trajectory given those measurements using a non-differentiable estimator. Then during the backward pass, we hold this estimated trajectory fixed and use it as a training signal to backpropagate and update the parameters for the deep neural network. For more details on this approach, I encourage you all to attend David Yoon's talk tomorrow. David and I have co-authored a paper on this work and we'll be presenting it at RSS next month. Okay, so here we have our DNN architecture for this project. The main thing to note here is that we're using a UNET style convolutional encoder multi-decoder with two heads, a detector score and a weight score. The detector score can be thought of as encoding the feature locations, and the weight score can be thought of as encoding the uncertainty in those feature locations. We then divide the detector score into a series of grid cells, and for each grid cell, we perform a spatial softmax operation to extract a single key point location. We then perform a masking operation to remove key points from empty regions of the radar scan. Given the remaining key point locations, we then perform a bilinear sampling operation to extract a descriptor and covariance for each key point. And finally, we convert those key point locations into metric space to form the final output of the network. All right, so then in this slide here, we have the results of our unsupervised radar odometry pipeline plotted in blue alongside the ground truth, which is shown in black. Note here again that we do a good job of staying close to the ground truth, even though we are only using the radar data. The table on the right summarizes our quantitative results and compares our performance against our earlier work, which uses MC Ransack. The table also includes the results for the current state of the art, CFIR, which is a handcrafted algorithm. We also present the results for another learning-based algorithm under the radar, which was previously the best learning-based point radar odometry algorithm. 
Our results remain quite competitive with the state of the art while being learning based and not requiring any ground truth for training. In this slide, we have four examples of what the learned key points output by Hero look like. The red dots are the key point locations, and the yellow ellipses correspond to the five sigma uncertainty bounds estimated by the DNN. What separates our approach from others is that ours is able to estimate the uncertainty in key point locations and handle out of distribution samples while having a front end that is completely trainable end to end. Now, in terms of our future work, uh, as I said before, we will be presenting our paper on unsupervised radar odometry at the upcoming RSS conference. We are also interested in moving on from the odometry problem towards full mapping and localization. In addition, we have been working on building a new data set, which we hope to make publicly available in the next year. Uh, and then lastly, all the code with the further, further projects that you've seen in this talk so far is open source and can be found using the links below. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Keenan. That was really interesting uh, and nice to see the work progressing. Um, okay, so we'll go on to our next speaker. This is my student, uh, Ali Harke, who is actually doing his final oral examination on Thursday of this week. So he's got a busy speaking week. Um, yep. And he'll be talking to you. <laughs> I hope he's ready. Uh, and he'll be talking to you about probabilistic object detection for autonomous driving. Uh, all right. Uh, can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending my talk. Today, I will be talking about probabilistic object detectors in autonomous driving. The goal of this talk is uh, to provide a tutorial style introduction to probabilistic object detection. So I will be introducing probabilistic object detection, explaining why it is important, and providing some insights I discovered during my PhD on how to effectively design these detectors. Let us begin by understanding what is probabilistic object detection. Object detection is concerned with estimating the category and the bounding box of every object in the scene. Probabilistic object detection, on the other hand, is concerned with probability distributions over these estimates. Specifically, we, we are given a data set D, sampled from a data generating distribution P star. Here, X is the input, Z is the bounding box and Y is the category. And we want to fit a parametric model, P of theta, to best approximate P star. We assume that our category Y follows a categorical distribution and our bounding box Z follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Now this Gaussian distribution is parameterized by the mean mu, which is the bounding box and a covariance matrix, which we will be showing as error ellipses around the corners. Simply put, the task of probabilistic object detection is to estimate the parameters of these two distributions using deep neural networks. Now, why is probabilistic object detection important for self-driving cars? In a self-driving car, the output of object detectors is usually provided as input to higher level decision-making procedures. When using standard detectors, their deterministic output prevents subsequent models from quantifying how much this output is to be trusted. Simply put, subsequent models in a, pre a perception and prediction stack uh, speak the language of probability. We need detectors that speak this language so that subsequent models can optimally make decisions based on the output of our object detectors. In addition, deterministic perception stacks can lead to devastating results in the real world. A concrete example is the failure of a deterministic perception module of the Tesla Model 3 to distinguish between the white side of a trailer and the bright sky. This led to the first fatality due to an assisted driving system in January 2017. If the utilized perception module had provided probability distributions with high uncertainty in distinguishing between the sky and a vehicle, then the uh, higher level decision-making systems could have used this uncertainty to alert the user to take over control or, or, or to take control over the steering. Now that we established that probabilistic object detectors are important, how can we design these detectors? Keeping up with my language analogy, not any random permutation of words make a useful sentence. Similarly, not any predictive probability distribution is useful. For distributions to be useful, a predictor should output low entropy or low uncertainty when it makes a small mistakes 
and high entropy, high uncertainty when a prediction makes when a predictor makes large mistakes. This is important as low uncertainty for uh, for, for incorrect predictions can lead to non-optimal decision making in tasks such as prediction and planning. While high uncertainty for correct predictions can lead to underutilized informations information in tasks such as sensor fusion. Now, to build probabilistic object detectors with very little computational overhead, the process in literature goes as follows. We begin by choosing a deterministic object detector. We use the softmax output to model categorical distributions, and we extend the, network, the detector with an output layer, which we refer to as a variance network, that is trained with the negative log likelihood to output bounding box covariance matrices. My research for the past year has led to us discovering some problematic issues with this design process. Let us first look at the negative log likelihood. The negative log likelihood is the negative log of the probability, evaluated by plugging in the ground truth target into our predicted distribution. The lower the negative log likelihood, the better our probability distribution models our ground truth target. Now, given two distributions with the same mean estimate, but one has a high variance and one has a low variance, which would be preferred by the negative log likelihood. We found out that the negative log likelihood prefers the distribution with the large variance. This is since the negative log of the probability is evaluated at the ground truth target shown in green here. So if you have lower probability at that ground truth target, that means that your negative log likelihood will be uh, much higher. To resolve this problem, we introduced the energy score as a loss function to train variance networks. Now, the energy score acts in an opposite manner to the negative log likelihood. The energy score prefers low variance distributions that have a close mean to the ground truth target. This is because the energy score rewards distributions that assign a high probability mass near this target, even if the probability mass assigned at the target is not that high. In context of object detection, the energy score would prefer covariance matrices that are, uh, that are tight around the mean, even if it means little probability is assigned exactly at uh, the ground truth target. The negative log likelihood cannot do that. It needs to, uh, uh, to increase the variance to cover the ground truth target, and we end up with much larger uh, entropy uh, or distributions or much la larger uncertainty distributions. This property is not just theoretical. We verify it with extensive quantitative experiments, and we also show it qualitatively. Looking at the results from detectors trained with the negative log likelihood, we see that distributions are generated with a much higher variance, even though uh, the bounding box estimates are close to the ground truth here shown in, in green. So even though we have correct uh, mean estimates, our entropy or our uncertainty is very high. The energy score doesn't seem to suffer from this problem. Now that we have clarified some issues with common loss functions, we shift our attention to the deterministic detector itself. We ask ourselves, if any will any deterministic detector chosen be a good uh, backend for variance networks? The answer is no. Remember that a probabilistic detector should output low entropy when it makes small mistakes and high entropy distributions when it makes large mistakes. We plot the magnitude of uncertainty or the magnitude of entropy versus the mistakes on the x-axis here, the mistakes made by a detector. We notice that only one of our three chosen deterministic backends provide the trend that we would like to see, which is high entropy for, uh, or high uncertainty for large mistakes and a low uh, uncertainty for small mistakes. We see that this phenomenon is related to what the deterministic backend sees during training. We plot the magnitude of mistake, the distribution of the magnitude of mistakes seen during training. We observe that detectors that do not see many large mistakes during training fail to provide high entropy for these mistakes. In fact, we see that detectors are only able to provide a desirable profile of entropy in the small range that they, where they observe uh, data during training. As a conclusion, we need to be careful when choosing which deterministic backend to use when designing probabilistic object detectors. 
Uh, as a summary of this talk, I wanted to convey that extending deterministic backends with variance networks for outputting probability distributions require some special considerations. We need to make sure that the loss function provides good distributions and that deterministic backends observe a wide range of errors during training. Now, adequate here, which I used in this slide, is a very vague word. So if you're interested in a much more detailed explanation, here is a link to our work on the topic published in iClear 2021, as well as a code base that we deal developed to get you started. Now, thank you for listening, and I hope you found this talk beneficial. Wonderful, thank you, Ali. Uh, always interesting to hear. Um, great, okay, so now we'll move on to our last speaker of the session, and apologies, um, here we go. So this is uh, Chris McKinnon. So he's also joining us from Professor Angela Schulich's lab. Uh, so Chris, go ahead and share. He's gonna talk to us about uh, his work in meta learning, looking forward to it. All right, can you see my slide? We do, yes. Perfect, uh, okay. So yeah, I'm Chris from the Dynamic Systems Lab, and this talk will cover a recent result on meta-learning with paired forward and inverse models for efficient receding horizon control. So modern control tasks are bringing robots out of control environments like industrial manufacturing and uh, into a wide range of conditions, like some examples of which from autonomous driving, sorry, autonomous driving are shown on the right. Um, so this brings to light a number of key factors that we must consider from a controls perspective. So first, safety is really important because uh, robots are exiting environments designed for their exclusive use. And one way of dealing with this in the literature is to use state constraints to um, prevent robots from colliding with objects in their environment. Uh, the variety of conditions that robots will now encounter makes it hard to anticipate what their dynamics are ahead of time uh, which means that the controllers should deal with uncertain and changing dynamics. Finally, the changes a robot can, uh, or an AV can, can experience may repeat. Uh, for instance, caused by different weather conditions, uh, loaded configurations, or uh, different tires fixed to the vehicle. And we may have prior knowledge from more than one of these. So um, there may be, this may induce basically multiple modes for robot dynamics. Uh, and it helps if we can incorporate prior knowledge from more than one. So to study this, I used this robot here. Uh, and our goal was to follow a geometric path accurately and reliably despite unknown changes in dynamics. Um, the control framework that I used is called Stochastic Model Predictive Control. And Model Predictive Control, or MPC, has emerged as a prime controls approach for modern control tasks, particularly ones involving systems with constraints where safety is a key concern. So all flavors of MPC um, leverage future information about a task in the form of model-based predictions, uh, which sets it, sets it apart from uh, feedback control, which neglects this information. Um, stochastic and robust MPC can handle constraints in the presence of model uncertainty, uh, which is really important because they will we'll, we'll have that. Um, stochastic MPC is a little less conservative than robust MPC because it doesn't always consider the very worst case scenario. So um, I'll use that uh, for, for this uh, example. Um, so to understand what's important for stochastic model predictive control, um, let's consider a robot performing a path following task as shown here. Um, so we have a robot following a reference path with some maybe bounds on the tracking error that, that are acceptable. And um, the desired behavior for SMPC is defined in terms of a cost function, which depends on the predicted mean of future states and uh, maybe the control inputs. So the controller basically chooses a sequence of inputs to minimize a cost over a prediction horizon. And safety is defined in terms of state and input constraints. Uh, and this depends on the predicted distribution of future states. So uh, safety in this case, as Angle mentioned earlier, is basically keeping the shaded region, which might correspond to, let's say, the two sigma bounds um, inside the, the state constraints. And that gives us some margin on safety error. So in case our model is wrong, we uh, won't violate the constraints with high probability. And the key here is that these quantities, all the predictions depend on a dynamics model. So if we want to achieve the desired behavior safely, we need to have a good dynamics model. So that's what this, uh, this work is all about. And what's really important when we learn this from data is the computational cost of the model because the dynamics model is evaluated much more often than the, the input is applied to the system. Um, so if we take our example again, and we say that the, let's say that the prediction horizon is discretized with 30 time steps. So that's like 30 times that we have to evaluate the dynamics model for, for one rollout. Uh, we may have to do multiple iterations of our solver. So 
there we go, evaluating the dynamics model now 90 times. And we may want to repeat this process at 10 hertz. So uh, our 10 hertz control loop means that we have to evaluate the dynamics model at 900 times per second. So if we um, learn the model directly, this places a real limitation on how expressive it can be, uh, because expressive models generally tend to be more computationally expensive. So instead of doing that, um, what this paper is about is combining two key ingredients. So first, um, on the left, um, as models get sort of more expressive, they tend to get less computationally efficient. And what we're going to try and do to address this is use paired forward and inverse models to move the computationally expensive component of the model out of SNPC. So that's going to try and go from there to there. Um, second, as models get more expressive, they tend to get less data efficient. And this basically means that as you have more parameters to fit, so you can fit the data better, you need more data to um, fit that uh, function approximator. And meta-learning is the recent trend in the literature that tries to get around this. And one way it does that is, for example, learning a set of basis functions offline that enable fast adaptation to change online. So the online thing is linear regression, which is data efficient, but you still get to use expressive basis functions. So we're going to combine these two things. And the architecture is as follows. Um, so we assume that the system dynamics are, uh, are what's on the left. And we partition the state into two different components. So one component, S, have, has known dynamics, and another component, Xz, has unknown dynamics. So you can think of S as position and Xz as velocity. So if we know velocity, we just integrate to get position, so there's not a whole lot to learn here. But we may not know how our control input u affects the uh, acceleration of the system. So we assume the unknown dynamics are a linear combination of an unknown function q that depends on the input and the state, and a known function phi, or a set of basis functions phi, which only depend on the state. Um, w here is a weight that changes the contribution of each of these factors. And eta is additive Gaussian noise that represents model uncertainty. So in an offline learning phase, we learn an, a function approximator f for the unknown dynamics. And the output of that is called uh, the input feature xz.f. We also learn an inverse that converts the value of the input feature into a control input that we can apply to the system. So what this lets us do uh, is these blocks actually live outside of the SMPC optimization. So in our previous example, they're only evaluated at 10 hertz, which is good because we can make them, that means that we can make them uh, computationally expensive and increase their expressiveness. The model used in SMPC is then what's shown on the right. So we take that input feature and we essentially replace the unknown dynamics use it with it. So the controller will now optimize the value of this input feature instead of the original control input. So we're not evaluating F. Um, that makes it computationally efficient to evaluate at a higher rate. To adapt to changes online, uh, because we don't necessarily know the conditions ahead of time, uh, we're going to use Bayesian linear regression to learn the weights and the variance of the additive Gaussian noise online. Um, to evaluate our, our method, we uh, use the following, we use the clear path Grizzly um, and compared four variants of the model. So they differed in whether or not we use a learned input feature and whether or not we adapt the linear model parameters online. So the first method, uh, BLR, stands for Bayesian Linear Regression, and we're only adapting the linear model parameters online. Uh, we use the control input directly here, which is a special case when that function approximator f is identity and only depends on the control input. The second method, DNN, parameterizes the uh, input feature model as a deep neural network. Uh, and we, so we, you do this offline learning, but we keep the linear model parameters fixed. The third method combines both of these ways of learning. Uh, and then the fourth method does online input feature selection. So it simultaneously fits BLR and BLR DNN to uh, data from operating the robot in the relevant conditions, and then switches to whichever one um, explains the dynamics the best. Uh, the key result uh, from the paper is shown here. So on the y-axis is the cumulative cost to traverse the path. So lower is better. And we compare the performance using each method for three traversals of a path, which are uh, each dots. And what we found is that going from BLR to BLR DNN, uh, we are adding a learned input feature, which happens offline. And we see a consistent improvement in performance. Going from DNN to BLR DNN, we are adding the learning of the um, linear model parameters online. So both of these things help to improve performance. Um, finally, um, we can use online input feature selection to recover the performance of uh, the best performing input feature model pair. So if you have you know, prior knowledge and you can train multiple input feature models from different scenarios, you can 
uh, do that ahead of time and then automatically switch to the best one online. Um, the, another important factor here is that the learned input feature adds only a small amount of computation to the control loop and that this amount is uh, independent of the prediction horizon, which is good because we want long prediction horizons in SMPC. So in summary, we use paired forward and inverse models with meta learning to improve close up performance. Uh, so the paired forward and inverse models are to get computational efficiency at the same time as using an expressive model. And the meta learning is to get data efficiency at the same time as using an expressive model. Uh, and this actually makes a difference in, in certain cases. So um, thanks. And you can check out the paper or other results from our lab uh, at the following URL. So that's it. Um, and I think that brings us to question period. It does indeed. Thank you so much, Chris. Wonderful talks. And and just before we even get started with questions, I just want to say those are an amazing set of talks from the four students. Uh, so thank you all for putting in such a great effort and, and representing your work so clearly. Um, okay, so I have a few questions. Um, please continue to post them in the chat, um, and I'll uh, I'll start from the top of the list here. Um, so the first question was uh, for uh, Keenan. Um, do you? Oh, uh, sorry, from Keenan actually, not for Keenan. This was from Keenan for Sepper, and it was: Do you see foresee issues uh, with using a static set of weights for your reward function? Has there been any research into weights that depend on the scene context? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I guess uh, these weights do definitely have limitations in terms of how uh, you get to use them, um, especially because they have so many hyperparameters in the a priori designed uh, reward features. Um, I think it's important to mention that the point of this project was to kind of evaluate um, and interpret um, whether one of these features, which was the one that incorporated unpredictability, would have an effect on, um, would result in more human-like behavior. And so uh, that's why it, it has some of these uh, limitations, the algorithm that we use. But I think um, I... I haven't read any research specifically that alters the weights over uh, kind of based on context, but certainly it would like usually researchers would create more complex policies to account for different contexts. Um, but I guess one way to do that would be to have some sort of like mixture of models that you alter the weights uh, to try mm -hmm. to use um, in different models. Excellent. And, and a follow on that's actually closely related. So. Um, the, the question was uh, from Neil Bat. Uh, so so um, the reward function, so, so you're formulating the prediction problem as an IRO problem uh, to estimate the weights. However, the reward functions terms are still driven by handcrafted sort of intuition-based components. Um, would this not mean that it would be hard to generalize to other environments? So it's a closely connected question. Right. Um, so also a good question. I think just to, I guess, clarify what we're doing here is we're, we're saying that this uh, reward function that we're creating is, is something that we could use for motion planning. And specifically, these features could be useful for motion planning for a lane change. Okay. Um, and then we try to take an off-the-shelf prediction model and incorporate its performance as a measure of unpredictability into this um, cost function. Um, and so I think that, um, yeah, so what's good about hand designing these features is that they give us a lot of interpretability about the behavior that the vehicle is making. So if we can compare the two models, the one with the extra unpredictability measure and the one without, um, we can really interpret why it's doing something since we have we basically designed most of the, of the function. Um, on the other hand, we have this problem of not being able to fit very well to the data and not being able to generalize to many scenarios. Um, but I think we have to kind of be mindful of this trade-off of uh, um, kind of interpretability versus how well you can fit the data. Um, and so I guess some future work could be to try to combine kind of deep learning with pre-designed in order to um, make some best of both worlds or something. Interesting. OK. Uh, the next question was for Keenan. Um, so radar is often cited as a uh, uh, excellent tool for object detection. Um, and in the data that you're displaying, often you can see a lot of the vehicles as well. Have you thought of developing sort of joint tasks that do simultaneous detection and localization or detection, localization, and mapping? And do you think that would have an impact on the quality or reliability of your features that you extract? 
knowing what's moving and what's a car versus what's the rest of the world that you're trying to track in motion. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's a really interesting problem. And I think something else that might kind of elevate this problem is we only look at one frame at a time, but mm -hmm. as we've seen in a lot of like uh, Raquel Erdison's work, they use like a whole stack of previous LIDAR frames to do both de detection and prediction from. Yes. So that, that might be a big help to help the DNN learn like what are the static elements of the scene versus the dynamic elements. Uh, because yeah, it, it will have a pretty limited ability to make that prediction using only like one frame at a time, uh, even with really good like semantic uh, classification. I guess trying to combine those two different tasks, um, that, that could be kind of fun. Uh, I'm not sure if, if I'll end up working on that, but that's, that's certainly an, an open problem. Um, yeah, I know you guys like prediction. I think one of the things that has not yet been nailed down is uh, doing detection on this Navtech sensor. So there is the Radiate data set, which is out there and they have the bounding boxes on it, but there's basically only one group that's published detection results on this data set so far. So maybe this will become a mini competition among some groups uh, in the near future. We'll see. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, okay, we'll move on to uh, Ali. Um, so we have in a well calibrated neural network with non negative log likelihood loss and uncertainty estimation, the units of the uncertainty outputs can be interpreted uh, in the unit of the error. So pixels or meters. Um, what about for the energy based loss? Does anything change in that? So the output of the neural network does not change. The energy loss just takes that output and provides you with a scalar that describes how good that output is. So you still have the uncertainty in the same unit of error. The energy score itself is also in the same unit of error. So that's what differentiates it from the negative log likelihood. Uh, so the energy score itself uh, can be thought of as a generalization of uh, the L1 norm to probability distributions. So you can still interpret it as uh, meters or pixels, and that uh, differentiates it from the negative log likelihood, which usually doesn't have a, like a well-defined uh, well unit. Excellent. OK, and one more question for you, Ali, as well. Um, uh, so from your talk, it's clear that to have a better estimate of entropy, we need to have a deterministic back end that covers a wide range of errors during the training phase. Um, does it not mean that to develop a good probabilistic object detector, we also need a good deterministic detector back end? Um, which would need a diverse training set, which is, of course, also always a challenge in any new domain. So I would think of this in a different way. I'd say instead of focusing on deterministic backends, why don't we focus on designing detectors that do the probabilistic detection task natively? So what, we don't need data for this, right? Because the error depends on the output of the neural network compared to your ground truth. So you can technically simulate output of the neural network that has high errors and the train on that, right? So I would say we need to develop a new training methods that are not based on IOU-based uh, regression target selection. Uh, that would be a better approach for me than focusing on designing the deterministic detectors, if that makes sense. Excellent, yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, um, I'll move over to Chris. We have uh, one question for you, Chris, which was, um, does the definition of constraint satisfaction change when you switch from stochastic to robust uh, MPC? Um, yeah, sure. So um, with stochastic MPC, you have a, an acceptable level of risk. Um, so the probability of constraint satisfaction is less than one. Robust is basically the same as saying probability of constraint satisfaction is one. Um, so that's why it's more conservative uh, mm -hmm. and how you parameterize the uncertainty, um, yeah, may, in each case might vary. So robust typically uses a set, um, just are you, you know, it's in a set or, and that's it. Um, stochastic is usually a distribution. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, excellent, it does, it does, absolutely. Okay. Um, I have just one last question uh, for Keenan, um, which was on uh, fusion methods related to uh, radar. Um, are, is your current representation amenable to fusion with other uh, sensor types? Um, how, how do you expect that to improve the localization performance? Yeah, I guess that's the nice thing about the, the deep learned front end. It's something that we haven't experimented with, but you could totally have 
LIDAR or other sensors as another input and then see what kinds of uh, features it might learn from that. Uh, it would depend on how you're doing the fusion. Like, are you making some kind of like intermediate representation that comes after the LIDAR and the radar and then making key points on that? Or are you predicting them separately and then just using the key points together? Uh, yeah, that would definitely be a cool research project, but we haven't looked at that yet. All these, all these reaching questions, there you go. Um, good stuff. Okay, well, with that, I think we can conclude our session. So thanks so much to our student speakers. Um, unless there's any more questions from the audience, uh, we'll maybe just, uh, we can all unmute and give them a big round of applause. So here we go. All right. I always love this part. All right. <laughs> okay, I was the only one clapping. Maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but wonderful. All right. So that concludes our student um, talks. Uh, so we now move on to the final session of the day uh, before our social this evening. Um, and so it's uh, very exciting uh, for me to be able to introduce the, um, the former um, uh, team lead of the age of the O-Toronto uh, team. This is, of course, Keenan Burnett, who we've now heard from uh, a couple of times. Um, and, uh, and so he's going to host a session here where the O-Toronto team is going to introduce uh, their uh, architecture and talk about all the great aspects of their vehicle. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'll look maybe stall, give the team some time to get set up here. Uh, I do have some- Oh, sports. apologies. Are we now ahead of schedule? Yeah, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Oh, okay, okay. Well, then maybe what we should do is we can take a little break and we can do that wonderful introduction one more time. In about yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait till they're set up and then we'll resume. That sounds like a good idea. All right, let's do that. Apologies, everyone. Hey, uh, can I'm just checking with if the members are in. Okay, I think sounds most good. of the members are in. Um, can Martin try to share the screen, see if that works, please? Sure thing. Here I go. Thank you. <coughs> Let me just get something set up real quick. And oh, um, and I am able to share. Let me know if you guys are able to see this. Yep. Yeah, we yes, see. we can see this. Excellent. I don't think you have full screen. Uh, can you confirm? Um, yeah, it's there, there's that like 11 away from full screen. There we go. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, yeah, I have some stuff here I can introduce you with Joe. Uh, yeah, so I'm really happy to introduce this year's All Toronto team. Uh, they were recently crowned the winners of the year four SE Auto Drive Challenge. So, uh, congrats to them on that regard. This brings our total wins to four out of four. So, we're very happy about that. Uh, we've already seen some examples today from Raquel's talk of what the state of the art of soft driving looks like. So what's going to be really cool about this, this session here is that we get to see what our student team has been able to accomplish over the last few years using a team of uh, mostly volunteers and operating on a very limited budget in comparison to some of these other uh, companies out there. So uh, presenting today, of course, we have Joe, who has been the team lead of All Toronto for the past year. Uh, we have Brian and Amy who are on the simulation team. We have uh, Mustafa who is on the reception team, Martin who is on mapping and localization, Shi Chen for planning, and Jimmy for the controls team. Okay, so I'll be hopping in back in, uh, in and out to handle the questions. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Joe. Okay, hey, uh, yeah, sorry, can, can we just make sure that all my members are in? Yeah, I think they're in actually. I think so. Okay. Yeah, okay, we'll just get started then. All right. Okay, um, welcome to Al Toronto's team workshop. Uh, I'm Joe, first year massive student from Professor Angela Schulich's lab at Matthias. Uh, together with me are Brian, Amy, Mustafa, Martin, Shi Chen, and Jimmy. So today we're here to talk about some of our team's achievements as we participate in the SAE Auto Drive Challenge. So the Auto Drive Challenge is a collegiate competition hosted by SAE and General Motors. Uh, the competition tasks students to build an autonomous vehicle for urban driving environments over a span of four years. The round one competition started in 2017, and we just completed the final part of the series. Uh, currently, our team has over 70 undergrad and graduate students from various departments at U of T, mainly engineering and computer science. Since 2017, uh, more than 30 students have received course credits, including thesis and capstone projects for the team. Uh, as a team, we aim to develop and promote autonomous driving technologies, not just competing against other universities, but also aim to improve mobility for everyone. So um, over the past four years, our vehicle, Zeus, has successfully completed many driving tasks. Uh, in year one, Zeus was able to do lane following, handle stop signs, and avoid obstacles. 
in year two, uh, we successfully navigated the M City, which is a self driving car test facility at the University of Michigan, and handled traffic lights, traffic signs, pedestrians, and other scenarios. And finally, in year three and year four, uh, Zeus can now work as an autonomous ride sharing vehicle under controlled environments and handle even more complex traffic scenarios. So uh, the competition is scored based, uh, based on both reports, presentations, simulations, and actual driving tasks. We just received the results last night, and we're very excited to share that all Toronto has placed first place of the Auto Drive Challenge for, for four consecutive years. Here's the leaderboard of the challenge, and uh, you can see that we actually lead the second place by over 600 points. Before we start the actual content, I'd like to announce that we are currently hiring new students, both undergrad and graduates, uh, to participate in the next round of the challenge. The new competition will start in July and we'll build everything from scratch again. So if you found any part of the presentation that interests you, please reach out. Uh, we aim to uh, complete the first round of recruitment by the end of this month. Here's the uh, outline for this presentation. So we'll be going into more detail as to how each of the component of our system has progressed to bring Zeus to its current state, as well as the lessons learned along the journey. The entire presentation will be broken down into three sections. So in the first section, we'll talk about sensors, compute hardware, and system design and testing. Uh, the second section will, will have the perception, mapping, and localization. And the final section will contain planning, control, and user, use, uh, user interaction. So uh, between the sections, we'll have a few minute break for uh, questions and discussions. So let's first take a look at our sensors and compute units. So our vehicle perceives the environment via sensors. Uh, there are two phases in the development of our sensor suit. In year one, we mainly focus on lane following, whereas in the following years, we focus on ride sharing and more complex tasks. So uh, our year one sensor suit consists of a stereo camera, a monocular camera, a Velodyne HDL64 LiDAR, and a Novatel GPS system, all mounted on our roof rack. Through these experiments, we realized that our year one layout was not optimal. Uh, for example, the single forward camera was not sufficient for complex tasks such as pedestrian handling. Moreover, uh, the use of HDL64 LiDAR actually diminished the benefit brought by the stereo cameras. So in year two, based on the year one lessons, we removed the stereo camera, we installed the continental radar, and the quick zoom with four cameras, uh, three wide angle and one long range. The, uh, the overlapping 170 degree field view from the four cameras provides redundancy and also improves intersection handling performance. And the use of the long range camera boosts our traffic sign detection range to up to 80 meters. As a Canadian team, we had to deal with inclement weather conditions from day one. Uh, unfortunately, cameras are prone to rains and snows, and as such, we are often blocked from testing in the winter. Uh, on the left, we show a picture of our uh, camera image, which during the winter, you can see the snow covers the entire uh, field of view. So in three year three and year four, the base design remained the same. Uh, we replaced Novatel GPS with a Planix dual antenna solution in hope we can improve our heading estimate. Uh, moreover, a CAD-designed weatherproof enclosure was developed for the cameras. Through extensive testing, we proved that our current sensor suit meets all requirements of the competition. However, it is still not sufficient for real-world deployment. Going forward, we plan to add additional cameras to cover the blind spot that currently exists. We also plan to investigate more sensor modalities, such as radars, to improve our system's robustness under inclement weather conditions. So all sensor information and the autonomy software are processed on the onboard Intel Crystal Rack server. Uh, the server is equipped, equipped with two Intel Xeon CPUs with 44 cores in total. Uh, due to the competition constraints, we're not allowed to use GPUs to run neural networks. Instead, we utilize two Intel Area 10 pack FPGAs and build our own deep learning acceleration pipeline based on the Intel OpenVINO backend. The two CPUs and two FPGAs together provide four, uh, approximately 4.8 TFLOPs, uh, which is kind of low. Um, due to this limited onboard computing resource available, we spend a lot of effort designing software that can run very efficiently on CPUs. Um, also, there are many peripherals that bridge the server to the passengers and the cars, as seen in this figure. Uh, in the cabin, we have two monitors, one for the safety driver and one for the passengers. We also have a couple of emergency stops that can cut the power under emergency situations. Uh, in the trunk, we have the actual server, its power supply and cooling system. There's a switch panel that controls the power of the sensors and a network switch that manages connection to all the sensors. This design has been the same for the past four years. Uh, building, ex 
a self-driving car can be a very expensive task. So currently the total cost of Zeus costs approximately $217,000. Uh, with 80% of the cost being associated to the sensors and computing on board. Uh, next, I'll hand over to Brian and Amy. We'll talk about our overall system design and automated testing strategies. I'll just take a, we'll take a brief break there, see if there's okay. any questions or comments from yeah, the audience. Sure. Uh, I do see one comment from, from Zach, who is actually the co-lead, or Zachary Cruz, who is co-lead of the team in years one and two. <laughs> uh, and his main comment was, uh, us barely squeaking by with the win in year one. And uh, I can provide a little bit more background on that. I think uh, it really did come down to the wire. I think there was several challenges at the year one competition and it was the, the last few minutes of the final challenge that we did that was really what separated the first or the first from the third place teams pretty much. So that was pretty exciting. Um, another comment here is commenting on the cost of the LiDAR sensor. Um, Maybe I'll let, uh, let one of the team members uh, answer that one. What do you think about the cost of, of LiDAR? Um, yeah, I think I can answer that. So right now, the LiDARs are definitely quite expensive, especially when you're using a like, high-end one. Um, this usage, I think, is justified because like, the 64-line LiDAR really provides a rich like, uh, geometric understanding of the environment. Uh, moreover, we believe that LiDAR, the cost of LiDAR will drop in the future. Like uh, Many LiDAR companies, including Valdine, uh, they are like they will be providing uh, lidars at, at a much lower like, cost. So uh, we think in the future we can reduce the overall cost by a huge amount, and that will make self-driving cars actually deployable in the real world. Okay, I have one more uh, quick question from Chris McKinnon, who's asking uh, why is the next iteration of the competition uh, starting over from scratch? Oh. Uh, good question. So I think that's just because they organize it. <laughs> it's already the end of round one. So there will be new universities joining us to make sure that everyone starts from the, the same, same, uh, same page. Uh, they have decided to like, give us new car and new hardware, uh, as well as like, new challenges. Uh, so that's why like everything will start from scratch again. <laughs> Cool. I was hoping maybe you would elaborate a little bit more for the audience uh, on our use of FPGAs and, oh, yeah. uh, and what we were able to do with those things. Yeah. Um, so as mentioned, as discussed previously, the competition does not allow us to use uh, NVIDIA GPUs for acceleration. Um, so after looking around the acceleration chips available on the market, we decided to use this uh, Intel Area 10 pack. Pack stands for Programmable Acceleration Card. Uh, it's Basically, uh, something we can deploy our own like custom uh, calculation like uh, pipelines on. Uh, currently, our uh, deep learning acceleration pipeline supports like several different types of uh, neural networks, uh, including SqueezeDat and the widely used YOLO. Um, regarding computation power, each card provides about 1.5 teaflops. Uh, which is sufficient to run squeeze that at about 40 FPS or YOLO at 12 FPS. Um, the DOA is, is expandable. So as we move along competition, develop more sophisticated uh, deep learning acceleration, uh, sorry, uh, more sophisticated learning net models, we'll be able to deploy them on the FPGAs very easily. Uh, moreover, since we have two, we can actually run multiple neural nets together on the car. Awesome. All right, with that, uh, maybe we'll try and move along because we do have the team has prepared a lot of material for us, so we'll try and get through it all. Okay, uh, yeah, next I will introduce Brian and Amy for our overall uh, system design and automated testing. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, since year one, our architecture has followed a modular sense plan act paradigm. In year one, we sense relevant science, fit this information into a local lane following planner, and then the controller follows the desired path. All of this is abstracted to individual components via ROS nodes, for which we maintain a stable API that enables each component to be implementation agnostic. This enables faster software development. With this, we are able to complete all year one requirements. However, we lack global mapping capabilities. In years two to four, we expanded on year one design by implementing use map global mapping. This enabled different planner implementations, such as the hierarchical planner in year two and lattice planners in years three to four. It also helped us enhance our perception suite. We also introduced a watchdog system to better handle GPS denied scenarios and control sanity checks. For example, we run all planned paths through a kinematic feasibility check. 
Our system was then exhaustively tested to iron out any kinks or bugs. When we believe that this testing is why we are able to win the dynamic challenges. Now I will talk first. I will first talk a bit about the underlying theory behind our testing and development process. Then Amy and I will go over some examples of how we apply it to Zeus through our own vehicle testing, MathWorks simulation, and our auto evaluator automated testing framework. Generally speaking, our development process follows the V model. We take the functional requirements to develop a feature set and safety requirements which is verified by on-vehicle testing and DFME analysis. From this, we arrive at our systems level specifications. These are largely verified through physics realistic testing, for example, Simulink simulation. This is broken down into the component level design, which is tested by system in the loop component testing. And finally, at the module level, code is written and validated with unit tests. In reality, in the auto drive challenge, requirements are given by SAE. From this, our systems team builds the requirements models, which is handed off to development teams to uh, write code and perform unit testing. Moving up our way up the right side of the V model, our simulation team performs uh, systems verification and component level testing with the help of our auto evaluator. Finally, on vehicle testing is performed to ensure fulfillment of all functional requirements. Our CI pipeline helps us to develop the code with greater efficiency and confidence. Our developers first write code and unit test it. This gets pushed to GitLab from which our Jenkins server picks up the code and runs unit tests. If this passes, we send it to our auto-evaluator pipeline for component and system level testing. This generates human readable test results with runtime artifacts for our developers to, for our developers to review. In particular, rapid objective test results provides our developers with helpful feedback with which they can improve our system. Now I'll talk about how this testing process was reflected on vehicle. In years one to three, our strategy was to extensively test on vehicle at our test sites at Utah's ETM and at ClearPath. We also made use of simulation tooling to augment that test coverage. For example, in year, in year two, we used the photorealistic uh, right hook simulation environment to better test and even collect some data for our perception stack. However, we found that this rather manual process was time consuming and qualitative. We depended on a human to run the test and to observe that the car's behavior fell within requirements. In year four, prompted by work from home and COVID, we developed a auto evaluator for automated simulation testing, which enables quantitative feedback. One major motivator for the auto evaluator uh, was how we found that stressing the car through varying test conditions and complex environments worked very well. Uh, for example, we we're only able to find out a clear path that a car cannot properly localize uh, inter traffic lights to closely clustered intersections, a situation that we can't replicate at Utias. However, in simulation, we can make whatever scenarios we want, however complex or simple. This brought us to fully realize the need for automated integration testing. The auto evaluator is a primary innovation this year. It automatically launches and configures test simulations, attaching them to metric functions that evaluate car behavior. It supports conditional staging or metric function execution, something that I'll go into greater detail later. With this, we're able to easily create and evaluate complex scenarios even automating part of that process to enable to increase our test coverage and minimize the need for manual testing. Going forward, we plan on using the photorealistic Unreal Simulator to further, to further stress test our perception stack. For example, injecting noise, volume box uncertainty, or atmospheric conditions to the simulation environment helps us do more testing than with just traditional data sets at a much lower cost. In particular, for perception, we can modify the environment and data however we want. Uh, generating new scenarios without having to pay for or work on expensive data set labeling jobs. Um, so going to detail about the staging test um, uh, feature of auto evaluator. Here's an example of a uh, intersection handling, lane keeping and obstacle handling set test scenario. By breaking our test down into different stages with different metric functions that run in each stage, we're able to com capture complex behavior in an intuitive way. Going into this example, we depend on the result of a metric function to determine when to move uh, on to the next stage. For example, we go from the uh, intersection handling to lane keeping stages when the car leaves the intersection. I'll leave further discussions of technical details for the Q&A section later. Next, Amy will talk about how we use MathWorks Simulink to test our car and how these test simulations scenarios might be represented in our simulation environment. Thank you, Brian. We use a complex Simulink environment that allows for the handling of multiple environment injections, including traffic lights, pedestrians, obstacles, and traffic signs into a full end city map. 
With the Simulink environment, we are able to simulate a realistic environment that's similar to the competition. And we're also able to model slight perturbations in the environment, such as errors or noise in the confidence and bounding box of detected obstacle. We also use the MATLAB Python engine to communicate between the Simulink environment and the auto evaluator. And our Simulink models are designed to take in variables that come from the auto evaluator. And this allows us to dynamically configure Simulink models and create several variations of the same scenario, which reduces the demand on Simulink development and allows us to focus on actual test creation. We're also able to get semi-photorealistic sensor data from the Unreal Engine, which allows us to debug our vehicle easier. In this demonstration, we see the car stopping for a jaywalking pedestrian. With the auto evaluator, we can control the position and speed of the pedestrian and verify the planner successful handling of the pedestrian. As you can see, the vehicle stops when the pedestrian is detected and then continues on its route when the path is clear. So in short, the auto evaluator and simulation environment make sure that our car is the best prepared this year by dramatically increasing test coverage, boosting productivity, and maximizing test quality. CI-CD integration enables us to run it daily or on demand, helping us rack up over 100 simulation hours so far. Tests can be easily created with a YAML configuration file or even automatically. So each test run automatically generates a report of test results. And most importantly, it improves our test quality and code confidence by enabling objective test feedback, which was something missing from our prior qualitative testing. So going forward, we plan on refining our pipeline by testing in accordance to industry standards, such as AVSC, best practice, and ISO 26262. We'll also be expanding our test coverage to more scenarios and other components of the car. And we're also looking into implementing edge case generation in a mixed reality test environment so that we can use our test, uh, use it to test our vehicle software stack against adversarial driving scenarios. So we'll now take a short break and take questions for uh, the previous section. Great, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have one question that just came up uh, and they, this is from Ali and he's asking, I was wondering what middleware do you guys use in the car? I saw ROS nodes and was wondering if we're gonna be using ROS1 or ROS2. I'll let whoever wants to answer that go. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks Ali. Right now we're using ROS1. However, we do plan on switching over to ROS2 uh, for the round two of the competition. Cool. Uh, yeah, I had one question actually, which was, what were some surprising bugs that you guys uncovered by doing the simulation testing that you think you might not have discovered otherwise? Uh, yeah, so, oh, uh, yeah, Amy, okay. Yeah, so one uh, bug that we found was uh, actually in intersection handling. Uh, for example, let's say we are uh, approaching intersection and we're about to take a left turn um, uh, and we have the right of way. However, there is somebody uh, crossing the intersection on the right side of our lane, uh, right side of the, um, uh, the intersection. So our car would end up uh, stopping in the middle of the intersection uh, because it thinks that we detect a pressure to put a, uh, in our path. So that's the bug that we found through simulation. Okay, and we have another one that just rolled in. Uh, this is from Chris and he asks, how much of your perception system were you able to test in simulation? Um, so uh, when it comes to specifically put, uh, simulation, right now we are targeting our planning systems uh, through simulation because it's deterministic. It's, we use a lattice planner, which we'll talk about uh, in further detail later. Um, so we are able to uh, test that very, very thoroughly. So that's our current priority. Um, when it comes to perception, um, we have some, uh, we're working on a uh, testing through ROSBAG um, and then looking at uh, how our perception res system responds to uh, uh, past uh, real world data. Um, right now it's kind of a work in progress for perception. Well, awesome. We're able to handle uh, many different uh, scenarios including like traffic lights, traffic signs, um, different obstacle detections and uh, whether or not our car will stop uh, for those obstacles. 
Great. And uh, maybe one last question uh, before we continue. This is from Zach and he asks, uh, your team was able to continuously place first in each year of the competition. We're very happy about that. Uh, how are you able to continuously produce such a high quality while having rotating team members through graduation? Great. Um, I think I can answer this question. So uh, one thing that we keep in mind when like organizing the team is that we want to include as many students from uh, the field as possible. Uh, we have students like both in their like first years and second years, like all the way to like masters and even PhDs. So even when uh, the more senior students graduate, the younger students already uh, learned how everything works uh, like through this practice, and they can very easily take on the uh, take on the uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, like, uh, yeah, I think that's how we make sure our team kept rolling over the past few years. Great. Okay, let's uh, let's roll into the next section. Yeah, so uh, I'll be talking about perception. Do you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, my name is uh, Mustafa, uh, first year undergraduate student, um, just joined the perception team. So uh, yeah, uh, let's begin with an overview of the developments made to the perception system. Um, so in year one, we began by developing lane following methods. Uh, in year two, uh, squeeze that based detectors, custom deep learning acceleration to scale up object and light detection, uh, as well as auto track, a tracking pipeline was developed. Uh, in year three, squeeze that was updated to YOLO v3 in our system, and AutoTrack also had minor improvements. Finally, in year four, we expanded the traffic signs detection pipeline to detect 20 classes, uh, upgraded the pedestrian detection system to use YOLO v3 for improved performance, and developed AutoTrack v3 to handle both static and dynamic objects, such as the deer detection scenario uh, seen here. In year one, we started with vision baseline detection. When this struggled with differences in illumination, we used camera lighter sensor fusion to overcome this as lighter is robust to lighting changes. Here you see a qualitative representation of how effectively our detector is performing in the lighting conditions at our test track at Utahis compared to the competition track in Arizona. On the other hand, hard cascades were used to detect stop signs. Uh, initially, we struggled with localizing traffic signs in a complex environment. The challenging problem we had to overcome was identifying which point cloud clouds detected using our LiDAR sensors corresponded to objects in the driving scene, such as a stop sign, for instance. We tried to filter associations based on distance, uh, expected dimensions of signs, uh, and a couple of other metrics. However, in the end, the filter that worked best was distance from the vehicle. Out of the different point cloud clusters that can be associated to uh, the traffic sign bounding box, the ones closest to the vehicle localized the sign best. The same lesson and strategy was used for other signs in future years. Next, in year two, squeeze that based detectors were also deployed for traffic light and pedestrian detection. A strategy used in year two was developing our custom deep learning acceleration pipeline. I'll be going into more detail about this soon. This allowed us to accelerate our light and object detection significantly. We were able to run squeeze that at 40 FPS on the FPGAs, which is five times faster than running on the CPU. Another strategy we employed in year two uh, to reliably identify traffic lights at intersections was to exploit prior location information stored in Zeus map. This entailed looking for traffic lights around their expected locations in our semantic map. As can be seen in this image, the raw output of the traffic light detector is a bounding box for each of the detected traffic lights. The center point of each bounding box is extracted as a point landmark and compared against their expected locations shown in blue, which is stored in the reference semantic map. The pixel coordinate difference between the detected outputs and the expected locations becomes the error signal, which is minimized by the semantic localization model to reduce longitudinal positioning error. This successfully allowed us to identify traffic lights at intersections. The main struggle we had in year two uh, for traffic sign detection was that squeeze that could not detect the off state of traffic lights. As a result, we had to treat flashing red lights as red. Uh, this motivated our team to look for more expressive models uh, later in year three uh, that could identify flashing light states. In the same year, the main strategy with our use of deep learning acceleration was to leverage the hardware efficiency of the Intel FPGAs we used to achieve real-time performance. Our current system runs at 50 milliseconds per image using four CPUs and 25 milliseconds per image on the FPGAs. 
The struggle and lesson this year is that limited operation support meant that state-of-the-art architectures couldn't always be used. Uh, as a result, innovation in the detectors and trackers that we used were necessary to overcome this challenge. Furthermore, in year two, a lightweight object tracking pipeline uh, known as AutoTrack was proposed to detect and track objects. Estimating the velocity of objects is a challenging problem in self-driving. Our solution uses vision, LIDAR, and GPS, or IMU positioning, to accurately estimate the position and velocity of pedestrians. Not just that, but this is done in real time, and the entire detection and tracking pipeline is capable of running on CPUs only. This is uncommon in the literature, but is essential in practice. In the end, to localize objects in 3D, we used a centroid of LiDAR point clusters. This helped localize small objects such as pedestrians, as shown here. However, the challenge was finding the centroid of larger objects, such as cars. This is because naive LiDAR point clustering only captures the front surface uh, of objects, but doesn't have an understanding of the geometry or depth of the object. Another lesson is that motion prediction is necessary in dynamic scenes. Unfortunately, this wasn't done in year two, where we collided with a deer dummy. Uh, don't worry, there's a redemption for Zeus in future years, where we improve the auto track system to overcome this issue. Finally, in year two, we also improved our year one lane detection to conduct drivable region detection. The main strategy was to use the init from SqueezeDet while adjusting and reducing the number of layers in the network to achieve better performance. The use of dilated convolutions increased our perception field of view, and the use of entropy allowed us to measure the uncertainty associated with uh, lane detections. In the end, we achieved respectable accuracy on the BDD100K dataset, and the use of Monte Carlo dropout across frames boosted our runtime performance from 1.5 FPS to 15 FPS on CPU, which was near real-time performance. Moving forward to year three, we upgraded to AutoTrack V2, which features better data association with the Hungarian algorithm and better classification by using a hidden Markov model to smooth detections. The main challenge we had was that tuning the tracker for pedestrians caused non-zero speed estimates for static objects, which resulted in phantom braking. As you can see here, the vehicle interprets the traffic cones as having a non-zero velocity. And as a result, the planned path uh, of the vehicle changes rapidly as it debates uh, between stopping to avoid a collision versus moving forward. In year three and four, the 2D detectors were also worked upon and improved from squeeze debt to YOLO v3. This selection was done as it was more expressive while providing satisfactory runtime. In particular, YOLO v3 can identify the off state of traffic lights, which allows us to respond to flashing red lights. It is also more balanced and achieves better accuracy for pedestrian detection. Throughout year three and four, we improved perception performance by increasing our usage of open source datasets, such as new scenes and JAD, as well as developed our own custom datasets. The main struggle was setting up a general training pipeline. However, once that was done, we could simply remotely SSH into our servers, something especially helpful while working remotely during quarantine, and focus on improving uh, perception performance as opposed to worrying about data wrangling. Finally, in year four, we upgraded to AutoTrack v3 to conduct both static and dynamic object tracking and prediction, while boosting our effective tracking range from 25 to 40 meters. This was done using better ground plane segmentation and using object type-based motion models. What this means is we have different motion models in our Kalman filter for different object types, such as deers or pedestrians. The parameters for our motion models were empirically selected using extensive on-vehicle tuning and testing. As a result of these improvements, you can see in this uh, dynamic object tracking and prediction figure that we are able to identify the deer and pedestrian, which are highlighted in red. Uh, red stands for potentially moving objects, and the red line indicates the predicted motion of the object over the next five seconds. The other objects uh, are in yellow, which stand for likely static objects. The improvements made in AutoTrack v3 uh, allow us to conduct much smoother and effective tracking and prediction of dynamic and static objects. The current perception system is the best it has ever been over the four years of the competition. One of the reasons for this is that the use of YOLO v3 and AutoTrack v3 provides robust object detection, tracking, and prediction. Not just that, but despite this being an open challenge for autonomous vehicles, our current system operates in different lighting conditions and various driving environments. On the left, we can see pedestrian detection in snowy conditions, uh, something we face quite a bit as a Canadian team. And on the right, we have motion prediction and detection at night. As you can see, our system can successfully classify the pedestrian as a high-risk object in red, uh, along with the red line, which shows the pedestrian's predicted motion. 
In the end, our current system is able to identify 20 different traffic sign classes and is also capable of handling complex driving scenarios such as pedestrian crossings and deer crossings thanks to our improved tracking and prediction pipeline. The system is capable of handling the deer detection scenario we were previously unable to, uh, as can be seen here in the dynamic object tracking demo. For the coming SAE AutoDrive competition, we're currently looking to expand Zeus's capabilities through the development of improved 2D and 3D object detection uh, with both camera and LiDAR. This will improve Zeus's object post estimation ability and allow us to identify more static and dynamic objects in the driving scene. Tangentially uh, related to this is also our interest in developing road agent behavior and motion prediction algorithms to improve our planning system. Finally, since camera and LiDAR sensors are not robust to implement weather conditions, we are also looking to develop radar-based detection and tracking systems. I'll pass it on to Martin, who'll talk about mapping and localization. Okay, let's Mustafa? just take a, a oh, brief break yeah. <laughs> and look yeah. for some questions. But that, yeah, that was awesome, Mustafa. I think. Uh, Generally, uh, perception receives like an outsized interest from the public. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, open we, can, we can drum up some interesting questions here. Um, we have some that are somewhat related to the previous section, but I, I can go back to them anyways. This first one is from Neil and he asks, uh, did you develop any specific custom ROS nodes or routines that can aid in managing <laughs> CPU multi-threading efficiently? Uh, whoever wants to answer that can go ahead. Uh, I can talk a bit about this. So we did not design like specific loss nodes to help with multi-threading or multi-processing. Uh, however, we did spend a lot of effort like uh, optimizing like CPU usage. Uh, we also did extensive like testing and validation on the vehicle to make sure that uh, the CPU the resources are used uh, like fairly across the different processes, uh, so everything can be run like in real time. Awesome. Okay. I, I think I, I have some questions here that I, I thought might be interesting to dive into. And the first one is, what do you think is the biggest challenge to deploying a deep neural network on an autonomous vehicle or any robot? Yeah, I would say that's the onboard computing resource available. And that depends on what kind of like hardware we have and the, number, the FPS and performance we need from the perception systems. So that requires a lot of like uh, prior study and literature review to make the decision. I'd also jump in and joke, yeah, maybe sure. also, um, I think the building systems of redundancy, uh, Keenan, is something extremely important. So um, you might be able to, uh, even with your compute resources, have like really high, uh, you know, accuracy, precision recall with regards to, say, uh, vision detectors. Uh, but that in and of itself is not going to guarantee safety. You require having uh, additional systems. So we have like our lighter. Uh, based sensor fusion, which is uh, used in order to improve that robustness and safety. And uh, this is also motivating us to look at radar in the future, right? Because uh, we, we realize that essentially, if you want to de deploy stuff in the real world, um, you have to ensure that your system is the most safe as possible. And redundancy is the key to achieving that. Cool. Uh, I have We have a question from Steve here, which is, did you evaluate your tracking system on open data sets and what tracking metrics did you use to adjust your progress on, on getting those things to work? Um, yeah, so for this year, our main focus was on like those very competition specific objects like the dummy and deer. So uh, for the tracking part, we mainly worked with our, our own custom data set. Uh, however, previously we did evaluate our like tracking performance on like the KD like the uh, tracking pipeline, and uh, we basically uh, used. Um, you know, I think it was mainly based on the ground truth position. Uh, we also, uh, yeah, and we also tried our uh, methods on like our like on the U of T Pad fifty dataset, which was uh, created in previous years and open source to the public. Uh, that dataset is kind of special because it actually contains the ground truth of all the objects around the the robot. Uh, we place like a GPS antenna on like the pedestrians and the, yeah, on, on the pedestrian uh, to get the ground truth. And that allowed us to like actually quantitatively evaluate our uh, tracking performance. Cool, uh, this question is from Amr and he asks, how do you use the IMU measurements in pedestrian tracking or is it just for self-localizing the vehicle only? Um, yeah, that's mainly used for like better estimate the state of the vehicles because we track all objects in 3D uh, like we transform the detected uh, objects from the vehicle's frame to the global frame. So that means if we want to get very good uh, position of speed estimate, we need to get like reliable uh, like post estimate in 3D. And that's where IMU is used. 
Okay. I think it's been a little while since we worked on this, but uh, yeah. well, we'll see if we can answer this question. How do we balance between the number of Monte Carlo samples for entropy estimation and the real-time performance that was maintained? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a bit well in the back. So uh, I think our main strategy was first, we want to ensure the system is able to run in real time. For example, for the like, camera-based methods, we want the algorithm to run at least 15 FPS. Um, and then we can uh, empirically like adjust the number of MC samples until uh, we get like a reliable entropy estimate. So for example, via experiments, our current setup, uh, we can find a very distinct uh, like threshold for the entropy. Uh, I think right now, like an entropy of 0 0.22 uh, indicates uh, the, either the detection is reliable or not. Uh, so it's mainly experimental. Okay, and another question from Neil. He asks, for your current prediction model, do you use a constant velocity or a constant acceleration model? Uh, and, and has that assumption been fine in most cases that you faced? Um, yeah, so right now we're using a constant velocity model. Uh, the primary reason is that uh, the system was optimized to compete in the auto drive competition. And what they use in the competition is the electrical cart that pulls the pedestrian across the road. Uh, based on our observation, the, the, object may, the objects mainly move at, at a constant velocity. So that's how we chose the model. Hey, and another, another question from Chris is, uh, if you could use a GPU, uh, do you think your performance in the competitions would change a lot? or were we able to overcome this constraint with lots of engineering effort? Okay, if we were able to use a GPU, I'm sure that we can improve our, like for example, uh, perception and tracking performance by a lot. Uh, so for example, as mentioned previously, for example, right now we have some trouble tracking like larger objects such as cars because the LiDAR is not able, does, does not under, uh, have a sense of depth uh, like, or the geometry of the object. So as the car, for example, as the car moves around the car, uh, around a parked car, uh, it may get like fast, uh, fast like velocity estimates. Uh, with the GPU, we can potentially utilize more advanced 3D like detectors, and that would definitely improve our uh, tracking performance. Uh, for perception, we still struggle a little bit about different uh, signs and uh, lights. Like for example, right now we're using hard cascades to uh, distinguish the signs on the side of the load, but that's not scalable. Like every time they add a new sign, we have to introduce a new hard cascade. Uh, using a more expressive neural network will definitely help uh, reducing the, com uh, the, the computation cost. Great, okay, let's, uh, let's try and make some more progress on, on this awesome presentation. So yeah. Hello I'll everyone, I'll my name is Martin. Martin. Yeah, I'll pass it on right. to Martin then for mapping and localization. Oh, thank you for the very formal introduction, Mustafa. So as Mustafa said, my name is Martin, and I'll be guiding you through the mapping and localization system. For the mapping and localization system, in the year one competition, we developed a lane detection pipeline, which was used to localize with respect to the center line of the current lane. To support global navigation required in the year two competition, we developed ZeusMap, our custom semantic map service. This was coupled with GPS and LiDAR-based localization. In year three and four, we developed semantic localization, which extends upon the year two methods. So in year one, we used a center line localization algorithm to ensure Zeus remains between the lane lines during operation. As, pre as discussed previously, lane lines are detected via an ensemble of models, which are fused for more robust detection. Moving forward though, we realized that pure lane detection was insufficient for global navigation. And hence in year two, we developed Zeus map. Zeus map is a semantic map format internal to Toronto, which we obtained through the conversion of here maps. It enables us to conduct global navigation using GPS localization. The addition of ZeusMap allows us to leverage semantic information for use by different systems as well. So to effectively utilize ZeusMap, localization needs to be consistent with the semantic map and the map must reflect reality. A sample of the map can be seen here in the figure above. In its current state, ZeusMap detect, uh, depicts lane lines, turning arcs, intersections, stop lines, and traffic lights and pedestrian crossings. Furthermore, relationships between lane lines are also provided. For example, the semantic map will indicate which lane lines lead directly to another in a parent-child type of relationship. Global localization with Zeus map proved to be effective for clear sky uh, situations with few uh, built up structures nearby. However, 
Within more urban environments or with places without a clear view of the sky, GPS is prone to dropouts and jumps. We needed a fallback uh, strategy to assist with these GPS denied scenarios, and hence we utilize the Atlantix LiDAR localization pipeline. The system has a five to 10 centimeter accuracy, making it comparable to GPS with an RTK based station. In the figure on the right, we can see a capture from the LiDAR system. On the left-hand side of the figure, this is a camera uh, visualization of what's actually going on during the capture. And on the right-hand side, we have a point cloud visualization. The yellow points are from the LiDAR, sensing, uh, LiDAR sensor during operation, and the blue points are from a stored LiDAR map. So to quickly recount an incident which occurred during the year two competition at M-City, we found that during drive tests, uh, that Zeus would perform maneuvers which would collide with the side of curbs or drive between lanes. We found that a positional offset was present between Zeus map and the, and the onboard GPS. Fortunately, we were able to correct this offset uh, through the use of the accompanying LiDAR map, which acted as a reference. So after driving around the test track and manually determining the offsets, we found them to be 70 centimeters in easting, 90 centimeters in northing, and 120 centimeters in altitude. Effectively, this means that Zeus would believe it was driving in the center lane and floating in the air, while in reality, it was dr driving between lanes on the ground. Um, due to the scenario, we wanted to develop an automated method to correct for global offsets within the GPS. So our GPS, uh, sorry, our global offset correction algorithm attempts to determine the optimal offset, which minimizes the projection error between detected semantic cues and the reference map. The performance of this algorithm can, see, can be seen in the figure above. Here, we're able to reduce the offset error of the uh, lane lines from roughly half a meter to only a few centimeters. We extended upon this method uh, through the development of the semantic localizer. So though LiDAR proved to be an effective uh, like localization method in many cases, we found that small changes to the environment have a profound impact on LiDAR localization. In particular, during a test drive around M-City with a slightly outdated LiDAR map, the LiDAR localization uh, pipeline diverged for certain regions. Essentially, LiDAR suffers from being too sensitive to small changes in the environment, and thus we needed an additional fallback localization system, which was more robust to such issues. This eventually led us to the development of our semantic localizer in year three. This semantic localizer can be thought of as a complement to, to the global offset correction algorithm. The correction algorithm shifts the GPS to better align with the semantic map. However, the semantic localizer circumvents the use of GPS by using the semantic map directly. This technique looks for correspondence between Zeus map and the detected landmarks, such as lane lines and traffic lights. The figure on the right provides a visualization of lane lines detected from our perception system and those projected into the camera view from Zeus map. As you can see here, the red lines are provided from uh, perception and the green lines are from Zeus map directly. So as these semantic landmarks are sparse, semantic localization is more robust to small changes in the environment. So this method proved to be relatively effective. It does suffer, however, from the fact that it requires lane lines to be present within the driving area. And it also requires that the semantic map reflect reality properly. Furthermore, the positional error, uh, error of the semantic localizer is dictated by the presence of detectable landmarks. Thus, when driving on the highway, there is a notable longitudinal error due to a lack of semantic use in the direction of motion of the vehicle. This brings us to our current system. The current system utilizes GPS localization when available and supplements it with LiDAR and semantic localization as fallback strategies. This system proves to be more robust overall. The performance of this approach can be seen within our closed loop demo at Utias and the open loop test data collected from public roads around Toronto. So in this first figure here, we have an example of a closed loop uh, demo in which the GPS navigation uh, facilities are cut off using a servo. We see that Zeus is still, is still able to operate uh, correctly in this situation. So for the semantic localizer, public road tests revealed that the lateral accuracy is less than 20 centimeters as seen in the middle histogram. Furthermore, lateral localization achieves an accuracy of less than 10 centimeters. Thus, we prove that both methods are sufficient for lane level localization. Regarding the future work of mapping and localization, we are currently working to improve our semantic localization system through, the, uh, through performance reviews via closed loop performance tests and the addition of more semantic landmarks, such as exit signs and highway uh, lights. Such elements will improve the system's ability to localize in the longitudinal direction. Another initiative we're looking towards developing is a local change detection and correction algorithm for the semantic map. 
This work is motivated due to an incident which occurred during drive tests at M-City in year three. Essentially, the lane lines had been repainted, resulting in an offset between the semantic map and reality. This caused Zeus to enter a pedestrian crosswalk during a red light. When the pedestrian, uh, so for this lo uh, local change detection and correction algorithm, the proposed pipeline can be seen on the right. Essentially, the system realigns local regions of the map to reflect actual uh, lane positions as detected by vehicle sensors. This algorithm is still in development and as such is subject to change. And that draws us to a conclusion for our second portion. Uh, so we feel free to like pose any questions and we'll take a short break here. Awesome, thanks Martin. I almost thought I was listening to a podcast there. That was great. Um, okay, so uh, we've got a question uh, from YouTube here and which is, uh, have you, we played with uh, depth time of field? I think uh, that's what that stands for, maybe not. Sensors, uh, does someone want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I think I, I can mention about this. So in year one, we tried the uh, Bumblebee stereo camera, which also roughly provides like depth for the environment. Uh, however, because we are using like a 64 line LiDAR, which is actually like much better in measuring the distance to objects, uh, we found out those sensors are not uh, that useful. So we just aim, uh, opted for like regular monocular cameras uh, for vision. And then like, just use LiDAR for depth measurements. Cool, I had a quick question, which was, uh... Do you guys think it would be possible to drive using only Google Maps, maybe in general or like with the system that our team has developed? It's just Google Maps. Uh, I know there are like research going on. Like I went to the talk in the morning where uh, Professor Eger was talking about using topological map for navigation. Um, currently, I think uh, our system needs a like map with higher precision. Uh, in order to navigate because we require uh, the semantic information such as like lane boundaries and connectivities to like plan the path. Uh, but definitely using a like, more cheaper option, uh, a more cheaper map sourcing is definitely an interesting like research area. Yeah, sorry. If I can also add on to that just briefly. So regarding Zeus map uh, in its construction, uh, the semantic information provided, so lane lines and other like uh, elements such as traffic lights and stop signs, those are specified using GPS coordinates. And these maps are actually generated by hand. So somebody needs to actually go in there and specify where these things are, the lane lines and so on. Which is why um, during the repainting of the lines in year three, that was a big issue because somebody would need to recreate the map by hand. And um, yeah. Okay, this is a question from Ali that goes back to the uh, perception section. He's asking mm -hmm. about uh, in the drivable area segmentation, slide some turn paint on the ground is segmented as not drivable and the car is driving over it how do you handle those false negative cases do you do post-processing uh, or use multiple frames for segmentations uh we do merge multiple frames uh like every, it's we actually uh, like everything's done actually in 3d uh so based on the car's position we wrap them like to the to the to the 3d work uh loads so even if it's not detected as not dri drivable at like far distance, as the car approaches, we'll get a better measurement. Also, and also everything has a uncertainty measurement. So uh, things with higher uh, uncertainties will ignore those. Yeah, exactly. So the reason we use entropy is exactly to get the uncertainty measurement. So uh, at a certain threshold, um, entropy allows us, as like a metric, it allows us to tell us when we should reject the uh, drivable region detection output. You can actually see in the actual in the figure, uh, there's a severe amount of distortion near the end, and that that's usually when um, we would like reject that detection. Whereas at the beginning of the thing, this is like the entropy measurement is sufficiently stable, so we're able to use this detection. Uh, so there's a bit of thresholding there that allows us to identify when we should uh, reject or keep detections. Great. Okay. Let's uh, let's keep going. Uh, make sure we have enough time to finish here. Cool. Uh, yeah. Hey guys. Uh, my name is Shi Chen. I'm the planning lead and first year master's students, and uh, I'll give a brief overview of the planning system for the four years of Ultra. So over the four, course of the four years of AutoDrive, uh, we've iteratively redesigned the planning subsystem to meet the increasing requirements of the competition. We start with a simple lane following approach for year one, where we only look at the detected lane lines and from them calculate a centerline to track. 
This was then extended in year two to a hierarchical planner consisting of a global and local planner, which navigates through MCity using main center lines. And finally, for year three and four, we completely redesigned the system into the lattice planner that we use today. This uses a lattice graph based planning algorithm to provide even more flexibility and speed in the trajectory generation. So let's take a detailed look at the planning system for each year. Uh, for year one, because the competition only required very simple maneuvers, we chose a similarly simple approach of pure detection based lane following with curve stitching for lane changes. As you can see in the GIF on the right, what we did was simply to use the detected lane shown in green, find the center line from the detection, and then convert that into control points for the vehicle to follow. For lane changes, as seen in the bottom figure, we would stitch together multiple detected center lines from neighboring lanes and use a generated quintic spline to transition between them. Because the main technique here was trajectory generation, we also put a lot of focus in this year on using a gazebo sim with a map of the Arizona competition course to specifically tune all the parameters in our algorithm, i.e. the determination of the control points. Unfortunately, however, this planner had quite limited functionality. It lacked global routing, and it did not have the capability to handle complex traffic situations. Additionally, it would completely fail if a lane detection fails. For year two and onwards, the competition was held at the MCD test track. This had many interesting routes and traffic situations, and to handle the increased difficulty of this competition course, we chose to use a hierarchical planner consisting of a global and local planner. This improves on the main downfalls of the year one planner, with a global planner for overall routing, a local planner to handle complex scenarios such as intersections, pedestrians, and traffic lights, and a switch from using detected lanes to those provided by Zeus Map for increased consistency. As you can see in the figure on the right, the whole plan this year consisted of four main stages. First, we kept the lane boundary and road connectivity information from Zeus Map. Then the global planner performs a graph search on the connected roads to select uh, which roads we should take to get to the destination. Thirdly, the local planner takes these roads and stitches together their center lines to generate an initial set of control points for the vehicle to follow, and also determines where to stop based on any of their traffic situations. And finally, we run a path optimization step to smooth out all the control points and limit maximal curvature. Again, we use specific strategies here for the competition itself. We use prior Zeus map information as a sanity check for our behavior logic. So for example, we will only react to detected pedestrians if they're near a crosswalk. And we have built-in timeouts for each maneuver to continue on even if we fail in the middle of the competition. But this planner still had some cons. The central line based strategy did not allow for in lane obstacle avoidance, which was required for the year three competition. And the runtime of the path optimization was significantly slower than the planner's cycle rate, meaning that we can only run the path optimization sparingly and we had trouble handling major route changes. So for year three, we scrapped the entire planner for a lattice graph based planning algorithm. The key behind this technique is a lattice graph. This is a graph structure that contains a set of preset trajectory maneuvers. We generate this graph offline and it encompasses all the drivable area of the competition course. In this last graph, the nodes represent viable vehicle poses, and the edges represent viable vehicle trajectories that vehicles can follow to move between the poses. This essentially means that we can localize the vehicle to a certain node and then command it to move to another neighboring node by following a trajectory based on the edge connecting the nodes. So here, the generation of the last graph is performed by first sampling nodes laterally outwards from the road center line, as we can see on the picture on the right. And then connecting pairs of nodes that are valid to transition between via an optimization step based on the edge generation algorithm. Here we designate valid pairs of nodes based on a couple checks, such as the uh, distance and angle between the nodes, and whether it makes sense to transition between the road segments that nodes are respectively located on. So for example, at an intersection, we don't connect nodes on the left-hand lane uh, to nodes corresponding to a right turn. A key here is that we generate and store all parameters for the nodes and edges in a local frame defined by the closest road center line point, rather than a global frame such as UTM. This allows our final generated trajectories to conform much better to the overall road curvature and be much more human-like. To perform overall routing, we use a simple A-star graph search on our lattice graph. It starts from the current vehicle position and ends at the destination location. This produces a set of lattice edges that we use to generate a desired trajectory for the vehicle to follow. The ASR cost for each edge here uh, is based off several metrics for driving niceness, such as the maximal curvature of the edge, the distance between the edge and the center line of the road, and whether or not traversal of the edge corresponds to a lane change. Additionally, because we do a graph search from start to end, we eliminate the need for a global planner. And because we use pre-generated trajectories, we eliminate, we eliminate the need for a trajectory optimizer. A small competition map such as MCity is 
out in under 10 milliseconds. So for example, on the right here, uh, we can see a sample section of the generated lattice for an M-City intersection. If we overlay it onto the world map, we can see that the various lattice routes correspond to various possible maneuvers at the intersection. And then if we want to do a left turn at this intersection, we simply need to search through the lattice graph and select the best edges for this maneuver, such as the path shown in green here. And then this is just used as the final desired trajectory. Another cool thing that the lattice allows us to do is in, is in lane obstacle avoidance. And this is done via nudging around the obstacle. We do this by pruning lattice edges that are inaccessible based on perception information. So if we take again, a look at the example on the right. So in this typical obstacle avoidance scenario, we start with a full lattice graph, uh, i.e. all the trajectories are valid. Then let's say we receive a detection from the reception team that says a static obstacle is on the side of the road. We get the bounding box for the obstacle, inflate it by a certain buffer for safety, and we find all the nodes and edges on the lattice graph that intersect the bounding box. Finally, we remove each intersecting node slash edge from the lattice graph, and this pruned version of the lattice graph is then used for the ASR graph search. So this formulation allows us to implicitly avoid static obstacles when we do the graph search, and it produces trajectories uh, as you can see in the bottom image. So this lattice pruning technique is also used to handle certain traffic situations such as do not enter signs, except instead of using a bounding box to determine which parts of the lattice to prune, we instead prune all nodes and edges uh, corresponding to the inaccessible road segments based on the sign. So in summary, in our year three planner, we use a last graph-based planning algorithm that constructs trajectories from a pre-generated graph of viable vehicle trajectories and allows for more nuanced motion to meet the obstacle avoidance requirements of the year three competition. Additionally, we keep the same stop point generated from the year two competition to handle stopping for various traffic situations. The key benefit of this strategy is that the last graph gives guaranteed motion feasibility. The generation algorithm that we use for the last edges takes into account the vehicle kinematics to ensure that each edge is independently traversable at or under the maximum competition speed limit, which in theory ensures that any chain of lattice edges is also traversable by the vehicle. Additionally, because the last is generated completely offline, we can double check the preset trajectories on the lattice for motion feasibility and routing optimality and manually remove bad trajectories before the competition by editing the generated lattice. However, while these preset trajectories are good for guaranteeing motion feasibility, using the lattice planner as a sole motion planner also means that all maneuvers are restricted to these preset trajectories. This means that we are unable to move outside of the space of the predefined lattice, and a bad lattice will heavily degrade our performance. So for year four, our main focus was on extending the lattice graph to be able to perform all lattice maneuvers, which was required to accomplish the new parking and emergency fallback portions of the competition. The base design here is the same as year three, but we additionally use busy curves to generate off lattice trajectories for parking and for fallbacks. So this allows us to do two main things. Uh, firstly, we can now handle complex parking situations, including parallel parking and parking in parking lots with occupied spaces. And secondly, in the year four competition, there was a new rule added that allows teams to earn partial points by performing an emergency fallback maneuver, uh, such as parking on the side of the road. So the new off lattice trajectory allows us to do this type of maneuver if we you know, catastrophically fail in the middle of the competition. So for example, if we take a look at the picture on the right, uh, we can see how we handle one of these parallel parking slash emergency pull-off scenarios. Here we would first navigate to a lattice point close to the desired parking location, and then use the off lattice trajectory generator to generate the final fine tuned trajectory into, in this case, the parking space. And here we can see a video of the, of the off lattice trajectory generator in action in simulation. So in this visualization here, the dense yellow lines correspond to the lattice edges. The yellow spheres represent traffic lights and the green boxes represent parking spaces. So you can see that as we approach the parking lot, we stop following the last edges and instead generate an off lattice trajectory uh, for parallel parking. Additionally, in this video, there's a uh, obstacle in the first parking lot, as you can see as the yellow rectangular prism, and we were able to successfully avoid this obstacle. So finally, as for lessons learned in year four, uh, the main one was that trying to utilize both the, um, the off lattice and on lattice trajectories together was fairly challenging and took quite some time to get right. In particular, we struggled with how to localize back to the lattice after performing an off lattice maneuver. And this is actually still something that we need to work on, but luckily also not necessary to meet the competition requirements. So overall, why did we settle on this design? Uh, as mentioned before, the main reason 
is that the last plan allows for alpha testing that directly translates to real life. Because we use the same preset lattice for our tests and for the competition, we are able to be extremely consistent in our trajectory generation during the center wheel transfer, especially compared to something like a sampling based planner. Additionally, the manually tuned lattice allows for complex maneuvers while using minimal compute, and our behavior layers are specifically tuned for the competition to utilize as much prior information as possible and to maximize points in failure cases. In terms of future work, uh, there's three main things that we still need to work on for the planner for the round two auto drive competition. So firstly is improved motion prediction. Uh, currently, as previously mentioned, we use a constant velocity model for the motion prediction of our dynamic objects. So this makes sense because the only dynamic object in the current competition is a deer, and this only moves in a straight line. Additionally, uh, we, don't have any, we don't have any motion prediction pipeline for non-deer agents, such as other cars on the road. So to improve on this aspect, uh, we would like to investigate perhaps a neural network-based motion prediction pipeline for all road agents, and additionally investigate a way to integrate motion prediction for other agents into our path planning. The second major area of future work is to improve the off lattice trajectories. As mentioned before, we currently do off lattice maneuvers for things such as parking and emergency pull-offs. However, there are many more maneuvers that we may wish to do on the road, such as reversing or three-point turns. As well, uh, we currently lack the ability to, localize, to relocalize the lattice after an off lattice maneuver. So here we can look to be able to generate off lattice trajectories for more scenarios, or perhaps generate a lattice that even is able to contain these complex maneuvers. And finally, while the lattice planner eliminates the need for a global planner on small competition maps, such as the M City competition course, on larger scale navigation tasks, an A star graph search may take too long to generate a final route. For these situations, we will need to reintroduce some sort of global planner. Uh, perhaps as a way to break down the tasks for the last planner. And yeah, so that concludes the planning section. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Xi Chen. And for those who don't know, uh, Xi Chen's actually been on the team since year one. He's one of our uh, long term veterans. So we're happy to still have him around. Uh, we have one question here from Chris that relates to the planner. And he asks Are you able to adjust the lattice if the lane lines are repainted or the a priori map is off by a small amount? Yeah, so currently uh, our lattice is completely automatically generated based on the Zeus map. And so I think we technically would be able to handle that, but it would be from, first of all, a mapping standpoint where we uh, redefine the map to correspond to the new lane changes, and then we regenerate the lattice from that map. Cool. And, and I was hoping that you would maybe uh, just summarize in a couple sentences again, like what are the advantages and disadvantages to using a lattice graph? Yeah, so uh, the main advantage, um, so first of all, I should say that the main reason we chose this is specifically for the competition. And the main advantage is that if we do this all the trajectory generation offline, when we actually get to the competition, you know, because we haven't tested at the competition course uh, prior to you know, the competition date, uh, we'll have a much easier time transitioning the tra generated trajectories over because we use the same lattice graph that's uh, completely pre-generated. In terms of the main downside, uh, it's that because everything is pre-generated, we can't do anything that's not pre-generated. So uh, as I mentioned in year four, we have to implement something completely new to do the parallel parking emergency pull-off maneuvers. Awesome, thanks. All right, let's go into control now. Yeah. Uh, so first, a bit introduction. My name is Jimmy. I'm a third year undergraduate student, and I'm going to introduce our control subsystem. Um, a high performance controller is critical to our system for achieving tasks, tasks such as staying within lane boundaries, stopping accurately, driving at desired speeds, and obeying motion constraints. So I'll start by giving an overview of, of our development through the years. In year one, we chose a decoupled system for longitudinal and lateral control. This means the steering wheel and the motor torque is controlled separately. In year two, a nonlinear model predictive controller was implemented, which uses a kinematic bicycle model and explicitly handles competition motion constraints. In year three and four, we added a gain scheduler and an emergency watchdog to the MPC to further improve its performance. So for the first year, we implemented a feedback linearized controller that calculates the steering angle, while the velocity was controlled through a cascaded PI loop. Such control system had two shortcomings. First, it could not reject disturbances well. In particular, it could not, it had trouble tracking velocities on slopes. Second, the controller's inability to explicitly handle motion constraints caused aggressive steering during year one competition. 
So these shortcomings motivated us to develop a model predictive controller. A MPC starts with the current vehicle state and predicts the future states of a for a finite time horizon. That is two seconds in our case. Then the MPC solves an optimization problem to find the optimal command sequence. The first input of this command sequence is applied to the car and the procedure is repeated at the next sampling instant. While developing the MPCC, the tuning process was found to be very time consuming and required lots of hands-on experience. One approach we took to offset this is using a simulator to generate an initial set of parameters. Another takeaway was the difficulty in finding one set of parameters that can properly handle different driving scenarios. One of the biggest advantages of using an MPC is its ability to explicitly incorporate motion constraints, which helped us achieve good path and velocity tracking performance. Because of the optimization nature of the MPC, we were able to formulate the car's steering angle and acceleration limits as input constraints and formulate steering rate, lateral acceleration, and jerk limits into the optimization problem for passenger comfort. Under certain conditions, however, it is impossible for the car to find a feasible command sequence while satisfying all the constraints. For example, if a deer jumps in front of the car, in those scenarios, we instruct the MPC to drop constraints in a preset order and prioritize safety over comfort. First, constraint on the input rate is dropped, which allows the car to change its steering angle and acceleration dramatically. For example, slamming on the brake or turning aggressively at low speeds. If that's not sufficient, lateral acceleration constraint will also be dropped and the MPC will fully utilize the car's maneuverability in order to avoid collision something like making an aggressive turn at high speed. For years three and four, we implemented two main modifications. As can be seen in our system diagram, we added a gain scheduler that selects one set of discrete pre-tuned parameters based on the current vehicle state and an emergency watchdog that guarantees a proper emergency stop behavior. The controller receives parameters from the gain scheduler, vehicle post information from vehicle interface, and trajectory information from the planner. The MCC calculates the optimal command, uh, control command, which goes through an additional PI and feed forward block to smoothly convert acceleration command into motor torque. Finally, the command goes through our emergency watchdog, which I will talk about in a few slides, and we apply the command to the vehicle. Adding a gain scheduler enabled us to achieve better velocity and pass tracking performance for a speed up to seven meters per second, which is the maximum speed at our testing track. The parameters were tuned such that the controller is more aggressive at slow speeds to correct for lateral error, while achieving a smoother behavior at higher speeds. The demo on the right-hand side demonstrates the controller's ability to handle different speeds. The car started driving at 20 km per hour, where the steering wheel movement is minimal, achieving a smooth ride. As the car sees a 10 km per hour speed sign on the right, it slows down and the steering wheel is more active to correct for heading error even before we enter the curve. While testing the emergency stop, the optimization algorithm yields a naive minimum cost behavior that oscillates the car while braking because steering is penalized less than aggressive braking. To achieve the desired behavior, we added an emergency watchdog that straightens out the wheels and applies the required deceleration to stop the vehicle in time. During this process, we also learned that a dynamic model is needed for speed higher than seven meters per second, and controller can be susceptible to weather and road conditions. Here's a plot demonstrating our past tracking performance at our test track at seven meters per second. We started uh, with a loop in the parking lot and drove through the tires. And we were able to limit our ladder error within 20 centimeters, which satisfies the requirement of staying within lane boundaries. Uh, these three plots display velocity, acceleration, and jerk data. As can be seen, we achieved good velocity tracking performance while staying within the acceleration and jerk constraints. These metrics demonstrate that this was a comfortable ride. To summarize our work so far, the main reason we selected this pass tracking controller include its ability to explicitly handle motion constraints, its inherent robustness to disturbances, the extensive parameter tuning and testing, and because we added a gain scheduler and an emergency watchdog to further improve its performance. 
For the future years and round two of the Auto Drive Challenge, we're looking to expand the capability of our MPC to handle higher speeds and more complex road conditions. Specifically, we plan to replace the kinematic bicycle model with a dynamic model that takes tire slip into account. This model also needs an adaptation algorithm to handle changing road conditions. Because the controller handles highly safety critical tasks, we are also looking to utilize hardware in the loop testing to push our verification and validation capabilities further. Such system will allow us to cover more use cases without the cost and risks associated with testing on an actual car and iterate faster between designs. Furthermore, we are planning to migrate our controller to a real-time operating system, which has the advantage of being more deterministic and allow the team fo to focus on application development instead of resource management. So that concludes the control sub subsection, and I'll pass back to Martin for user interaction. Yeah, I'll right. allow Keenan to I'll stop us here. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, I think uh, the control team is kind of sometimes one of the unsung heroes because the control always seems to work. So, and we sometimes take that for granted, whereas the perception system is often making mistakes that we have to account for, but the, the controller is always doing what it's supposed to do. So we're very proud of the, the, what, the work that we've been able to do there. Uh, yeah, so we have a question here from Ryan and he asks, what does the team believe may have been the main downfalls or challenges of the other teams in the auto drive challenge? perception, mapping, planning, control, or implementation? Mm, yeah, uh, I can answer this question. So based on our uh, observation from their performance and like after attending their like presentations, we think there are a couple of things that we did like much better than the other teams. Uh, so for example, at the user competition, many teams struggled because uh, there was a offset between the Novatel GPS and the provided uh, semantic map of this, of this course. Uh, we were able to very quickly identify the offset uh, as discussed uh, previously in the mapping and localization section. However, many teams struggled uh, and their vehicle was not able to uh, drive properly. And that, uh, yeah, and that helped us to like, get a lead over the other teams. Uh, perception is, a, is also another like, uh, big area. Uh, we were the only team that was able to like, successfully utilize the FPGAs to accelerate the neural nets. Uh, most other teams utilize C uh, just CPU to uh, process the models. So they either ended up with like very simple models that uh, doesn't have a lot of expressive power to identify all the objects, or they were running at a uh, very low uh, frame rate. Uh, on the other side, we were able to run YOLO at, uh, we, we were able to run multiple YOLOs on our FPGAs at over like at around 15 FPS. Uh, that help us to uh, very like reliably identify like the pedestrians, for instance, and other objects around our vehicle. Um, yeah, I think those are the major areas that we take advantage of the other teams. Cool. Uh, maybe we can uh, in in the chat, I'll, Joe. I'll let you put something there, like an email. Maybe people can send uh, extra questions to oh, yeah, sure. as we start to run out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just want to go straight into the last section to try and make sure we don't go over time. Sure thing. And I'll be taking over for the user interaction system on Zeus. It's Martin again, by the way. So regarding user interaction, during uh, years one through three, we initially designed our system, uh, designed our display systems for use by the safety driver. Within this context, we wanted to ensure the driver was provided as much information as possible so they're able to make educated decisions on when to take control of the vehicle. One of the biggest pitfalls of this design philosophy was the visualizations quickly became unintuitive and cluttered. For example, seen in the figure on the right, we can see such a visualization. Without labels, the figure would look relatively difficult to parse. Due to this representation, we had to train our safety drivers on how to best interpret the data from our visualizations. Following from this, we wanted to improve Zeus such that it's able to self-monitor and actively warn the driver when there are situations which require human intervention. Hence, in year four, we implemented an infotainment system which works to alleviate the cognitive load on a, of our previous design. This system can be seen in the top right. Essentially provides a more simplistic visualization of the vehicle's current pose and perceived objects. The goal with this design was to reduce active intervention by the safety driver and to provide more intuitive feedback to passengers. To assist with uh, accessibility, uh, focus, sorry, in terms of accessibility, we focused on developing non-text-based cues. 
In addition to the simple UI infotainment system seen here, we also added an LED strip to indicate various vehicle states. Uh, when the LED strip is red, that indicates that the door should not be opened, such as when another vehicle may be passing by too close to Zeus while performing a passenger drop-off, or when, or when the vehicle enters an emergency state. Orange indicates a warning to the passenger, such as when the door is ajar for too long a period, and blue indicates nominal driving conditions in which Zeus is operating autonomously without error. Finally, green indicates that it's safe to enter or exit the vehicle. In the bottom right, we can see Zeus coming to a complete stop, as well as the LED strip turning green to indicate to the passenger that they are free to enter the vehicle. So, we hope you enjoyed the story of our progress over the last four years. If you're interested in viewing a dynamic demo of Zeus, please take a moment to scan the above QR code or enter the link into your browser. Awesome. And we were also thanks, proud guys. to... <laughs> Sorry Pardon? to jump in there. Yeah, thanks guys. It was really exciting. I'll let you finish if you had some more words there. Yeah, there's a couple of things that we just want to say. We're just proud to announce that Auto, uh, Auto Toronto will be participating in the Auto Drive Challenge Round 2 starting in September. And as such, as we're moving to the second round of Auto Drive, we're looking for support. This support can take the form of financial support, assisting us in acquiring new technologies and sensors and devices or product support in the form of software or hardware, uh, testing spaces to provide our, uh, to sort of bolster our real world testing capabilities or technical expertise through mentorship. We believe that you should support Auto Toronto for the following reasons. In the SA Auto Drive competition, we have been the consecutive winners of all four years, surpassing the second ranked team by 600 points. Uh, throughout the four years, we have produced several papers exploring new technologies and ideas in the field of autonomous vehicles. And finally, many of the alumni of Auto Toronto move on to work at well-established research institutions and robotics companies conducting further work to further realize self-driving. Our team is exceptionally passionate about autonomous vehicles, and we would be honored if you supported our efforts. So with that concludes our presentation. Sorry for cutting off earlier, Keenan. No, no worries, thanks. Uh, okay, I think uh, that is the end. Uh, if Steve is still here, maybe we'll, we'll pass it back to him to, to end the day. Of course I'm still here, that was amazing. I wanna give a huge applause to the team. Obviously four years is an unbelievable accomplishment and that was a really wonderful summary of all the work that's gone into it. I really love the way you guys presented the evolution over the years, it was really, really, great to see. Um, okay, so that uh, I think uh, if there are no more questions for the team, then I think that concludes uh, all of our sessions for today, um, uh, at least the speaking sessions. So we'll now switch over to um, uh, a small break over the for, for lunch or for dinner, sorry, I should say. And then we want you all to join us. Um, maybe uh, let me just quickly share a screen. Uh, yes, so take over and make sure I'm sharing the right one. There we go. So we want you all to join us, of course, for our workshopping event uh, tonight. So we'll be doing um, uh, just a, in a formal get together. Uh, lots of uh, interaction is anticipated. Um, it was sponsored by Bosch and Escript. And so you'll be able to talk with them as well as all of the other attendees that join us. Um, it should be a lot of fun. It's really casual. If you've done either Gather Town or Spatial Chat before, um, uh, they're really, really easy ways to interact. Um, basically, what you do is you're a little uh, circular blob of your video, and you can drag yourself around and join conversations, uh, move from room to room, uh, and, uh, and seek out other attendees as you would at, say, a social hour for a regular conference. Um, so hopefully this uh, works out for you. Uh, so give it a try. We have the link up. So it's um, uh, the uh, spatial chat uh, uh, slash s slash UFT Robotics Institute. Um, that should get you there. And the instructions should be in your um, uh, Eventbrite invitation as well, assuming you all registered. Um, so look forward to seeing you there and, uh, and enjoy the, the two hour break now and we'll see you all at seven o'clock. Awesome.